Hi, welcome to this Microsoft Virtual Academy course. Um, today, we're going to talk about building Windows Store applications, but we're going to use an iOS tone. We're talking to iOS developers today, so we're going to use a lot of Apple and iOS terms and map those onto Windows. Uh, my name is Simon Rodriguez. I'm one of the instructors today, um, and I'm an evangelist at Microsoft. And today, for this first session, I have Sean. Hi, my name is Sean McCune. I'm a developer and instructor with Big Nerd Ranch. Uh, I've been a developer for uh, over 25 years, and I've been working most recently on developing the Windows 8 course uh, at the Big Nerd Ranch. Yep. And later on, we'll have Eric Jeffers, and we'll let him introduce himself as he comes in. So, um, you know, you'll meet him a little bit later. Um, we also have uh, people ask, answering Q&A. So we have two Microsoft evangelists, Matthias Shapiro and Ben Riga. Um, they're both Windows and Windows Phone experts, so uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. Anything we talk about, they should be able to answer. Um, and we'll have some of the big range folks also look at the Q&A. So if you have a specific mapping or bridging question, we'll definitely be able to take care of it. Um, at the end of the session, the format for us is going to be, we'll probably go 45 minutes to, in some cases, an hour sessions. And then at the end of each session, we will reach some of the most relevant questions. So uh, make sure you ask your questions as we go, and we'll make sure we catch them up. Um, make sure we'll make sure we catch them up as we as we move forward. Um, with that, here's kind of our outline for the day. Um, again, we'll have 45 to one minute to one hour sessions, and um, we're going to start with the platform, just introducing you to the platform, giving you a good overview of the tools, um, and then we're going to talk about C Sharp or Objective C. C Sharp is one of the programming languages that you use for um, developing Windows Store applications, um, and we're going to start with that one, and then we're going to talk about async, and then later on we'll talk about UI application model and storage, and then contract, which is the way applications collaborate with each other. And then we'll talk about notifications and live tiles, and we close with the APIs for the store. Um, so it's a full day. Um, again, probably break every hour or so, and we're going to be here for the next eight hours. Um, before I move on, I do want to tell you, for those that are new, um, you can join the Microsoft Virtual Academy community. They have over a million users, and there's courses like these every week. So if you join the community, you'll hear about the courses a lot more. Um, and you earn points while you're actually attending the courses. So uh, if you want the um, code for today, um, we need to make sure um, you use these iOS JS course, these iOS JS code, um, and just to use it today, and you'll get 50 points for today's course. Um, is everything okay? I see you guys moving a lot, so I'm kind of we're good. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so again, let's get started with the first session, where I'm just going to give you an overview of the platform for building Windows Store applications. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen Windows 8, let me give you a little bit of uh, what Windows 8 looks like. And before I do that, I do have to preface it with um, the setup right here in the studio is that I'm remote desktop onto a machine. Um, so the graphics are not going to be as smooth as you normally get out of Windows. Um, it's remote desktop, so it's actually streaming bitmaps as fast as it can. Um, and you're not, I'm not seeing the 60 frames high quality that I see out of every Windows machine. Um, so bear with me, but this will give you all the concepts and give you an idea of what we're going to cover throughout the day. Um, so this is Windows 8. Um, it's actually running Windows 8.1. Um, and um, this is kind of what our new star screens look like. You see, it looks a little bit more touch-oriented. I'm actually using touch in this monitor. It's very much touch-oriented. Um, it's something where I can navigate through my applications using touch a lot. You see here, I just zoomed out um, in my star screen, and I see some of the applications that come in the box. I see a lot of demos, the ones that controls here. Those are demos we're going to cover today. And then you see canonical applications like Twitter, Evernote, YouTube, all the applications that you would expect out of a you know, and fresh ap application store. Um, and then I have some games here. I like to play games, so I had a few here on my desk. Stop. Um, and with that, let me show you, you know, an app or two. So let's just go here and launch Twitter. Oops. So here I'm just doing a search from within the start menu. I can just do search and it's going to launch the applications um, that I have. So you can see here, this is the Twitter app. Um, it looks very much like their website. It's built by Twitter. It looks very much like their website. I can just click on any tweet here, um, see details, maybe open a link from within the app. You see that the apps are collaborating as I click right there on Twitter and I open a link. Um, Twitter automatically gets out of the way and kind of makes room uh, for you know for the um, UI to actually load in the page. This is actually done in, within the Twitter application, so they're right here loading a web view and bringing all the HTML content. Later on, you'll see applications collaborate where I'm using maybe mail to launch Internet Explorer or something else. So, um, so really great experiences. Everything that you would expect out of a touch uh, a touch platform. Um, everything here navigates fine fine with mouse too. Um, so I can go back and forth here with mouse. I can go back and forth with keyboard. Um, everything that you would expect is there. Um, you know, really great application for uh, building up, or really great platform for building applications like Twitter. Um, we also have a lot of games, as I mentioned earlier. So let me go here and just show you. I'm not going to play these games because the framework won't be there, but uh, here's one of my favorite games. Uh, this is Chimpact. It's a DirectX game. Um, so it's got really great graphics, very immersive graphics um, you know, that you'll see in this application. It's a very fun, addictive game for kids. So um, if you have kids, have them play it out, and you'll see um, they're going to love it. Um, I have just another one to show you more graphics capabilities. 
Um, let me go back here into Pinball. And again, I'm remote desktop, so this is less than ideal, a little bit. Um, but I'll show you some of the graphics here where I'll just come back here, use touch to launch the ball. Oops. What's going on here? Play the game. All right, now we're coming. So I can just use touch right here, launch a ball, and I'm not gonna try to play it. I'm just giving you a sense of the graphics. And again, um, a little bit of these is remote desktop, so it might not look as great, but that's kind of what you're getting. If I wanna switch across applications, I can just drag applications right here from the edge. Um, so for example, you saw me launch um, right there. One, and I'm doing it really slow because I wanna do the, let the remote desktop time sink in. Um, or I can go a little bit faster because that's driving me crazy. And I'll just go back here. You'll see that I can go back and forth. This is, for example, the mail application. Um, and right here from mail applications, I can do things like I mentioned earlier, where, um, for example, Eric sent me an email with a link to the Bigner Ranch website here. Um, and I'll go ahead and launch that email. And this is launching a new application. So this is part of the contracts and how we collaborate across applications. So you can see here, the mail application is making room for contracts. And you can see applications running side by side. So um, our platform is actually, um, I just lock screen. Our platform is just running side by side here um, where you can have multitasking, real multitasking, even though this could be running in a tablet. Um, somehow I lost network, Barry. So um, I'm still remote desktop, but um, I saw that the screen went black. So um, so just leave it like that and then we'll see how far we go. So, yep. Um, so I'm here within the applications. Um, I can launch the Bigner Ranch website. Let's see if that refresh. Um, and for example, here I'm in mail, and I collaborated down to the Internet Explorer application uh, through a contract. Through a, through a contract, I launched it. Now, for example, I'm here in Bigner Ranch um, in their website, um, and I want to do something like share a link to this website with somebody else. I can just come back here and do search, which is another contract you're going to learn about. And here I can, for example, share it back to Twitter, uh, where I can just from within this IE browser share and communicate to the Twitter app and give it a link that it's going to share. Um, if I don't want to tweet about it, I can, for example, send it to Evernote. Um, so here, um, again, I have Internet Explorer communicating through, um, you know, with Evernote. These are these are terms that you're going to learn la later. We call them contracts. So um, that's a couple. That's a little bit of the collaboration. Um, I want to go back to the start screen and tell you something you're going to also learn about later. You'll see right here. This is my start screen. These are my application icons. This is equivalent of an icons. We call them tiles, and we're going to spend an hour talking about tiles and how these are alive. Um, so if you if you wait long enough, you'll see right here, these tiles are kind of cycling. Um, so for example, right here, my email tile, my, my cycle in a few minutes and show me all their new emails. Um, you see tiles right here where I have um, somebody mentioned me on Twitter. Um, you see the email just moved. Um, all of these will tile as we go, as we uh, progress throughout the day. They're kind of giving me relevant information. So we call these being alive. The tiles are alive with activity where um, they're always updating me. Um, it's a much more modern, much more way to keep icons alive throughout the day, giving you all that relevant information. And again, we're going to spend time during the day. Um, you should also see the store icon right here. Um, I'll go ahead and launch the store. This is something we're going to spend time at the end of the day talking about how developers submit applications to the store, how developers get paid, how much money you're going to make. Um, we have a really great, a very compelling offer for developers. So, um, you know, stick forward till the end of the day. And if you're in a time zone where you're not going to be able to stick forward for another eight hours, don't worry, this content will all be available on demand. So look for the store session, and that's where we're going to talk about the economics, and we're going to talk about discovery and all the great benefits that we have with the store. Um, so let's see, that gives you kind of a high level overview of what Windows 8 or 8.1 looks like. Um, and the last thing before I go, I do want to show you, if you've ever seen desktop in the last 10, 20 years before, uh, you're probably used to seeing something more like this, where I have a desktop. Um, I have kind of a start menu right here. I have all my desktop applications, like right now I have a PowerPoint. Um, I can have Visual Studio and other applications running on the desktop. Windows 8 kind of has two modes. One of them is the desktop mode where you're doing all those productivity apps you used before. And then we have this new mode where we have all these Windows Store applications. So we have two types of applications. We're going to spend all day talking about the applications that go onto that Windows Store. It's a different application model. It has a lot of different features, um, but it's very compelling for you as a developer so that you can submit applications to it. And by the way, desktop applications can also be listed in the store, uh, but they have different application models. So we're not going to spend all day talking about those today. Um, that's kind of the highest level overview. You're going to see Windows throughout the day. So I'm going to move on so that um, we can continue uh, talking about the platform. Um, Again, we're going to talk about Windows Store apps. One thing that I do want to say about Windows Store apps is they run um, on a myriad of devices. So anything that can run Windows 7 can run Windows 8. A lot of people are upgrading already. Um, and they also can run on a new platform, which is our ARM. And we call those Windows RT. Um, and it's going to get confusing because we have kind of very related terms. We have Windows RT, which is the operating system. It's a Windows operating system, fully capable, exact same operating system that you get out of Windows um, 8. Um, but it's running on ARM, and we call it Windows RT. 
And then we have another thing that we call WinRT, which is our runtime. And that's kind of our application platform. So it's going to get a little confusing with those terms. But again, just remember, Windows RT, full name, is the operating system running on ARM. Um, and every application that we're going to show you today, all those applications I just showed you a minute ago, uh, will run on ARM. So you can run on those tablets that have uh, you know, lower graphics capabilities, that have much more longer lasting battery, um, and have you know, much more portability and, you know, with regards to uh, how, light, how light they are and how long the battery can go. Um, so our Windows Store application is truly designed for mobility, um, and you're going to see that throughout the day. Um, from an Apple standpoint, from, from a coming from an iOS standpoint, I want to give you kind of our device continuum because we're a little bit different from the way Apple does it. Uh, the way I think about Apple is that uh, they have a desktop where you can run Mac OS and you can run Cocoa apps, right? And then they have um, kind of their um, mobile OS where they can run tablet um, and they can run phone apps, and that's running on iOS, right? Um, and on the Microsoft world, we have something a little bit different. Um, first of all, our desktop and our tablet have merged. Um, so rather than having it be kind of mobile moving towards the tablet, we actually took desktop towards the tablet, right? So, um, so we can actually, so right here, desktop and tablet are the exact same. You see these productivity devices where I can do both. Uh, for example, here we have a Surface RT. Uh, actually, this is a Surface Pro, right? Yeah. Yep. So, um, so this is a device that I would use here, uh, for example, at work, with a keyboard, everything else, and I get home and I just undock it, um, and I can use it to navigate the web, to browse the web, um, and it's one device. It's running Surface Pro, um, exact same. It'll run desktop apps and Windows Store apps. Sorry, Sean. No problem. <laughs> and you can interrupt me as we go. Mm -hmm. do. Um, so, um, so that's kind of where we're at with regards to our operating system. So you'll have one tablet or one operating system, one API for desktop and tablet. Um, that's very different from Mac. Um, and for Windows Phone, go ahead. And the, the, the phone API is not too dissimilar, dissimilar from the tablet and desktop APIs. And over time, they, they seem like they've been even getting closer. And I find that something that is very uh, uh, interesting to me as, as a developer, because the more that I can write you know, one app or one code base that can run on multiple form factors of devices, the, the easier my job is. Yep. Yeah, so the way we see, the way I kind of drew the picture here is, um, you know, our Windows Store and for desktop and tablet is the exact same. There's one API, one platform, one everything. Um, and then Windows Phone 8 is actually running on top of Windows 8. So the operating system underneath it is actually Windows 8. That's why we're so similar, right? And then we're doing our best to surface the platform as fast as we can. So you're right that we're not fully done. Um, but when you think about developers, when you think about developers' code, here's kind of how I see the continuum. Um, I see that on macOS, we kind of have a Cocoa or Cocoa Touch, which in my mind are a lot more different, right? The class names are different. For example, Button, you know, might have a different class name. They're similar, but they still have different class names. You have to be smarter about how you develop for both. Um, on our side, what we do what we, is we have platforms like SAML, which is one platform, like one developer platform that crosses the board, across the board. So a button, as you're going to learn about it today, uh, will be the same on Windows Phone as it is on, um, on the desktop. Um, so our platforms are a little bit closer together, not fully converged. We do have two stores, um, and we do have two you know, different places to make your applications. It's not a universal binary, so we're not there yet. But it's something that, as you mentioned, we are converging towards. Right, and so the, in your example, the button, it will just be button on, on both platforms. Yep. It won't be... You know, UI button versus NS button. It, it will simply be the same UI, the same API. Yep. Um, the other thing that we do have from this slide, and you'll see it a little bit as we go, is we do have a lot of programming language choice. Like we have C sharp, BV, we have JavaScript. Um, so we have a lot of choices on what you'll be able to see. Um, is everything okay? Okay. Sorry, I keep getting distracted when you guys are moving so much. Sorry. Um, so with regards to the platform. <laughs> Um, so with regards to the platform, this gives you a good overview of um, you know, what the platform looks like. So I kind of silo desktop apps. Again, that's slightly different oper uh, that's slightly different application model. So we're going to spend all the day focusing on Windows Store app. And from this slide, I just want you to remember two things. The first one is, look at it right here. We have a lot of choices with regards to UI and presentations. We will give you SAML, uh, which you're going to learn about today. We'll give you HTML, standards-based HTML as you know it. And we will actually give you direct text. So we give you the three different kind of graphic stacks that you'll be able to, um, to leverage. And these are all first-class citizen. Um, and, but all these graphic stacks and all these language choices are actually built on top of one API, right? So we have a core one API that actually applies to all languages, and that's WinRT. Um, so from a developer standpoint, everything you're going to learn about today, if you learn about tiles or if you learn about you know, contracts, all of those will be the exact same APIs regardless of whether you're building um, a HTML or a SAML C Sharp application. And I, I think it's important for, for developers to know that the, even though we're going to be talking about C Sharp today, uh, you know, Jaime said that the, uh, all those languages are first-class citizens. Those uh, HTML and JavaScript apps, they are full applications. They're, I know as iOS developers, we're used to various kinds of, of web applications, web-based applications. But when you're dealing with HTML and JavaScript on Windows 8, you're actually writing in JavaScript and accessing the, the same Windows runtime, the, the WinRT APIs, just like you are from C Sharp. And so it's, it's more the case of uh, uh, using 
Objective C and, and say iOS and replacing it with writing code in C or C++. It's an actual language that that is connected to the operating system. It's not a it's not a web page. Yep. So yeah, let me show you. Let's, let's say let's show them a little, a little example. Um, I wrote a little camera app right here, and this will show you a little bit of what we're talking about. So we have right here. Um, it's the exact, the exact same sample written in three different languages, right? So let's start with C-sharp because that's easy enough to read and people um, will be able to, you know, any developer, even if though they haven't seen any of our languages, they might be able to be, they should be able to read it very quickly. Uh, so I have right here, uh, it's just an application. The UI is written in SAML for C-sharp and you'll see here, um, you're going to learn more about this language. But all I have is a grid with a button and one image. Um, and the image called photo capture. So we're going to kind of take a picture, you know, using the camera API. And right here I have uh, my, so that's my UI. Um, here I kind of have the controller, and I have just a method called capture that gets called whenever um, the button gets clicked. Um, and you see here I have this camera capture UI, and I'm just showing this UI. I'm giving it an aspect ratio, and then calling this capture file async. We're going to learn more about async programming as we go. Uh, but this is just capturing a file, so capturing the image onto a file. And then I'm using that image that I capture and displaying it on the UI by assigning it onto this bitmap image. Um, so very, very straightforward. Let me go ahead and set, um, to enable this application, and again, and I'll run it here. Um, in local machine, um, and hopefully it'll work because again, we're remote desktop on this machine that's right next to it. So, um, and I'm going to try to take a picture with the camera. Um, and again, this one's written in SAML C sharp. So, something's running really slow today. It's the network, I can see it, but uh, there we go. Uh, we'll troubleshoot it during the break. So here I have that exact same button. The image no longer is not there yet because I haven't captured the camera. You'll see right here I deployed, so we'll talk later about capabilities. So um, I had to declare capabilities because I'm going to use the camera. So I'm getting prompted, can C Sharp SAML allow or uh, use my camera? I'm just going to say allow. And these I'm saying hi right here. So I'll just take the picture. Um, I'm not going to crop it. I'll just say OK. And this is showing the picture right on the UI. Mm -hmm. Right, so very, very simple demo. Uh, but you see, you know, that, that UI is written um, on C Sharp. And, um, and SAML. Um, so I can go back here, stop debugging. Now I've shown you the exact same demo three times, so um, I can come back here. Let me show you. So look at these two lines. These are the two lines that I want you to remember. Camera capture UI, I have storage file right here, and the bitmap image, right? I have it right here written in SAML and C++. First of all, this SAML is 100% the same, exactly the same, not a single line change. I copied and pasted, right? Um, and then you can see here, um, the C++, and the C++ is some, doing something very similar. It's got the camera capture UI. Now look at the syntax. This is C++ syntax. Um, it's our new C++ CX, which is kind of a C++ that is reference counted, very much like what you're getting out of ARC. We use special syntax to, um, to be able to do that. And you see it's the exact same class, camera capture UI. I have the exact same storage file wrapped in a task because it's an asynchronous API, and I have the exact same image. right? So if I come back here and just run that same demo, tempting the demo guys <laughs> by running the exact same thing, Three times. Actually, this one's running a simulator. <laughs> so you'll see the exact same thing. Now, this time I'm running a simulator. You're going to learn more about the simulator as I go. Here's my picture. Take it there. Um, don't worry about cropping it. And you see there, it's the exact same position of the buttons and everything else because this is the exact same SAML UI. And, and for people who are familiar with .NET, this is not managed C++. This is native C++. Yeah, this is native C++. Now, a lot of people think, oh, it's C++. It's got to be faster than C Sharp. Um, we don't do native because of uh, performance. I mean, it is a little bit faster when you get down to the lowest levels, but C Sharp is very, very fast. Mm -hmm. um, so on that side, we do it mostly as a language choice. And you know, we do have a little bit more portability where, uh, for example, if you write something in C++, you don't need to load the .NET runtime because there is a little bit of overhead on loading the runtime. Um, so for example, one thing that you could do is here, I'm moving on to the JavaScript. Um, and JavaScript obviously has their own runtime. It's you know the JavaScript engine and HTML. And here, if I wanted to reference those components, in fact, those WinRT components are written in C++. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see here, I'm inside JavaScript, um, and I have the little event handler, um, and I have the exact same UI. If you look at this, this is the exact same namespace, exact same class, camera capture UI. I kind of did different syntax where I didn't abbreviate the um, namespaces here because that's something that um, JavaScript people like that might they might it might feel like to them like I was tricking them with a class or something. So I gave you the full namespace, but it's the exact same thing. Camera capture UI. This is a WinRT class written in native C++ that can be accessed from any of these languages. Right, and this is not JavaScript running in a web view. It's this is JavaScript running as a native language on exactly. the system, call, yep. so calling you, the WinRT APIs. Exactly. You can see here. Here's my application. Um, I have my manifest, which you're going to learn a lot about later today. Um, and it has capabilities. So, for example, right here, um, I declared a webcam capability. I have everything. So this is a native HTML surface. It's standards-based HTML. All the latest standards um, in 8.1, for example, where I include WebGL, but CSS3, all the standard stuff, um, location, all the emerging standards are implemented. And you're just coding a native application using HTML and JavaScript. Um, and again, let's tempt them one last time. 
And yeah, you see here I have a breakpoint. You're getting variation as I go, and that's by accident. It's mostly because I was rushing to get the demos ready. Um, so I'll just see right here. Um, you see that I have I didn't clean up the UI as much, um, but I'll take the camera right here. So from within HTML JavaScript, I'm actually accessing the camera, and it went through the capabilities and it's everything else. There's no bridge in here. It's exactly that JavaScript. So this is unlimited first class support uh, for HTML and JavaScript. And you see the exact same demo there three times. That's kind of how our platform works. That's what you should expect. Um, and let me go back here and just stop the debugger. Three for three, that's not too bad. <laughs> um, so that's our platform. Now, what can you expect out of those WinRT APIs that are you know, written and shared across the board? Here's a high level overview. Everything with regards to action. This is the Windows 8 API, by the way. I have two slides, 8 and 8.1, because we're adding a lot of capabilities that I want to highlight. But everything that you expect coming from an iOS world where you want access to location, sensors, proximity, touch, all of those APIs are there with regards to devices. We have really great graphics and media. We're hardware accelerated across all three platforms. We're built on top of DirectX across all three platforms. Um, and then you have everything you know, for communications, all your networks, XML, JSON support, storage, everything that you would expect is there. So I look at the eighth platform, and I think this is very comparable to what I see in iPad. Right or um, mm -hmm. on iOS, like it's a it's a very similar platform. We have a lot of the exact same capabilities. I think anybody that comes to the platform won't feel like, oh, I'm missing a lot of APIs, or like, or there's something missing where I cannot get what my app does. Um, but if that wasn't the case, we shipped 8.1, uh, 8.0 about nine months ago, last October. Um, that's when Windows 8 shipped, and right now we're shipping the 8.1 platform probably before the end of the year. So within a few months, we will be shipping up uh, the Windows 8 one APIs, and we've added some great support. You see a lot of innovation around uh, devices, like we nailed devices, USB, Wi-Fi Direct, improving our Bluetooth support. So you see a lot of innovation and connectivity for devices. Um, on graphics, we're adding, for example, 3D printing. Um, on communications and productivity, we're adding, for example, better contact support, PDF, you know, a really great um, support across the board. We're adding better diagnostics. So again, this is the winner the API and this is shared across all three presentation stacks. So, um, so that's kind of where, where you're going to be. Um, I kind of went out of order since you did the segue, so I skipped and then moved to language projections. Um, so thanks for the, for the segue there. <laughs> and this is what you just saw. You have Windows RT components written in C++. They can also be written in C Sharp or VB. And then we have this metadata that's just projecting onto the other languages. So for example, if I want to access it from C++, there's some metadata here that just generate those projections. Um, and the metadata is really smart. For example, you'll see here, check out the UI that I, or the um, APIs that I showed you earlier. Here, the first one is C++, and you see I have camera capture UI, and I have a ref new. Um, ref is a new keyword that, use, that we use in CX. Again, that just tells it to be refer, reference counted. Um, and then it's just acts in camera capture UI. But if you look at the convention, here I'm accessing like it's a pointer the way C++ people do. Um, I'm actually using camel case convention because that's what C++ people are familiar with under methods, right? Then I have the next one, which is the you know um, C sharp one. And you see here I'm using the new that they're familiar with. I still have that camel case convention, um, so it looks very similar um, with regards to it looks very familiar to C sharp developer. And then the bottom one right here, you'll see that um, you know ironically this is the one where you see that uh, for example the capture file async is no longer using camel case because JavaScript developers want to do that, um, you know, they use different notations. So we actually optimize the metadata is smart enough to go look through the metadata, generate everything that we need to do, that, that we need to in order to call it, and also giving you some of that familiarity. Right. Um, and we come up with patterns as we go. So for example, later you'll talk about async, um, and that right. pattern is going to be for C sharp, you're going to use async await, um, and then we have something similar for C++ where you can use task API, things that they're going to be very familiar, template-based um, task APIs. And then um, if you're a JavaScript developer, you will have promises, um, which is you know a very familiar async model where, for example, it's like the jQuery deferred, um, and it's a promise standards-based stuff that, uh, that we're using across we go. Um, one thing that I, we're not spending a lot of time today on is uh, you know, the kind of design guidelines. If you look at those applications, they all follow what we now call the Microsoft Design Language, used to be known as Metro. Um, and it's a very popular now, it's a very popular kind of design language that's been used across the board. Um, iOS 7, kind of everybody builds those kind of relations of, oh, iOS 7 is starting to look more flat, it's starting to look more um, you know, content-oriented the way uh, Metro has been for the last three years. Right. Um, so we're not going to spend a lot of time um, talking about user experience, but I did highlight here um, three sessions that I think any iOS developer who just started should watch out, should go watch. Uh, the first one's called Eight Traits of a Great, uh, Eight Traits of a Great Windows Store App. Um, it's by Jensen Harris, one of the persons that leads user experience. Um, it's a little bit old, but it gives you the context and that vision of what we had um, two years ago when we started. Um, and then there's an update for that, the one right here, Design and User Interface for Windows. So that's kind of an update for the 8.1 timeframe. So that's the second one that I highlighted. Um, and then the last one is uh, Design Differences Between iOS and Windows 8. Um, and this is Barclays from Ratio, um, a local agency here in Redmond. And um, we've kind of like, Bart has built lots and lots of iOS apps over the last few years. Um, and then over the last 12 months or so, they spend a lot of time porting those apps, right? So they probably have, I think, 50 apps. Ratio has about 50 apps on the Windows Store, and they spend a lot of time porting those apps and moving on to uh, moving them onto Windows. So you got a lot of great 
tips and hey, this is what, how we think, this is how we see it from a pure designer presentation um, standpoint. So, and with that, I do want to touch a little bit on choosing the presentation stack because we have um, you know choices, and I want to make sure people understand what to use when. Um, you saw earlier, everything's first class, so you don't have to worry about, oh, if I choose JavaScript, am I going to go into an audio glasses camera or sensors or storage or anything like that? No. Um, all the APIs have the same capabilities. You're diving onto the same winner team. If you choose to write an HTML JavaScript application because you have those skills, uh, what you should expect is that you're going to be coded to standards-based HTML. So all of the input tags, you know, select tags, everything that you would expect out of HTML is going to be there. Um, you will have full access. And then we give you an extra library called WinJS, which gives you what we call the personality. So this is where we give you some extra controls that are for Windows. Um, so for example, our lists have very specific gestures and very specific selection functionality. And we give you a library that's optional. You don't have to use it. But we do. it will give you that familiarity if you want to go write um, a JavaScript app. Um, and I have a screenshot of Skype because um, a lot of people still think, oh, JavaScript, not powerful, slow, or whatever. Uh, and what we have here is that HTML and JavaScript, for example, at Microsoft, where we ship out-of-the-box applications, um, everybody gets really surprised to hear that Skype is actually written with HTML. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, there's media decoding, there's a lot of threading, there's some really complex networking functionality there. Definitely. And they're actually just showing HTML and JavaScript for the UI, and they're calling on the C++ component, both ours and their custom ones on underneath, and they're actually the, the actual Skype application HTML. Um, our mail application is also HTML. Uh, so a lot of people think, ah, yeah, HTML, it has to especially iOS people, right? They're used to that. It's a web view. It's going to be crippled with regards to performance. I have to have a bridge or phone app or something else. Exactly. Uh, we don't have any of those things. Our HTML is very, very powerful, and it allows you to reuse your UI and your skills across the board. Uh, with regards to graphics, if you're, if you're running a game or something graphics intensive, um, we have DirectX. This is very similar to OpenGL, yes. Um, it's, a very, it's a modern API. It's much more advanced. So anything that you can do in OpenGL, you should be able to, do, to use in DirectX. Um, I showed you its impact a little bit earlier. Check out that app. And then here I have Jelly Run, which is actually, um, you know, it's actually an application built on top of Unity. Uh, so for those of you, if you're writing iOS applications or Android applications and you're using any of the frameworks like Hocus 2D, Unity, all of those, we have ports of those frameworks and they're built on top of DirectX. So they're hardware accelerated, but they're actually going to be um, very, very you know, easy for you to port. You, with Unity, you kind of design for portability, um, so you should be very easy to port. On average, I can, or I've seen people port games in a week. Um, the more complicated games where there's a lot of work, et cetera, definitely take, it could take a little bit longer, but you know, games are ported within weeks, not within you know, six months redesign or everything else. Um, and then the last model is SAML, um, and I've left this one for the end because this is what we're going to spend all day talking about today. We're going to use SAML, which is uh, it's kind of an XML representation of UI, very similar to the way it zips. If you ever open a zip, it's XML, it's, it's XML and underneath it. Um, we have something very similar. Um, and then SAML is very close. It's the closest one to touch. We have control models. We have navigation. We have a lot of those same concepts. So we thought, um, from what I've seen and from classes you guys have trained, we kind of see iOS people gravitate towards SAML C sharp very quickly. Yes. So, um, so that's the one we're going to spend all day talking about. Um, and that's it. That's my intro to the platform, a little bit of what you should expect. Um, if I was going to give you some takeaways from the last sessions, um, um, everything that we're going to talk about is Windows Store apps, which are going to run on Windows and Windows RT. Um, the ARM piece is very, very important because that's for iOS people. That's where you're coming on the tablet space. That's where mobile is coming from. Right? So leverage the design language um, and understand that you will have lots of choice with UI, program, UI and programming languages, um, but they're all first class citizen because they're all based on this one Windows runtime, which is WinRT. Um, and in this one, we're going to talk about the setup and the prerequisites that we have for building Windows Store applications. And I'm going to give you a deep dive onto the tools. Um, so our prerequisites, with regards to prerequisites, you're going to need, in order to develop your app, you're going to be running on Windows 8. Um, so you will need to install Windows 8 or Windows 8.1. Um, we have trial versions of these. So if you haven't bought it, if you're an iOS person and don't have it, um, you can download a trial version uh, for Windows 8 and install it. It's 90-day trial. That should be enough for you to kick the tires a lot. Um, and then we also have uh, another requirement we'll have is the Visual Studio tools. Um, which we're going to have, we have three versions of these. So we have Visual Studio Express, which is um, the tools that we use for building Windows Store applications. Um, and you'll have a free version of these, so you, need, you don't need to buy anything. Um, and then the last thing that you're going to need is a Microsoft account. Um, and a Microsoft account is very much like an Apple account. Um, it's just you go to a website, you sign for an account, you give them your email, you sign for an account. You don't have to pay anything. This is not a developer registration account. Just this is like an Apple ID. It's like an Apple ID, exactly. Um, and so what we have here is this is what you need to develop your application. Um, and if you follow this link right here from the Dev Center downloads, you'll have all the re links to all the resources, and you'll be able to, in 10 minutes, be up and running, maybe a little bit longer if you need to download the OS and, and, and the tools. Uh, but it's just the time that it takes you to download. Um, now, once you're ready, once your application has been developed, you do want to submit to the Windows Store, and that's where you will have to get a developer account. Um, so we do have a store developer account that you're going to need. Um, later on, we'll talk about the prices. They're $49 and $99, $49 for individuals. So it's a little bit cheaper than what you pay out of um, or what you pay to Apple. Um, and then we have this extra tool called WAC, which we're going to talk about when we get into the store. Um, again, there's a link right here to the portal, so you can get all the information that you need. 
Um, as we talk about the tools, I'm going to show you throughout the day, I'm probably going to show you two different versions of Visual Studio. Visual Studio Express is free. This is the tool that you're going to use for developing your applications. Um, and then we have different, we call them SKUs or flavors, um, different versions of that where we have, you might hear about Visual Studio Professional, Premium, or Ultimate. Um, and these are the ones that from Microsoft you can buy. Uh, but with regards to building a Windows Store application, this press will be free and it will have everything that you need. Um, if you want unit testing or maybe some code coverage or extra tools, some application lifecycle management tools, um, you'll be able to actually go in there and buy the professional or the better tools. Um, but again, Express is free and it's, compre it's comprehensive enough for everything you need. If you're a, a single developer or an indie developer in, in the, the Mac and iOS world, Parlance, uh, the Visual Express tools will, will more than cover what you need. Yep, exactly. So, um, um, and we have trials. So for all of our other tools, if you want to just kick the tires with other tools, we also have trials. So you can download it, you know, kick the tires and see where we're at. And later on, there'll be a place where I tell you, oh, if you want to use these really advanced key bindings, that's the one thing that Express doesn't have. Um, so it's something where um, I recommend people try the 90-day trial for that. Um, you're obviously going to be running Windows 8. We said that earlier. So how are you going to run that on your Apple hardware if you have Apple hardware? Um, and the first thing is Boot Camp. Apple supports Windows 8 running on Boot Camp. They have the drivers. They have everything that you'll need. Um, and if you want to use one of the virtualization technologies so you can go back and forth and you, know, you don't have to reboot, um, you can use Parallels, VMware, or VirtualBox. Um, all of these work really great with Windows 8. Um, I've actually, I've only tried um, 8.1 with Parallels and VMware. I heard that VirtualBox had an issue. So um, if you're running 8.1, um, you might want to check into VirtualBox, and uh, you have my Twitter handle from the session, so uh, feel free to reach out if you don't get it to run. I heard there was an issue, so I'm not going to say that one works on 8.1. Okay. In fact, I'm going to err on the opposite and say it. I know Parallels and VMware do run on 8.1. I, I run uh, both of the versions on, on VMware, and uh, you know, a normal Mac with, uh, say, 8, 8 gigs of RAM is going to run fantastically. And uh, if you have uh, the 64-bit version of, of Windows 8, you can, or Windows 8.1 even, you can uh, even enable uh, Windows Phone development with uh, the Windows Phone simulator. So uh, a Mac is all you need. You don't need to buy new hardware to do development. Yep. Um, and here's a little bit of actually, so, so you mentioned 8 gigabytes of RAM. Here's kind of my basic configuration that I usually tell people. Um, you should expect to have 40 gigabytes of disk because um, you will be installing tools and they're going to take a lot of space. Um, so they always take some space, and tools take some space, and you need a little bit of swap memory. So you, you should have 40 gigabytes of disk. Um, I think you know, when you configure a virtual machine, uh, 4 gigabyte works. Um, if you have a little bit more, that's great. But um, if you have a virtual machine with 4 gigabyte, that's plenty. Um, a 2 gigabyte actually works. Um, I recommend 4 if you can afford it. Uh, right. if and you I meant, when I said 8 gigabytes, I meant 8 gigabytes total in the machine. Yeah, so exactly. you can give 4 gigabytes. Yep, to that's the perfect. Um, if you install a virtualization tool like Parallels or VMware, make sure you install their tool. That makes a big difference. The keyboard shortcuts, all the integration is much better when you start a tool. So don't just install Parallels or VMware. They have an extra little step that you have to do after you install the tools. After you install their um, kind of host, you install their tools, and then that's where um, drive better driver support and everything comes in. And you mentioned uh, a phone, uh, which you can run. Uh, if you're running VMware or, uh, or Parallels, you can kind of virtualize and run on phone. Um, now, the phone emulator um, actually runs, uh, kind of like runs inside a virtual machine, too. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have Parallels virtualizing you know, your OS, and then phone is actually virtualizing their OS. So that mm -hmm. does slow things down. So if you're only going to write a Windows Store application, I'd recommend that when you configure uh, Parallels or VMware, you don't enable the Hyper-B, because you're going to get better performance. Right. But if you need to write phone apps, and you're going to see that the, port, the code will port very easily, um, then yeah, just enable um, Hyper-B, and then you'll be able to go back and forth um, and use phone within your VMware. Right. So, Although I have to admit, I've, I've run both uh, the non-Hyper-V VMs and a Hyper-V enabled VM, and I haven't really noticed a whole lot of performance a difference. I, I was yep. surprised. I definitely noticed it, but I'm the most impatient person. You can see here with the remote <laughs> desktop today, I'm like going crazy. Um, as soon as we break, I'm going to be troubleshooting what's going on there. Um, so I'm, I'm the most important person, so, um, so I have that. Um, uh, one thing actually for me, the, the hard spots that are going back and forth is my key bindings, right? Mm. The Windows C, like the Control C on Windows versus Command C. Right. Um, so that's the one thing where I highly recommend you make sure you're going to VMware, Parallels, or whatever you use, and look at the key bindings, because you can configure these so that you have a little bit of a better continuum going back and forth. Um, to me, that is the only one thing where I can go back and forth with the OSs, I can do everything else, but um, the key bindings is the one area where I constantly have to be thinking about it. Yeah, it takes a few weeks of constant <laughs> use to develop the muscle memory to switch back and forth. Exactly. It's been months for me, so you, you, you're faster than me. Uh, and with that, let's get down to the tools, because that's Thank what you. we wanted to get out of the session. Um, so let's go ahead and get down to the tools. Um, and I have right here Visual Studio. This is the demo that we showed you earlier, so I'm going to go ahead and um, just actually... Yeah, I'll just go ahead and close this and start from scratch. So this is Visual Studio. Actually, no, what you get out of the box is going to look a little bit more like this. Um, so out of the box, when you install it, you're going to get something that looks like this. So Visual Studio supports theming. 
Um, so I, I've had people come and tell me, hey, you're using something else. Um, and no, here's what we have. Um, here's what we have right here. Um, this is where you're going to get out of the box. I like the lighter theme. So, um, oh, no, no, this is the correct way here. <laughs> uh, just, Sean is a fan of the darker theme. You're going to see Blend, and Blend looks a lot more like the darker theme. So, um, so I'm more of a light theme, so I'm going to override Sean on this one. You can do whatever you want when your session comes on. Uh, and this is Visual Studio. And if you look at it, it doesn't look that different from Xcode, right? We have kind of um, like what they call Navigator, we call Explorers. So you're going to see a lot more. Like for example, right here is a Project Navigator. So if I go File, New, uh, Project, um, you see templates just like you got of Xcode. So you see kind of your default templates. Um, you see our templates have a very custom Windows UI. So for example, the blank app, just like everything else, every platform has to have a blank app. Um, that's usually where I start. But we have other, for example, a hub, which is kind of a navigation pattern or a grid app. These are kind of these have kind of navi support for navigation patterns as you go. Um, so I highly recommend when people get started, become familiar with the three of them. If you just say you hey, create a new grid app, you will actually get something that's very functional, has data and everything, so you'll get a feel for the navigation. Uh, in this case, I want to start with a blank one so that uh, people see kind of the totally raw um, thing. You'll see here it's asking me for source, uh, source control. Um, so I'm just going to say cancel there. Uh, we do have Git integration. We can have TFS. Uh, and by the way, if you want to kick the tires with TFS, um, we have uh, online versions of TFS that are free for up to five developers. So if you want to just say, if you say, hey, I'm going to try the tool, I might as well learn TFS, you can do that. But if you're a Git person, we also have Git integration support here. Um, and of course, this is local Git, very much like Xcode, but you can connect it to also the GitHub. Um, so you'll get right here. Um, and again, we use the terms Explorer for what we use or for what Xcode and iOS people call navigators. So here we have our solution Explorer. This is our project navigator. Um, you see all of our files here. You see kind of our, you know, our metadata files. Sean will talk about the manifest or the plist file, the equivalent of the plist. Uh, we'll have application class right here. Um, and it just generated one view, uh, kind of an empty view from what you see right here. Um, so you'll see right here, it created um, one of the empty views. Um, and you'll see here, there's also code behind files across the board. Um, and then um, you know we're going to see all of these as we go throughout the day. We're going to talk a lot more about building UI later in the session. So in this one, I'm going to focus on the editor a little bit more. Okay, and a little bit of jargon for the iOS developers. Code behind is if you have your XAML file or your your zip, you know, the analog of the zip file uh, for a for a class for a UI object like say a page. The code behind file is C sharp file that uh, let, it was where you implement the methods for that page. Yep. Yeah, so code behind is a term that we use. So I, it's kind of like the controller, but yes. code behind is actually a term that we use for any class. So this is where you know it's code. Uh, we kind of have SAML um, or our UI, and you know we use code behind for everything else because those two kind of go hand in hand. They merge a little bit together. Um, so let me show you a little bit of features around the editor. So um, I was actually going to do. Let's just draw right here, and the designer's having an issue. So I'm running out. By the way, 8.1. This is Visual Studio 2013 beta. Um, so I was not expecting to see this issue, but I'll react to it as we go. Um, again, I got to go back and look at what's going on with this machine. Um, so I'm just going to type a little sample so I can show you some of the UI um, that we would be using. So I'm just going to say button. I'll just add a button, um, and I'll say click equals oh, my whole machine. What's going on here? I'll just type everything. And then we get the sample. You will see the tool out when we get to the UI session. You'll see the tool out generate every, all of these that I'm going to show you right here. So button click equals on click content equals click me. I'm just adding a little bit of UI so we have something, um, and I'm just going to give it an X name. Um, X name is kind of the way we create outlets. Um, and later on, you'll see this done through designer. So you can see here, I'm just adding a button the center of the screen. Um, I'm just going to give it a width and a height just because um, to be safe. And, and while you're typing, one of the things that uh, might be interesting to iOS developers is that you know we tend to use the interface builder portion of Xcode to, to build our UI graphically, whereas uh, here there's both a graphical designer for, for the XAML as well as a very good uh, XML editor with a very good IntelliSense. And um, it, it tends to be the designers who are using the, the visual designer, and uh, most of the developers I know, we end up running our XAML directly in XML because the editor uh, supports doing it so, so well. Yep. Um, and I'm disabling everything here that has network dependencies just because um, I don't know if that's what's slowing me down, but something is definitely slowing this remote desktop down. Um, so you'll see here, I just have a little button. Again, you'll see this in the UI session. I just wanted to show you something that had UI so we can kind of launch these and debug into it and see everything else. So um, I'm just going to come back here um, and show you the UI. So did that ever come back? No, it's still. Something's disconnected there. This is a preview. Yep, it is. <laughs> so I added a button handler there, and I'm just going to go back here and I just. Boy, on click. You see the IntelliSense, because I'm a horrible typer, especially when people are watching. So you see the IntelliSense right here is kind of kicking in for me. Um, so I added, this is the click event handler that we connected there uh, by adding to the click. Um, and here I'm just going to do, I can do anything here. Let's just say um, declare an int variable and call it 
answer equals, and then we're just we're gonna call a method here answer to life. And I'm just adding a method here. Um, so here's kind of like again the intelligence is coming true. I just wanted to create something to call a method um, so that um, we could show you call stack and everything else. So I'm right here. I'm defining this uh, method, which is a message, and I'm just going to say return 42 because that's the answer, right? Uh, and I right here I declared the variable, and I you saw earlier that we did declare the button, um, and I just gave it an X name, which is the equivalent of doing an outlet. So you'll see right here this is my uh, controller for this class, and I'm just going to say button dot content equals answer to string. So I'm just updating the content on that button. So I'm just you know clicking it, getting a 42, and sending it back. Um, right. So very, very simple. Now, one thing that you saw, first of all, right here, the button is automatic. I didn't have to do any extra work other than giving it a name, um, and the outlet's automatically generated. And I can access it from code. Um, you saw right here, if I try something right here, I get full intelligence against that outlet so that I can get uh, everything I need from there. Now, for example, I can also come back here, right-click, and oh, this isn't going to work because um, the designer's not working. So I can right click here and say go to definition, and these will normally, when the designer works, um, take me back onto my sample page and give you, um, you know, tell you exactly where it was declared. Again, I'll troubleshoot this, um, and you'll see this in the UI session. Um, but if, you know, for example, here, I'm also in this class, and I need, um, um, it's looking this up. So, and so it's interesting, actually, um, that's a great, um, it didn't find it on the sample, which is what we declared, but it came back here and saw the code that the, compiled, that the designer is generating for us, and it's saying, hey, look, this button is actually designed right here. Because what we do is with the SAML, we actually create a code behind file, um, something that the tool automatically generates. Um, so here's where the true declaration of the outlet is happening, and you saw that it jumped back and forth. So I went back right here, and I said, hey, go to definition here, um, and it takes me to that code behind, because it didn't find it on the SAML. Um, once I fix my designer, you'll see it finding on the SAML. Uh, with that, for example, if I'm right here, and I say declare a new button, I can do the exact same thing. I can just go right here and say go to definition. Um, and here I can navigate across, just like I do with Xcode, where I can navigate across all my code and all my um, classes. Um, something that people ask a lot is, you know, how do I get the help? Right. Um, and here, all we got to do is, for example, right here on the button class, I press F1 and I get the help. Now, right here, I'm configured um, to run the local help. Um, out of the box, you actually get the online help. Um, so the way to do that is you run right here, help, um, and then you go self help preference, and you can decide to launch in browser or launch in the help viewer. Um, if you do launch in the help viewer, you also want to come back here and say add and remove help content. Um, and this is going to show you all the content that you can download for all our platforms so that you can work offline. So this is just downloaded the documentation piecemeal, otherwise it gets pretty large. Right. Um, so you definitely want, for example, the .NET one. You want, um, if you're writing C++, you will want that one. You will run uh, JavaScript if you want that, if you're using that one. You want the Windows Store um, you know, application, um, anything that's Windows Store application related. Um, and if you want phone, for example, right here, you see phones. So you can just decide here what you want to update and just bring it back, bring it down local. Um, so that's kind of how you navigate back and forth. Um, this is the local help viewer. Um, it's your choice. Um, I like to work offline, so that's kind of the one I use a lot more. Me too. Um, and right here, the one thing I wanted to show you, I want to show you the debugger. So I show you how to navigate. Um, if you are looking for a class and you don't know it, like here, I knew to look for button. If you're looking for a class and you don't know it, or if, for example, um, you're right here, um, you know, you're watching when the class and you hear us mention a specific class, um, you can actually come back here and look at our object browser. Um, and you can right here just search for any object you want. So, for example, right here, scope down to something like Windows, um, and then go back and say, you know, do a search for, say, notification or button or anything else that you're going to hear about. So, if you hear us talk about something in the class, right here in View Object Browser, you'll be able to find that class. Um, you'll see right here the class definition. You see uh, a little bit of, um, you know, kind of documentation around that class. If you click on specific objects, you'll see kind of what how they're used and everything else. And in addition to either searching for a class or or back in your code, looking at the uh, going to find a definition, you can also find all, all the references uh, used in, in your project. To yeah, find so everywhere that it's used. Yep, so that's, that's exactly right. So I can, I'm right here, uh, for example, answer to life, which is something we're calling. Uh, I can just right click on it and say find all reference, and you'll see all the references to that class. Obviously, this is a really tiny project, but if I had 20 references here, it's very easy. It's one click away, and you can jump around. Um, our navigation is fairly straightforward. I, I would say to people that want to find out, Right clicking, that's something we do on Windows a lot. You'll see right here, uh, pick definition, go to definition. Uh, so here you're seeing kind of what the API looks like. You can go to the actual definition, find all references. You can see the, the call hierarchy for where I would be on the stack. Um, you see always right click is a kind of a safe way to discover something. Um, if you want to navigate within your classes, you have your class right here. Um, different classes, these are the ones that are declared in this file. And you can see different methods that are in this file, um, you know, declared in this class. So you can very quickly jump back and forth. Uh, now I'm going to put a breakpoint here and show them the debugger. Um, and I'm going to run it on the simulator so I can show you the Windows simulator. Um, and this is a very simple app, so the simulator is not going to be as exciting. But I'll show you some of the features in it. Um, oops, I made a typo. 
we will be yes we don't need this Oop. return 42 um, we have shortcuts for building everything um, again key bindings the way you would get out of xcode and in a minute i'll show you get to the key how to get to the key bindings so um so i'm just gonna right here i have this build this project i'm gonna build in the simulator um, and this right now is registering the application there's something wrong in here i think it's network it's usually not this low. I don't break, we'll troubleshoot it, and then we'll come back. It looks like the simulator has started. It might be behind the window. Yeah, but it's still registered. So, hmm. I know it's taking longer to start. I do have like 40 apps open <laughs> right here. Like, well, see, this is inside the simulator now. Actually, I could have sure. just shown that. Oh, see, now I switched it anyway. Um, no, this is the previous app in the simulator. So it's still running, but actually that's just as good as any because what I was gonna show them in the simulator is this. Um, our simulator is actually remote desktop into the machine. Uh, so we have kind of a meta thing going on where I remote desktop into the machine where I'm running the simulator. Uh, but I remote, we remote desktop, if we're for a simulator, we remote desktop into the machine. So you see my full desktop here. Now you see it running at a different resolution because on the simulator, I can actually control that. Uh, so for example, right here, I can say run at 1366, uh, or I can simulate something much bigger, like here, run at 1920 by 1080. Um, and you'll see the screen will change a little bit here. Um, I can also do orientation, like handle rotations if I had the sensors. Oops, I clicked the wrong one. Um, so I can just say, um, hey, rotate your UI, and you'll see in here everything that's going on with the simulator and that timeout. Um, I'll go back. Um, and you can see here, I'm just rotating as we go. right? Um, so I can change my resolution here. I can change orientation. I can simulate touch. You'll see here, right now, I'm on the start screen, and I can go use my mouse right here. So it's kind of simulating that I have mouse, because mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm using right now. Now I can come back here um, and simulate touch. So here, I selected touch, and now when I pan, it's panning as if I had you know, touch in this machine. Right. I don't have to have touch, I can simulate it. I can even simulate multi-touch. Um, so for example, right here, if I click on this button, I'll be able to pinch and zoom and do uh, multi-touch gestures. Um, I can also simulate location. So if I go back here, set, set location, um, you know, simulate that you know, I'm in somewhere, um, I'm somewhere for testing or anything like that. Um, and then just go back here and rebuild this solution real quick. It's funny, I've never seen it do this, but let's try it again. It's made up, but it's never behaved like this, you know, for me before. I actually think I saw that error that was down there before, once before. Oh, really? And I had once. to exit oh, I've preview. Got, like, I've gotten errors, I've gotten timeouts and stuff like that. Um, something while we're talking about, we're waiting for this, uh, something that people should know is, um, so this simulator right here, I'm using the simulator, I can also use remote desktop. So when you're looking at the tools, we will have our tools run on Windows, um, they're running on x86. Oh, still there. All right, so let's deploy that simulator. I already showed them simulator. Um, and while I'm here, I'm just going to go here um, and try to close a few things because somehow my machine is just not behaving with all this stuff. So I have like 25 apps open, so I don't know if that's affected me, but I'm, I'm going to try to minimize my risk. And because I'm remote desktop, I'm closing them with keywords. Normally, I would just use gestures, but um, we already... The remote desktop with gestures. The gesture to close an app, for example, um, actually, if you want to see it, um, I can just come back here, right here, onto, say, Chimpact. And the gesture is normally I just pull down from the top um, and it automatically does it. But uh, right here with multi touch and remote desktop, it's a little bit harder to do. So, right there, that should close it. Um, so, let me try one more time because I do want to show you the debugger. Um, so, I'm just going to go back here, debug. And this time I'm just going to tell it to go to local machine. Maybe that will help us. Give me something. <laughs> um, so I was talking about uh, remote desktop, and um, so our tools run on x86. So you will be running, you know, on your Mac, and you'll be doing. If you want to deploy to an ARM machine, and what we do there is we give you a remote debugger. Um, so you will be able to still there. I've I've seen this I, on a preview. I've had to exit and restart yeah, Visual it. Studio. Yeah. Yep. So let's just try that. I really want to show them the debugger because that's important. Um, I'll have that open. And then I did a clean and rebuild. Yep. So let's just go back there. I should just create a new app. Let's just try that. In fact, let's go to the manifest just in case there's something wrong there where um, I was reusing an app or anything. I'm just going to go back here to the manifest and change the app ID in case it got hung. Um, so this is kind of our bundle ID, the package name. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the identifier in the OS. And just like iOS, where sometimes I deploy the same bundle ID with different provision files, et cetera, maybe it got stuck there. So I'm just going to change it to uh, some random number um, and see if that improves.
the guys told me yesterday, if anything goes wrong, that's when things go fine. I'm not having fun <laughs> right now. Um, Just try how much. No, no. Well, well, they'll see it later as we go, so it's not that big of a deal. I, I'm just trying it out because I want to get out of the way. You just now. tempted the demo cards one too many times. Yep, so it's still not blowing. All right, I'll restart all these tools and, and figure out as we go. And so I didn't get to show you the debugger, but everything else I showed you. Oh, the last thing I wanted to show you here from the list is um, the key bindings, because that's actually important. Um, so there's kind of two different levels that I see people um, are interested in the key binding aspect. So first of all, uh, if you're coming from um, Xcode or anything like that, you'll be able to uh, come back here and just say tools, customize, um, and then go into your commands and you know kind of customize the commands and everything up as you would want to do. Um, I can go here into my keyboard and use the exact same command. So for example, Control B or or Windows B for building, etc. Um, so we have our own commands here. So for example, uh, um, if I go here and I want to look for build solution, um, you'll see right here we have uh, our own commands right here where Control B. I, I have Control B and Control Shift B because that gives me that muscle memory where on Xcode I do Windows B for building a lot. Um, Control Shift B is the um, the one that we use by default on. Xcode, uh, I'm sorry, on Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. So you can come here and customize all your key bindings within the tools. Um, and that actually, for me, that gets me 70 or 80, definitely probably 80% of the way there, where like as long as I have the same commands, I can be very productive quickly. Now, other people like you actually, uh, you like to go farther and customize editor. Um, and that is the one thing that Express doesn't have. Express doesn't let you replace editor, but we do have, um, kind of, we call them Visual Studio extensions, uh, and there's editors for BIM, there's editors for uh, Emacs, um, so with a non-visual, non-express queue, you can actually just download from the Visual Studio Gallery. You download um, the actual, uh, you know, extension for that editor, and then you can just go against that editor and, and be okay. Right, and um, and that gallery that and the the tool that's I never know how to pronounce it. NuGet. Yeah, NuGet. Yeah, NuGet. Um, that's a very useful tool if you're familiar with, uh, say, Ruby and its Ruby gems or Perl, CPAN, uh, or the, the relatively new Cocoa Pods for for Objective C. It's a system built into the IDE to download various tools. Uh, code, uh, libraries, etc., and bring them right into the IDE and use them in your project. And it's very useful because I need to configure everything for my 28 years of muscle memory with Emacs. Yep. Yeah. So definitely. Um, and again, for if you want to do the Emacs, somebody that's just getting started, I say don't fight the bindings. You can download a trial right now. Visual Studio 2013 is in beta, so um, you can get a free beta anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be a good way to kind of get jump started a little bit because the Emacs, the Control E, Control A, all that jumping does make a difference. Um, and here you mentioned NuGet. So here under Tools, you'll be able to get to NuGet. This is our library package manager, uh, and this is kind of how we're. We have a lot of dependencies. All of our libraries are, um, you know, kind of like you can download it from here. It's all integrated. We add all the references. We do a lot of great kind of integration, making it seamless for you to integrate that um, extra, you know, kind of a, a, a library or framework that you're referencing uh, within our apps. Um, and some of them come from Microsoft. Others come from third parties. Um, so this is extensible uh, and it's available for third parties there. Um, so that's it with Visual Studio. We will definitely show you the debugger later. Um, as soon as I, I we have a break, I'll troubleshoot these and we go. Um, we're in between versions today, so I want to kind of tell people kind of where they're at and, how, and where they should start. So um, if you're writing a Windows Store application today and you want to ship in the next three months or even in the next five months, um, you have to start with Visual Studio 2012. Um, that is the one that targets Windows 8 applications, um, and that will have all the templates for Windows 8, that will have all the tools, the runtime, it's kind of configured just to go again, you know, against Windows 8. Um, if you're going to be shipping after six months or something, you can go ahead and get started with um, Visual Studio 2013. Uh, why would you want to do that? Um, we have different templates. So the templates change a little bit because some of the UX change a little bit. We've had a lot of performance and optimize the templates as we as we learned from our first release. Um, so the Visual Studio templates are different. That's why you cannot mix. You have to start with the right template um, against, the SQ, uh, against the version that you will be targeting. Um, one thing that you can do is you can actually go in there, say file new project in Visual Studio 2012, create the project, and then use Visual Studio 2013. 2013 has a few more features. Uh, for example, the go-to definition where we navigate between SAML and code. Um, is in 2013. Normally, I say for me, 2013 is faster. Um, I had problems today, so um, I'll fix those, and then you'll see that that kind of quality as we go later today. Um, if you're going to do 8.1 or Visual Studio 2013, um, you have to have a non-Express SKU, because if you try to open a Visual Studio 2012 project on Express, it's going to say, oh, you have to upgrade the project. Um, so for now, while we're in beta, download the non-Express SKU. Uh, the the SKUs, um, SKUs is what we call the flavor, like the version. Um, um, they work side by side. So, for example, you can install Visual Studio 2012 and Visual Studio 2013 side by side and have everything be okay. Yeah, um, so you'll I'm be doing able to that. Import. No problem. Yep. There's no risk there. Like, you know, it's not in Xcode, it's a little bit harder to do multi versions. In the past, it has been, I haven't tried the 5.0. Um, so, but for us, we, we do side by side. This is how we work day in, day out, and, and, and it works just fine. Um, 
with regards to iOS developers, uh, I kind of gave you an overview of the tools. Um, we have some really great documentation. If you click on this first link right here, we have really great documentation that maps everything back and forth. So it tells you like, oh, here's a here's kind of an overview of the tool, click by click, that shows you, uh, hey, here's Project Navigator, here's your um, toolbar, here's everything that's mapping back and forth. Just giving you kind of a map between um, the tools with regards to, uh, hey, here's what you call it, here's what we call it, and here's where you find it. Um, I give you a little bit of ones today, but we have a lot of really great documentation so you can find more. Um, you'll see here we have um, setting up your Mac. I mentioned these instructions on how to install step-by-step -step and how to install Bootcamp or step-by-step -step on how to install um, VMware. Um, you know, we have everything that you'll need with regards to getting started. Uh, we also have a really great uh, or an API mappings and task mapping. So these are really great for people to say, hey, I just want to capture a camera. What should I use? Um, and that's a task that we have mapped and we can tell you, oh, here's the four things that you have to do. Um, and if you're just looking for an API, we also have API mappings. These are growing. Um, so I'm not going to say we have full coverage of every um, iOS or Cocoa API yet. So, uh, but if you're looking in there and you say, oh, I want to find, um, I don't know, uh, you know, UI navigation controller. Um, they're going to tell you, oh, go look at frame. Uh, that's the closest relation tool we have. You might go in there and find, look for something like button, and then we'll give you, oh, just button is, or UI button is button. So we give you kind of a mapping so you know what to fact, what to um, include. Um, and this includes everything. It doesn't have to be just UI. It includes sensors, includes um, storage API, everything else that you'll find, everything that you, everything else that you'll need. Um, so that's kind of a good reference for people. Um, um, one thing that I tell people, and you're going to see this throughout the day, um, we're going to use a lot of samples from the SDK. Um, our SDK, like, you know, micro, uh, Apple writes a lot of guides, and they write samples. Um, I think Microsoft writes a lot of samples, and they write some guides. Um, so our samples SDKs, um, have, we probably have three or 400 samples for every little task. Um, and you're going to get them on the three languages that we talked about earlier. So JavaScript, um, C Sharp, or C++. You're going to get the sample, and you can download it and copy and paste a lot of code from there. Um, and the last thing I didn't talk about earlier or in this session a lot about design, but we definitely want you to spend time on design guidelines. We have all of that documented in there. Um, so that's kind of a high level overview of tools and, um, you know, and, and runtime as we have. And now we're going to go into a break. I get to troubleshoot my issue, um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, Objective-C um, or kind of C Sharp uh, for Objective-C developers. <laughs> Welcome back. This is still our MBA day, uh, building Windows for applications for iOS developers. And we've switch, switched uh, speaker. So yeah, Eric? I am no longer Sean McGoon in this position. Uh, it's Eric Jeffers. I am a uh, trainer and engineer for Big Nerd Wrench. Uh, been working on the Windows core stuff for a while now, but I also uh, dabble in Android and iOS as well. Yep. Um, and in this session, we're going to talk about C-Sharp for Objective-C developers. We've done our troubleshooting, so hopefully we'll, things will get better with regards to the debugger. Um, and we're just going to go through, give you kind of an introduction to the C-sharp language from an objective C standpoint, do a little bit of the mapping for, um, you know, the constructs that you're most familiar with. Uh, before we start with C-sharp, um, I do want to kind of preface it with .NET and what the .NET runtime is, because you'll hear Microsoft people talk about .NET, and it's very confusing how we talk about it. Um, it's kind of a developer platform. It's a base class, a set of base class libraries that we use. So we talk about, you know, .NET as being the class libraries. We talk about it being the runtime, the redistributable that goes in every Windows box. Uh, we also even use the term, you know, .NET for the tooling, Visual mm -hmm. Studio. Um, so it's a very kind of a complex or overused term. But, um, and the reality is that it's all of those things. Um, for you to think about it, um, it's all of those things coming together. Um, and the platform that it runs is on the Windows desktop. Um, that's been Windows desktop as you know as you know it um, before Windows 8 or in any version. Um, and also Windows Server. Um, it also runs on Windows Azure on the cloud. Um, and then we also run on, um, you know, a subset of that runtime runs on Windows Store and Windows Phone. Right. And uh, the core CLR, I think, is what that's called, right? Yep. Right. And uh, that is kind of like uh, for iOS developers, you can think about that as core foundation equivalent and uh, that it provides all of that same functionality. Yep. Um, and, you know, if we even run some of these on non-Microsoft platforms. So, for example, the Xamarin guys take our, you know, our specification C Sharp and they take our base class library and implement it for iOS and Android. Yeah. Um, so you'll see, um, you know, especially for that core CLR, you see all that functionality go across all the platforms um, with those tools. Um, with regards to .NET languages, um, we're going to use the term managed language a lot. Um, that just means it's running inside that managed runtime that .NET brings in. Um, our languages are all compiled. They all compile into intermediate language, and then they get just-in-time compiled when they're in the box. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, we optimize where we just in we call this, we have this thing called engine, where we compile. Um, once we start in the box, we kind of engine so that it doesn't have to just, just compile every time. Um, but in the end, you end up running up something that's compiled, so you get really great performance out of it. 
um, all of our languages are object oriented. They're all strong type. Um, and the one thing they have, again, as part of that managed runtime, is they're all garbage collected. Mm -hmm. Um, and for iOS people, or before we go into the next one, um, if you're looking at the two languages that fit into this environment for win building Windows Store applications, we have Visual Basic .NET, um, which is kind of a modern version of Visual Basic, um, and then C Sharp. Um, and C Sharp is the one we're going to talk about uh, a lot. Um, I just mentioned garbage collection, so I know iOS people immediately kind of like you know started getting that crawl up their spine. We like, oh, garbage collection. Um, here's what I have to say about garbage collection. First of all, if you don't know what it is, all it means is that you don't have to worry about allocating or deallocating your memory. Um, the runtime is going to take care of that. You'll just start creating objects, you know, put them on the heap, and then we will keep track of who's using these objects, and we will release them as we go. So, um, so that's where you're going to see. Um, it, it's very non-deterministic. So that is the one thing that's different. If you're kind of trying to map it to ARC, right, uh, which is what you get uh, with delayed versions of iOS for memory management, what ARC does is um, it's a very nice optimization from the compiler. Right. right? ARC just goes in there and says, oh, look, I'm going to let you instantiate the objects, and then I'm going to call release for you at this specific time because I know that these objects are going out of scope and nobody's referencing. Yep. Um, and that's, you know, very, um, the, the way I call it, that's very deterministic. At the end of that function, ARC's going to call it, and everything will happen. Garbage collection is different in that you have this special, um, you know, object, this garbage collector that's actually not, you know, collecting memory as early as it can. It's just looking at, it's just out there allocating memory to you, and then all of a sudden it says, oh, I need more memory. And that's when it says, oh, I'm going to go and do a sweep. And it goes and looks at all the objects and says, oh, look, all these objects are no longer being referenced, so I'm going to release them. Um, so it's not deterministic. It happens whenever the garbage collector, um, the garbage collector wants. Um, I'll talk later about the patterns that we use to make things a little bit more deterministic. And if you're really, really, you know, concerned about memory, or you have, for example, in some cases, let's say you have a game and you want to design, um, you know, you're moving to the next level. So that's a great time to say, oh, I'm going to go ahead and garbage collect the previous level. Um, so we do give you APIs so you can call GC collect, um, but for the most part, it's not recommended. I think outside of game scenario or things where you know, like, oh, here I have some free cycles that I know that I can collect against. Um, if you let the um, the actual garbage collector do its job, it kind of is a bit a better experience, better performance right. of everything. Like in the games, you'd only want to manually call uh, the garbage collector because your user's already waiting at like a loading screen or something like that. Yep. Uh, doing it uh, in when scrolling or something through a large list would be horrible and would be a jittery experience for the user. Not something you want to do. Yep. Um, so with that, let's get into C Sharp. Now that you know it's garbage collected and runs on the .NET runtime, let's get into C Sharp and let's talk about the features. Um, coming from Objective C, you're going to see that we have a lot of the same features. I'm doing mappings here, and Excellent. if you're Thank an Objective you. C developer, a lot of this is really basic stuff. When I try to introduce you to classes, um, so bear with me um, as I kind of read through these slides and point out some samples, <coughs> um, and we'll try to get as fast as we can. Um, so for us, um, what we declare classes, we actually use the class um, keyword right here. So this is just um, you know in, in Objective C where you declare um, the add interface and the class for forward declarations. Um, in our world, we use class. That's how we declare them. So the keyword is used to declare the actual implementation of the class. Our class is actually done usually in one file. We don't have like a header file and a .m file. We have one, one file where we have the implementation um, for like, for example, here I'm declaring properties or methods and the implementation is right there. It's inlined. Um, you can have partial classes, which is, hey, I can declare one class in three or four different files and then the compiler will merge them together. Um, but that's still not separating header from implementation. When you have a, you know, whenever you declare a property or a method, you actually have to declare the implementation right there. You don't split them up with a header and an M file. Um, so that's kind of what we have with classes. Um, we're object oriented, so we do, um, you know, the um, inheritance and polymorphism. So we have access modifier, public, private, um, protected concepts that everybody learns in college a little bit, regardless of the language, whether it was Java or C++. Most people are familiar with the concept of public being something that you can access from anywhere, private being something that you can only access from in your class, protected something you can access um, as you inherit. Um, and then we do have this special keyword that we use in C Sharp a lot called internal. Um, and what that is, is when you declare something internal, it's public within the scope of the assembly. So within the scope of the library that you're accessing it, um, it's public for everybody. And then anybody outside of that library, it looks to them like it's private. Um, so they just don't see it. Um, we have the concept of members. Um, and member is a kind of the generic term that we use for anything that's in a class. So it's kind of the data in a class. We have fields, methods, properties. Um, all of these we're going to flesh out as we go. So um, I'm just giving you the term so that as you hear me talk about a member, um, you don't laugh. That's the actual term that we use. Um, it's not that kind of member. Um, with regards to encapsulating, or uh, properties is a good way to encapsulate properties. This is the exact same than Objective-C property. Right. Um, and th using the getters and setters here uh, is kind of much like using a synthesized manually uh, yep. in the implementation file. Yep. So, yeah, so for example here, we um, for as a property, we are kind of, you declare as a property, you just use a special syntax where you declare a getter and a setter. Um, the automatically synthesized is like right here where we have a get dot, get, mm -hmm. you know, semicolon, set, semicolon. That's the equivalent of the auto synthesize. Um, if you want to write your own getter, you can. So you can actually just do curly right here on the get. I think on the last slide, business actually. logic. So, uh, oh yeah, so this slide right here has yeah. uh, a property called date time. This is a nullable date time. 
Um, so that's why it might look sim um, a little bit different. That's why the question mark. Um, but um, this is just a property where I can say return birthday and I have the field. Mm -hmm. So I did an auto synthesize here, whereas in this syntax it's auto synthesized. Um, you have both options. Um, and of course, they follow all the accent modifiers and everything else. And for those instance variables or IRs as we know them in iOS, uh, note that even the same convention of underscore is very popular uh, in a C sharp as well as in Objective C. That's very religious. So I, <laughs> I was, I, you know, one, some days I write underscore, other days I don't. If right. you look at the .NET um, kind of the, the recommendations and the kind of um, the guidelines that we use, um, they don't use underscore. Okay, I've um, seen I'm it done so lots of different old, ways. Yeah, but. I'm so old that I remember M underscore from my C plus class where we used to do M underscore. A variable name, so that's kind of where, where it came from. And I go, like, some days I do it, some days I don't. Uh, very, very inconsistent. There's lots of M's in uh, the C-sharp that comes from job programmers, too. Yep, so, um, so perfect. Um, methods is what we call for, um, you know, calling an object to execute an operation. This is the same than a message in, um, in Objective-C. So, um, so it's, a, a, it's similar functionality to the message in Objective-C. Later, when we talk about strong type, etc., you'll see there's a, few, um, see there's a few differences. In our case, methods are strong types, and they resolve a compile time. Um, there will be ways where I can show you how not to resolve it at compile time, but by default we are we're very strong type um, and resolve at compile time. Uh, we have the concept of method overloading, where you'll see one method that you know the exact same method name, um, and it just kind of comes down and has different parameters. Uh, very much like Objective C, where if you look at uh, the function being the whole length with all the parameters and names and everything, um, we have the exact same thing. Right. The difference I would say between our overloading and our, and you know and we see in Objective C is that in our case we go by just the types in the parameters, so the mm -hmm. names don't matter at all. Right. Um, we look at the name of the method, and we look at the types and parameter, and that's all you can overload. Right. Um, and so overloading uh, isn't really even a thing in Objective-C, because every method, every time you add a parameter, you're actually changing the signature of the method, in, yep. by definition, a new method, rather than overloading an existing one. Yep. But you can have two that right, have very, the exact yeah, same kind of name, and then just have different, you know, signature as we right. go through the parameters. It's the exact same concept mm -hmm. as, as we go. Uh, fields, as you mentioned earlier, fields are just I-bars. Um, they're declared the exact same. They're scoped uh, within, the, um, within your class. Um, and you know they, they follow the access modifiers, so so there's nothing interesting there. Um, we do have a keyword for static, um, so this is static across the board. And the one thing that we have in C sharp is you can declare static anything. You can have static properties, um, static members, or static methods. Um, you know you can even have static classes. Um, and the way I think of uh, statics, if I was mapping to object C, it's kind of a, what a class method is static, like, you know, from an object oriented mm -hmm. standpoint. Obviously, right. C still has a static keyword. I wouldn't try to bring any preconceived notions uh, if you're coming from Objective C as far as what the static keyword will do in Objective C. Don't try to translate that onto C sharp. It's really much different. Yep. Uh, it's a very much like a type end uh, modifier in C sharp versus like a visibility or scope thing uh, for variables. Yep. Objective C. Um, so think about it again, a class method is the way I think for the methods, and we can have them as properties, so that's slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, we have constructors, so this is just the term we use for initializers. That's kind of the C++, Java term, so hopefully people are familiar with it. Um, and this is just a constructor. It gets called. Um, it does two things. It allocates the memory and initializes the variable. Um, so this is the equivalent of the initializers with, um, with an alloc in it, all in one line, you know, just being called uh, by the initializer. And we have very similar concepts to uh, what we have in Objective-C, where, um, for example, here um, I have this person is just calling the default initializer, which is the one that takes a string. Um, and you'll see like this will be the default initializer because everybody else might be calling onto it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we have the exact same you know, ability to chain them and do anything you want um, right. with regards to initialization. Mm -hmm. um, we also have or use the term finalizers, which is destructors if you come from a C or C++ world or Java world. Um, these are our finalizers, um, our destructors, and these are called whenever the object's finalized. Remember, we said earlier, our garbage collection is non-deterministic. Um, so this is not something we kind of have people rely on. Don't rely on finalizer. Don't rely, uh, don't rely on um, these being called for you to release some you know, important object. Um, obviously, the equivalent of a finalizer will be calling release and having your destructor in Objective-C be called. Um, again, it's not the pattern we use. What we use is we use this thing called dispose pattern, which is um, you write your class and then you implement this little interface called iDisposable. And I haven't told you what an interface is. An interface is like a protocol. Um, so you implement right here, I disposable, um, and then um, you know anybody that looks at your class is going to look at it, and just by kind of like convention, they're going to be like, oh, it implements I disposable, so I have to call dispose. And what we do with C sharp is give you this convenience um, using block, where I can just go back and say um, using, and then I declare variables there that are disposable, and then C sharp will automatically call dispose for me. Um, so for example, here I have a data reader which maybe has access to a buffer or a, or a string, and it needs to be released because I don't want to hold on to that. I don't want that to stay alive until garbage is collected. So if I just put it inside this user right here, at the end of this, reader.dispose is going to be called, and then in reader.dispose right here, I can release all my resources. Um, so that's kind of where we're going to be at. Uh, we have concept of abstract classes um, in, um, in C Sharp. And if you think about inheritance, right, obviously, 
you, you inherit from a class, you derive from a class, and you inherit that functionality. An abstract class is a class that cannot be instantiated, but it has functionality that you can inherit. Yep. Um, so this is not like implementing a protocol because you're actually inheriting the functionality, but the class is declared abstract, and then nobody can actually just say new, whatever, in this case, uh, people manager is an abstract class, so nobody can come in and say, oh, new people manager. You actually have to have, for example, a dev manager, which derives from a people manager, and there I can do um, I can implement derived functionality and then new that object. And, and um, we don't really have anything like that in Objective. -C. Yeah, there's nothing like that in Objective C. Um, it's pretty useful because you get to inherit functionality um, and you get to enforce when it, when things must be overwritten. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where we have. For example, right here I have these abstract method do work. So for example, dev manager right here is inherited from people manager, and if I don't implement do work, the compiler is going to give me an error. So I declare, my, I declare my class and I have some functionality that I want to inherit, like for example, the property here for direct reports um, and maybe the ability for a manager to schedule meetings because we all know that's all they do. And then, you know, the do work comes down to the type of work that they do, right? So here, I'm, you know, if I'm a dev manager, uh, maybe I'll get some coding. Uh, I think all dev managers should just get snacks. That's why I hinted of that uh, as you're looking at Or, you know, just leave the uh, implementation of that one empty. <laughs> yeah, leave it alone. <laughs> Is that the case? Um, we, have Astro, we also have seal classes and seal class is one that cannot be inherited. Um, I don't code seal classes a lot, so I don't think people will need them as much. Um, but um, one thing that you'll see a lot, especially as you come into the .NET framework, is that you will see that a lot of our framework classes are sealed. Right. Um, and this is where, for example, if you think about string, uh, that's a type that in our world is immutable. It's kind of like any string where you know it's immutable. It has certain optimizations. So um, the .NET framework, the guys at Microsoft that are decoding the language, say, hey, um, we're going to make optimizations, so we don't want anybody to inherit from it. Right. Um, such that you know they don't they don't assume certain things or they don't break certain assumptions that we made. And I, um, I think a lot of these types too that are also sealed are uh, types that are provided by WinRT. Um, so as we get into it later, and we'll see like file pickers uh, and storage files, storage folders, those sorts yep. of types are all sealed because they actually come from WinRT, uh, yep. which is a layer below .NET that we'll probably see more about here soon. Yep. Earlier when we talk about projections, right? Anything that's WinRT will have to be sealed because we have to project against right. it. So when we expose the object, we make them sealed by convention, and that way you can access the language, we generate the metadata, and all of that. Um, so yeah. That's, that's exactly right. So, and I'm just telling people because they're going to see them. Yeah. Um, continuing on object oriented uh, and object orientation and inheritance, we have the concept of virtual and override. Um, so from any class, I can declare um, a virtual property or a virtual method. And this is something that I'm letting somebody that derives from me um, actually just override. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if I have a class, uh, right here a class um, called car and I want anybody to override the model name I have this property right here called model um, and I just declare it as virtual and with C sharp what we do is um, when you uh, when you go in there and for example here declare this route for car and you want to override the model you use the override keyword if you don't use the override keyword the compiler is going to come back and give you a warning and say hey are you trying to override something um, so um, so you have to it's just a kind of a safety check you can still get away with it um, we can do an override or a new keyword, but it's something the compiler does just to prevent errors. So it's a nice, um, a nice extra feature that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and again, all you get is a warning. You don't get an error, so you will compile your code um, if you feel that that's annoying um, and you want to do that. It's always um, good to be verbose for things like that. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and here we get to the concept of interface. Um, an interface is a protocol, right? That's where you declare kind of a contract that you know a class or anybody that implements your interface is going to implement. Right, um, so interface is nothing but a protocol. Um, the one thing that's different about our interface is that um, when you declare an interface, or when you declare that you implement an interface, um, you must implement every method. So we don't have, or every property. Everything that the interface outlines, you will have to implement. You can just do no work, throw an exception or whatever, so you can just go in there and put an empty method, but you do have to implement it. If you're missing um, you know, one method or a property, um, the compiler is going to complain that you haven't implemented the object, so there's no option. There's no equivalent of that optional, like yep. again, an objective C protocols. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, again, with Astro classes and other ways, you can, you can right. do a little bit of that. Um, our interface is a strong type, um, and they can actually support inheritance. So for example, here I can define an iProgrammer interface, um, and then I go back and you know, create an iOS programmer interface that inherits from iProgrammer. Right? And you know, in the end, programmers write code, but you know, there might be different frameworks that they're using, or there might be different uh, technologies they know. So I kind of went back and you know, did a little bit of inheritance there just to show you. Um, and this is all strong types, so I can cast them as I go back. If you look at this code snippet, um, I can declare, for example, an iProgrammer who's a web programmer, and web programmer who's a web programmer, and then I can cast back and forth. And the compiler is going to be looking at it, making sure that I don't call methods that are only a web programmer and are not an iProgrammer if that's how I declared it. Okay. If I need to pass the objects because I know that this iProgrammer is a web programmer, I can do that. Yeah. Right? And we're going to talk about those in, in a minute. So, um, so you see here that, um, again, strong type, and um, you know, they, they, they go through inheritance, um, and you can do cast them, you can cast them as you go. Right? So that's kind of at the top level with regards to class declarations and everything else. That's the principles of object orientation that we follow. Um, if you come from Objective-C, 
everything that should be familiar, everything that you're familiar with, um, you will have the ability to implement um, and do the exact same fun equivalent functionality. Uh, moving down a little bit to the lower level, let's talk about the type system. Um, our type system, um, we have two different types, um, or two kind of um, two types of types, I guess, um, two categories. Uh, we have something we call value types and then reference types. Value types are where anything that's a struct, like int, float, decimal, bool, anything that where we just allocate the memory, and the big thing is that we copy this by value. So if I declare an integer um, and you know inter integer a and I assign it to integer integer b, when I go and update a, um, b which has just a copy of the value, so it's not going to get updated, right? That's what we declare as a value type. So we kind of declare the variable and then we copy it back and forth as we go. Um, and then we have the concept of reference type, which is what you're most familiar with. That's kind of where you spend most of your time in Objective C. Um, you know when you're looking at anything that inherits from an object, those are just references. Um, and what you have there is, for example, if I declare a string a and a string b. Um, a will point to B, right? Um, and then, or for example, you have an object called person, um, and both Eric and I have a reference to that. If he updates a property called first name, um, I'm going to see that change too because we're both holding a reference onto that object. Right. Um, again, this is very, very much what you get out of Objective C. Right. Um, and this is in C sharp. This is where you can spend most of your time anyway, so you're going to be very familiar. You won't have to worry about copying or anything like that. Yeah. And if we go back to that slide real quick. Which one? Um, the, Which one? Yeah, those value types uh, in C sharp. Um, when you're using them on for Windows Store apps, practically they're uh, they're aliased uh, to the WinRT types as well, right? So they're those types when you use them and instantiate them. Uh, not Net's not actually doing heavy lifting of doing work with those types. It's WinRT runtime beneath it doing that. And then reference types uh, in Objective C, uh, we get to use them like object or pointers to an object, uh, and we can do pointer math on them and all that sort of stuff. But in C sharp, you don't get to do that. It's more of a reference uh, that actually acts the same as kind of the pointers, but doesn't let you, or well, you don't get to do the uh, same sort of math and that kind of things on it. Yep. So, so their references, and yeah, you should not treat them as regular pointers. Right. Um, don't do pointer arithmetic. Um, there's ways that you can pin certain things so that you can kind of get the equivalent of a pointer, but uh, but it's not something we do, and it's right. something you should avoid. Um, uh, there's no reason to do it in a language like C sharp. Yep. There's usually no need for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're going back and forth between value type and reference type, um, we call that boxing um, on, and, and unboxing as we go. Uh, so yeah, you can go back and forth. You'll be seamless. Um, the compiler will do the right thing. Um, and for the most part, it's not going to create problems for developers. Like you know, it's just a little bit of overhead as we allocate the memory and make the copies. It's something you need to be familiar with. But in a in Objective C and iOS stuff, basically, we, there's no explicit concept of boxing versus unboxing. But sometimes you'll find yourself in a position where you have say boolean or something, and you need to turn it into an NS number so you can store it. NS yeah. number acts very much the same as uh, these like the int primitives versus like integer class does here. Yep. Um, and this is not one thing that I get often is people ask is these like bridging um, where you know in, in Objective C I have to bridge something when for example if I'm actually an address book uh, and I want to assign all those things to any strings or anything like that. And this is not this is just more this is more equivalent of putting right. an integer in an in, or a bool in an NS number. I, I think we've got the slides coming up that are yep. more like bridging. Yep. So we do have something like bridging if you need it. Um, when you're using Objective C, um, I'm sorry, when you're using C sharp, um, you'll be able to call methods that have parameters as out and ref. Um, so by default, when you pass a parameter onto a method, um, we will pass it by value. Um, now it's interesting because we have these reference types. So what have, what does it mean to pass a reference type by value? If I if we had a method that takes a person um, and you pass that person by value, like if I give you the person by value, Eric, um, into the parameter, you'll be able to uh, say, oh, person dot name equals John, and mm -hmm. assign that. Yep. Right, but the one thing that you cannot do is give me back another person. Right, right. So if you change what that person points to, kind of what that, refer that what that's referencing, uh, when I come out of that method, I'm not going to see it. That's right. right. So if you want to update the reference, then you use out and ref. These are the keywords that you'll use to actually pass something. Where if I give you an out, um, I'm pretty much telling you, hey, go ahead and create this for me. Mm -hmm. Right. If I give you a ref, you'll be like, hey, I have an object here, or you might or might not change the reference. But if you change the reference, it's okay because I'll see the change. Right, and right. this is similar to NC or Objective C. Uh, when you're passing basically addresses uh, into functions and writing to the address or using the pointer in that function as an out parameter there. It's yep. something that you've seen before, especially in the uh, lower level core foundations, C yep. APIs. Yeah. Yep. So, so you're going to see that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we have kind of the way I look at it is everything that we do in C sharp is type, it's a strong type. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a lot of times you will need, as you're doing cast and stuff like that, you want to do um, a little bit of um, you know casting back and forth, checking for specific types, etc. Um, so we do give you keywords so that you can do this um, because in C sharp what you're going to see is if you cast something to the wrong object, um, you will get an exception, right? Mm -hmm. So if I take a person and I, ca I try to cast it onto uh, an animal. Right, and they're totally different. Um, I'm going to actually get an exception if those types are not compatible. C sharp will just say, "Oh, this is not compatible." Most of the time, the compiler is going to catch that way earlier anyway. Right. Um, but there's areas where you do need, uh, you know, you're using polymorphism and you need to be able to check something. So, um, so what we do is we give you these two keywords: um, is 
which is what you check to see if, for example, right here, I can check if P is a person. Um, this is the exact same that it's kind of class. Um, mm -hmm. So I just go back and say, um, you know, assert that P is a person or that EMP is a person. Um, EMP right here is an employee, but employee, um, it's actually um, derived from person. So in this case, um, EMP is a person, right? Um, and then as is what we need to kind of do um, to do a safe dynamic cast. Right. Um, so what happens here is, for example, um, if I try to cast something right here where I say, oh, cast, you know, P, which is a person as an employee, right? That's not going to turn an exception because I'm just doing a safe cast with the as keyword, um, but it's going to return null. Um, and then where the exception would happen would be if I cast that, if I do the cast that way, and then I try to access one of the members or um, you know, call the method, then that's where the exception would happen. So this ASCII where it does kind of a safe type check is very much like uh, first doing the cast Objective-C and then testing with a uh, response to selector yeah, to see if it's selector. actually that kind of object. Um, yep, yep, exactly. Um, and then we have a type of, um, which is kind of a keyword that we have. And in our case, type of is very much like calling the class method on anything. Like for example, you have a class like any string, I can say any string class, and that gives me the type. Um, and we use the exact same thing. Um, that type of is something that's static that the compiler can do. So for example, you see right here, I have a type of person. At you know, compile time, this is actually reference or kind of like solving what the type is and then comparing against that type. Now at runtime, I can also do call get type on any object. Anything that inherits from object will have this get type method, which is going to give me the type, which again is the class. Yeah, that's much right? like calling class yeah, yep, exactly. on any sort of objective C object. Yep. Um, and all of our casts are unsafe. So again, you have to do your own um, checking as you're casting along. So um, something that we have in C-Sharp that's very, very popular, and you're going to see a lot, is generics. Um, and generics, if you come from C++, it's templates, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, um, and we use these a lot. Um, you'll see for us, for example, uh, we'll have, like, here I'm declaring a list of int, uh, as opposed to declaring a list of objects. Like, if you think about NS array, um, there you can put anything, but it has to inherit from, you know, it has to be an object. Right. Um, on our world, we can just go in there and just create generic specialized types that will be, oh, this is a list and it can be of any type, and you just tell it what type it's going to be. Of course, um, if you said like list of type object, then it would function much the same way as an array in yeah. Objective-C or NS array, where there's no type checking. Yeah. Yep, yeah, you could have a dictionary of type object and, or, mm -hmm. or um, an array of type object, and it would be the exact same when you get out of Objective-C. Um, for us with generic, you'll see that actually the framework, like we used to have all the, gen the non-generic types, like we used to have array in .NET 2.0, and you used to take objects, and they do all the casting and the boxing and the unboxing. Uh, but obviously, there's performance implication there because we have to box and unbox things. Um, and then the type safety and the compiler checks are not available there if you're just casting a lot. Um, so we kind of started deprecating a little bit of those. And what you're going to see is that everywhere, you know, where you see our documentation, our samples, and even our APIs, you will see that we're very much specialized and aiming towards generic. Um, but you'll have functionality if you just want to draw everything in object and keep your code familiar to what you know. Mm -hmm. So um, our generics are extensible, so you can write your own generic class. So in, in the past, I show you stack. This is stack with a generic type. It's a type that ships in the framework, so is list. Um, but here, I kind of um, group, um, and I'll show you the samples for all of this in a minute. Um, I won't work through every single sample, but uh, here I kind of declare a group stack. Um, just to give you a, free, a feel for the flavor of declaring a kind of a generic class. So here, I'm declaring a, a class called public um, group stack, and I'm saying T is going to be a generic type. Now, you can see, for example, here, I'm saying this type is actually inheriting from stack of T. Um, so that actually inherits all the functionality. I didn't have to write a lot of uh, functionality to get a group stack. Um, and then I can also apply constraints. For example, I can say where T, which is my generic type, it has to implement a comparable. Mm -hmm. So if I try to declare a group stack of something that doesn't implement a comparable, the compiler is going to complain and say, hey, you can't do this. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of type safety and a lot of functionality that I can reuse by doing that inheritance and doing that, um, yeah, applying those constraints. Um, so for the most part, yeah, I guess business logic, you will write some generic classes. But if you're an iOS person coming onto um, C Sharp, you don't have to worry. You won't be creating generic classes much. Um, You'll you be consuming to, them a lot, though. Yeah, you have to right. know how to consume them. That's the, that's the big deal. And you're going to see plenty of samples today um, on that. Um, if you want to inspect things at runtime, um, kind of like, for example, take a person and then look at the type and say, oh, what methods does it have? What properties do we have? Um, in the .NET world, we call that reflection. Um, so look in the system.reflection namespace, um, and you will have APIs there to access all the metadata and even to invoke um, the, you know, the methods in there and the members in there. So um, you can get a type and open it up, look at all the properties, call onto those properties, set values on those properties, call the methods, and do all kinds of functionality there um, by just calling it. So you'll see here in this example, for example, um, um, I have a type person, um, and then I just went in and got the type. Um, and then I'm enumerating um, all the property names and enumerating um, the current property value by using this get value. So you can see here, I'm going into person and saying, oh, give me the value for this property. 
Um, and in this case, I'm assuming that you know that there's strings uh, or it's returning them a string because I'm doing the property info, and this will do the two string on that. Um, and then I can also come back here and say, hey, give me all the declare methods on the type, and then you know go ahead and find the one called greet um, that has only one parameter, and then call that with a hey, you know, like this will be a greeting done. Um, so I'm passing a, an invoke in here, passing an array of the parameters. In this case, there's one with the name hide on or, or whatever we're going to use. And this is uh, anybody who's ever done any sort of inspection on the objective C runtime will feel really at home with the reflection namespace. Uh, provides almost all of the exact same functionality as those class underscore methods uh, that are in uh, iOS in objective C runtime. Yep. Yeah. So this is all, again, what you should expect coming onto C sharp is all the same functionality. Um, a little bit stronger type, but you know you'll be able to get away with a lot of things, and I'll show you um, in a few minutes as we go into implicit data types and dynamic types, um, even more familiar stuff. Um, so here, the other thing that we have is in C# we have this new um, keyword called bar, um, and this is where we can declare um, kind of implicit data types. So for example, right here, um, I can say bar stir equals this is a string, uh, and the compiler can look at that and say, oh look. Um, this stir is going to be of type string, um, and it actually infers the type. Right. So this is not something that's on type. This is not something that you know, like becomes or that's an object. The compiler is actually looking at it and saying, "Oh, I'm going to infer the type, and I'm going to make a guess." You can think of um, the step almost as like the word var gets replaced with the string, the class, yep. uh, in that first example, uh, before the compilation even happens, really. Exactly. Yes. Um, and this is a this is first of all a new feature. It kind of came later onto the framework. It's been there since um, I, I believe .NET 3.5 or maybe .NET 4. Um, so definitely in everything for Windows Store apps. Um, and it's something that I still have mixed feelings about because um, it's convenient to type it like that, especially for demos. I can type bar and change the types as I go. But once I get into real code, I kind of like to stay a little bit uh, stronger type and declare the right things to begin with so that I don't, I'm not giving it to the compiler to infer something. Uh, but it's something that I, so you can use. Um, where it's used a lot more is kind of an anonymous type. Mm -hmm. um, in .NET, we have this concept of an anonymous type where I can say, for example, right here, I have this code and I say, bar AA equals new name. If you don't mind going to the slide, yep. Um, bar AA equals new name, uh, new. And then this is actually declaring <coughs> an anonymous type. I'm declaring a new type call that has a property call name and a property call age, right? Um, and then I can go back there and, for example, interact with that and, and get a type, and it's going to give me, oh, that's an anonymous type. So the compiler is actually generating that for me behind the scenes, and that's the anonymous type that they gave it. Um, if you try it on your own, you'll get a totally different type depending on what you declare in your project. Right, but you can go in there and, for example, then I can call aa.name um, or I can call aa.h. And if I type, to the, if I try to access some method or some property call and find something that's actually not in the anonymous type, the compiler will actually detect that and automatically give me an error at compile time. This is not a runtime. Right. right. So that's what a bar will do. It's kind of an implicit data type, and that's what is useful for um, kind of building an anonymous type on the fly, which is convenient when I'm reading JSON or doing certain things, um, you know, bringing data from a server. It's kind of convenient for, for parsing to do that. Mm -hmm. um, everything there is still strong type. Um, so the one thing, if you don't want to be strong type, what we have is we give you a dynamic keyword. Um, and if I go back here and I declare something, like for example here, I have a dynamic DA object. Um, when we, we declare something dynamic, we tell the compiler, hey, please remove all type checking until the runtime. Right? So this is very much like Objective-C does. Right? So right. with Objective-C, I can call, I can send or you know, send any message, and then at runtime, it might or might not work. Uh, and with dynamic, we do the exact same thing. I can just declare, for example, right here, um, I have, again, the anonymous type. And if I try calling, calling aa.undefined, the compiler will give me an error with the implicit type. But if I declare this DA as dynamic, then the compiler will not give me an error when I try to call da.undefined. The method is still undefined. Um, so what happens is at runtime, I'm going to get an exception. Um, something you will see throughout um, as we go throughout the day and everything is um, in .NET and C Sharp and Windows Store, um, we throw a lot of exceptions. Um, Objective-C right. exception is kind of a very um, um, one-off case. Like, you know, it's not used for logic. Or in Objective-C, yeah, exceptions logic. are usually programmer error. Like, you made a problem when writing your code, and you should change it if you're throwing Objective-C ex exceptions. Yep. Uh, they're not used for program control flow or anything like that. Yep. And um, in C Sharp and .NET, we tend to use that a lot more for control flow. So if you, for example, call a method, you will get an argument or invalid argument exception, or you will get um, you know, a lot of exceptions that way. We tend to do that a lot more. Um, so that's definitely a difference that you're going to see. Um, another difference that you're going to see here is um, you'll see on these little code samples, I wrote deep by dot write line and assert a lot. Uh, write line is the equivalent of log. Um, so um, just ns log, just put in stuff on the console because I was using it for samples. Uh, but the one thing that for us is um, if you write assertions, in our case, the uh, deep by dot assertions get stripped out um, as your code ships. 
Right. So if you write a debug about a search, that gets stripped out, where if you're in Objective-C and you write a search term, those stay there. That's true of uh, everything in that systems diagnostics namespace, right? Yep. Well, I, I don't know if it's everything in system diagnostics. Or at least the um, debug. But definitely the debug object, okay. all of that will get stripped out. Okay. Um, so assertions, right lines, all of that gets stripped out um, as we can file for release, um, if anything, that's in system diagnostics. And that's the fair point that um, debug.writeline is actually system.diagnostics.debug. Right. Um, you'll see the shortcuts here. Um, I'm kind of going to give you all the theory, and then we'll walk through a couple samples, uh, because I think this is very introductory, so I don't want to waste developers' time with uh, giving them the introductory stuff. I'm just giving them the context, and then I'll show you the samples, and you'll be able to download the samples and play with them offline. Um, null is our version of nil, um, and when a null, when an object is set to uh, null, it indicates that you know its value is set to nothing. Um, if you have a reference type and you just declare it, like you can say, uh, you know, person p, that person has been assigned null uh, by default. Um, it started with nil and everything else. Um, very similar to nil. I think the only difference that I could think of is that um, when you're doing a kind of Boolean evaluations in, in C Sharp, um, you actually have to check for something equal to nil. You can't just say if object and then have it be like, oh, if you know, if object was not nil, like, yeah, because I can go in there and say if object and if that object was nil, I can just write that short syntax. Um, in C Sharp, you actually have to do the comparison and say if object equals equals nil. Right. So, um, so that's the only difference that we have there. Uh, with regard to programming flow, every programming language has about the same flow, so you're not going to expect anything different from C Sharp or for or for JPC. You have if loop, uh, for loops, do while, for each, um, switch. You know, all of them are the same. Um, I have a link right here to all the um, C Sharp keywords, uh, which will give you. If you go in there and just look at the keywords, you will see what we use for loops and what we use for control flow and everything else, because um, those keywords should be familiar to anybody that knows C. Um, right. If you have C plus plus, so um, so it'll be the same. Just interrupt you real quick. Uh, partial classes are coming, right? I've been yep. seeing a question popping up quite a few times. Yeah. So um, yeah. So um, so when we're, we're going to get to them in coming. We're to partial like, classes. So. We'll do a little bit of a code walkthrough through some of these again. Um, okay. And then we'll we'll talk about partial classes in a minute. Um, I did a type map in here where I said, oh, here's some of the C sharp types, and um, here's the iOS types that we're familiar with. Um, string, uh, array, um, that's actually an interesting one. When you're using array, dictionary, um, list, everything in .NET, by default, we're mutable. Mm -hmm. um, so if you come from the iOS world, you're more familiar with, oh, I have an array and I have mutable array. Um, in our world, we're, default, we're mutable by default. In fact, we have very few types that are not mutable. String is unmutable. You make a copy of the string. Um, again, it's sealed. We optimize it quite a bit. Um, and then we have a lot of types here where um, you'll see generics. For example, um, you're looking for the equivalent of NS set. We'll have a hash set, a sort, a sort set, and they will have. There will be generic types, so you mm -hmm. can actually apply your um, your types. Um, so these are kind of very basic types. Um, over here, you have kind of more native types. These are my value types. Um, in char float, these are map exactly the way to uh, what we do with uh, Objective C, or literally the C angle, the native uh, the C angle in Objective C. Um, right. Our bool is actually true, um, and it's straight. Um, so we don't have yes, no, we don't do zero, one. We literally do true and false. Right. Um, that's what we do a lot more in Objective-C. It's uh, true or false, not false in anything else that is true. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, call design events um, here. This is interesting because um, um, we use the term delegate. Um, and for us, the delegate term, which is going to be which <laughs> probably the most used term in, uh, in Objective-C, for us, is a different meaning. Um, add delegate is a function pointer. It's like a block. Actually, a delegate a is pointer. actually type function pointer. Yeah. So it's a strong type reference to a method. It's a block, and it's a you know it's type um, it's a type block. Right. Um, so that's what a delegate is. I know it's going to drive you crazy. Um, interface and protocols can go back and forth. When I have a conversation, we talk about delegates. That <laughs> that gets a little bit more confusing. But again, delegate is just a strong type method, right? A reference to a method. It's a type def on a block. That's what it is. Um, you're going to see um, ask over that a little bit as we go. Um, I talked or earlier I showed you anonymous types. Uh, we can also do anonymous method, and this is exactly the same than a block, right? So um, anywhere or from here, I can, for example, say, oh, the loaded event handler for here is going to be a delegate, and I can declare on the fly, just like I could declare a, a block in the fly, a completion mm -hmm. handler or something like that on the fly. That's an anonymous type. Um, again, these are strong type. The compiler is actually doing the work ahead of time. So there's more work that the compiler is doing, but that's all behind the scenes, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, we also have the concept of lambda expressions. This is a little bit more advanced. Um, what we do here is a lambda expression is a shorter syntax onto the way to declare, um, you know, anonymous uh, anonymous delegates and you know function callbacks. So um, rather than you know declaring every parameter and its types and everything else, we kind of are letting the compiler do a little bit of inheritance, uh, a little bit of uh, kind of implicit in typing. Where for example here, I can say unsorted delegate sort, and I have two parameters, first and second. Right? And the compiler is going to look at the types of the things I'm passing in, and it's going to infer the types, and then it's going to go back and say, oh, you know, because here I'm doing a, declare, uh, I'm doing a comparison. Um, this is my delegate sort. Um, it's just doing comparison. It's just going to declare return true, whether, um, or it's going to declare the return first minus second. So let's assume these are two integers. If I plus one and two, it's going to say, oh, you know, one is, you know, 
1 minus 2 is minus 1, so these numbers are smaller. Um, and you can see there how we, would, we could do a delegate sort. You'll see the code in a minute. Um, lambda expression is more advanced. You will see a lot of our samples use them, so you'll get familiar with the syntax, but don't worry if you don't want to learn how to write them. Um, everybody could tell me, oh, the syntax is so hard to understand. Um, it takes a week. Um, you don't have to ever write a lambda expression. You can just write full-blown um, declarations, well, and it's just a little bit more typing. I'll be honest. I find the lambda syntax much easier than the Objective-C block syntax. So. Well, fair, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's that, that's comparing, you know, so that's comparing two things that are like right. comparing to something that's complex already. But yeah, that's that's a fair point. Um, so yeah, you just it's an optional thing. I guess is where I was going. Um, events um, you have objects, and your object can have you know just like they can have properties. They can have this special type of property, which is an event, which actually is a special delegate. Um, and this is where delegation happens to us um, with events. If you're coming from you know the object C world and used, used to, and you're used to delegation event, and I'll show you the sample for events for sure. Um, is where you're going to see oh here's how we kind of delegate things. Now we don't do again in, in object C. What I see is you kind of you have the protocol, you define it, and that becomes your delegate. So it's kind of your contract where it's you know in, in .NET I'll be the interface. Mm -hmm. um, in our world, we tend to be we just declare the events, and that's kind of the contract. So um, so for example, if you look at a page. It's definitely going to have four or five methods that are kind of a delegate with events like loaded, unloaded, things that you would expect. Um, but in, in our that, case, they're declared event. In, in that way, the, the delegate pattern, the way they end up being used, is very similar to the way it is in uh, iOS, where basically the delegate is the thing that is doing something another object wants it to. Yep. Uh, and we hook into those events uh, through an Objective-C using a protocol, uh, and in this case, using delegate methods directly, where we subscribe directly to that event handler, yep. or we subscribe our event handler directly to that event. Yep. And that fits well, too, also with regards to uh, earlier we said, you know, in our case, well, if we had interfaces, you have to implement all the interfaces. Right. Uh, whereas, you know, in Objective-C, because you can have optional methods on the, um, on the interface or protocol, um, you wouldn't have to pick up everything. What we do here is, for example, this airport class can have 10 different events, and I just need to land to listen for one. Right. There's right? no, like, it's not necessary for you to subscribe to all of them uh, exactly. if you don't want to. Right? Yep. Because exactly. it's opt in, not opt out, or right. implement some or all. In parallel, if we declare six and you want three of them, you will have to um, do plus equal on the three that you want to subscribe to. Um, so you'll see it right here. And I'll give you, like, if we walk through the syntax, you'll see I have a class called airport, um, and it has an event um, that, you know, is called flight arrive. And you see that we tend, whenever we declare events, we tend to declare a type for the event so that mm -hmm. we can, you know, something that inherits from the event arc so that we have kind of a base class that we all know to adhere to and a convention to follow. Right. This is just but, also more of that type safety to make sure the event you have hooked up uh, will get all of the right arguments from the parameters that the event has. Yep. Um, and then you see here how from within the class, how I fire the event, I have my, you know, land, you know, let's say I have a method where the plane is landing, and then I just go in there and say, oh, you know, go ahead and get a, a reference to the event, um, and then if somebody subscribed, this will be this would not be null. So if I say if eh not equals null, this is where I'm checking somebody's listening. Otherwise, there's no reason to fire it, and then I just call on to it very much like I would call it lock, right? Um, and um, and then this is firing and it's calling back onto whoever subscribed to, and then that person can do kind of their delegation where they can do their work there. In this code, actually, a question had popped up earlier, uh, and this is a good place to just kind of answer it and mention it. But uh, that check against eh does not equal null is because trying to call messages or uh, methods on null objects will result in an exception, and that's why you have you do have to guard against that sort of thing in objectives or in C sharp. Yep. Yeah. So in our world, if you have something that's null um, and you try to call send a message or call a method, um, you will get an exception if it's null. Mm -hmm. um, so we won't ignore it uh, or anything right. like that. So um, here's the syntax. So the left hand side right here with airport has how we declare and how we fire the event. Um, here you have somebody consuming the event, which is what most developers will do a lot, um, consuming the events that we have on the framework. And you'll see here, I'm just declaring a new airport. And then we use this plus equal to subscribe to the event. Um, so that means, you know, if you implement it, you can subscribe and unsubscribe whenever you want. It's not like you're implementing the full delegate and, you know, everything's wired by default. In this whole subscribe, unsubscribe thing, the terminology is actually very similar to Notification Center uh, yep. in the way that you, for, like, add yourself as a handler for a certain event and then remove it later when you're done. Yep, yeah. exactly. Um, so kind of merge those, but this is the way we do delegations. Think about it as observer. The, the more generic term that I could use was think about it as an observer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like yeah, it is the observer pattern. Right? Yep, I believe exactly. both are, and it's just slightly different implementations yep. of what's going on. Um, there's a few things that I did cover, but you'll see, um, or a few that I, I have samples here, and then a few that you're going to see in the sample. Um, we have the concept of ex uh, extension methods, which is um, very much like categories in Objective-C. Mm -hmm. um, like, let's say I want to add a method um, to compare string, um, or to, you know, to see if a string starts with a digit. Um, the string was a sealed class, so you see here that the framework declared a seal. I cannot touch it, but I can go back and add an extension method. And the way we do that, it was, it was just declaring a static class. And we declare a static method that has a special keyword, um, this, which is this is the equivalent of self. 
Right. Um, for us, like whenever we're doing object oriented itself, and these are about the same. Um, in this case, when we declare the method, we have a special keyword that says, oh, this is going to be an extension method onto string. So from here, we know that I can have, you know, this is an extension method for string. We don't mm -hmm. declare it the way we do categories. Now, this would have other parameters, so I can have this string i and then pass other parameters, see what is, you know, appending or doing something else with the string. Um, so this is how we implement extension methods, which, again, is categories. Um, I mentioned this earlier. We have the concept of partial classes, um, which you see in a lot of these samples um, as I get to them in a minute. Um, and a partial class is just one class that is declared across multiple files. Mm -hmm. um, this is a pattern that we use a lot um, just out of the box because everything that we do for UI, you will have the design time, which is the SAML, and all the things that we use um, that the designer is generating. And then that designer is going to generate code. And you see all these generated files that are kind of hidden somewhere, but they exist. Mm -hmm. um, and you should never ever modify them, but you can go see them and see how things are coming together. And we're going to look at that later on, right? Yeah, when we okay. cover SAML, we'll definitely dive through, um, through that concept. Because when we see the UI for Windows Store apps and what's happening there, uh, there's actually going to be three partial classes that all come together to form what's actually shown on the screen for you. Yep, exactly. So um, those are eight. Um, there's more. Uh, there's a few things that I didn't cover. Some of them you'll see later in the day. Some of them you will not. Um, async and await and the whole concept of async programming we're going to dive into a lot la uh, later in the day. Um, I did not get deep into link, which is kind of our inter um, language intermediate query, or it's an intermediate integrated query. natural query. In integrated, yeah, natural query, uh, which is just ways to be able to select and filter an objects that are implement I numerals or collections. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually ends up looking pretty beautiful too when you have a lot of link code that's doing something powerful. Yeah, um, there's a lot of power to link. Um, it's very optional. You can write plenty of apps without ever using link, but if you're dealing with data a lot, link right. gives you a lot of functionality that uh, that you could benefit from. Um, I didn't get deep into serialization, and I did mention exception handling and the fact that we use exception handling a lot more for control flow um, than we do with that. Um, and that's kind of my really deep, kind of like um, brief overview of everything in the um, on the language. Um, I'm going to dive in to give you a couple samples so you get familiar with the language. I just didn't want to go back and forth um, as much um, so that I can come back here and, and do a little bit of, you know, showing you a little bit of the code as we went. Um, everything that you saw, every single code snippet that you saw on those slides, um, you'll be able to see in this sample. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll come back here and be able to find property, methods, generics, everything that we showed you there, um, you'll be able to come to this sample and then um, debug into it and everything else. So, um, so for example, here, um, I have the event one um, that's already open, which I thought, because that event is very, very important. Concept. Might want to bump up your phone a little bit. Oops. I've been switching back and forth with um, Express and non-Express. Mm. So, cool. There you go. That's probably better. That's much better. Yep. Uh, so here I have that same airport class that you saw, and you'll see the method right here, landing the plane, um, and you'll see how it declares the event, um, and we have a generic event handler. Uh, this just makes it easier. Um, you see here five flight ride event arcs. Um, it's just actually, um, you know, I can say go to definition here. Um, it takes me to where that class was defined, um, and I can go see right here that it inherits from event arcs. That's usually the convention that we use, so that we have kind of a base that we know we can query on. Um, and then here it just has an extra parameter, um, and it's an extra property. So you see here, this is a property, public, um, and this is the constructor. So you've seen all of the concepts that we talked about, right? Um, you can see a little bit of that. Um, I'll run it in a minute and you'll see it on the debugger. Um, so you'll see here, um, you'll see it on the debugger here. Um, here's a sample. Um, you'll see actually um, I have these partial class samples, which is declared. Every single one of the snippets has this one method for this partial class. Um, so there's one class called samples, um, and they all have one the one method that I'm using because I declare the sample for that class right here is listening to events, uh, but the whole class is called samples that includes all the samples. You'll see in a minute when I'm referring to that. Um, so here I'm going to instantiate the object, um, and then I'll subscribe to the event right here, flight arrive, and then I'll land a few planes, and you'll see that flight arrive will be firing and everything else. Um, so you'll see that in a minute. Let me show you one more um, sample just so, um, so we can walk through a couple. Here's a generic type that we showed. Here's a group stack. You'll see the type of T. Um, all that group stack does is um, it kind of stops items in groups. So, for example, have, if I have a group st uh, stack that goes by, you know, three items at a time, whenever I push or pop something, I can push one individually because I didn't write that functionality. But when I pop something, I kind of want to pop, you know, two or three items at a time, whatever the n, um, whatever number is for for we're looking at. And you'll see here, here's the partial class again, um, and I just called the conveniences, um, and then I just added um, implementation of, of that stack. So I added a generic stack, and then I can, you know, do pushing stuff and taking uh, stuff out of the stack. Um, and just for constants, I, I actually wrote uh, the type before I had generic, so you'll see functionality right here. So I have array object, and I can create an instance and then push objects into it. This is boxing and unboxing everything. Um, I have to get value and you know do all the right things to be able to access. So this is kind of um, without generics what the code would look like. 
Um, and then here I have, you know, an implementation using generic, so you can kind of see a little bit of functionality. Looks much cleaner with um, generics. Yeah, it's much easier to read, and it's perform more performant, and it's actually, um, you know, stronger types, so um, it gives you better um, d d design time and compile time support. Mm -hmm. um, so all of this you'll see. Um, earlier on my second session today, I had problems with the debugger, um, so I'm going to try now to show you the debugger um, that I didn't show you earlier, and, and so that's why I put some breakpoints here. Um, the last thing that I had that I, um, I want to show you before I show you that is um, right here. First of all, you know, this is now the design time. So earlier, um, again, we had problems with design time. You're going to see the sample design time a lot. Um, so here I have just one page that has one button and it calls on to all of these. Um, you'll see right here, here's the page. Um, and you'll see right here, there's just buttons and they're all calling the same uh, method called show sample. Um, and you'll see in show sample how all of those, um, they, you know, the partial classes come together. So um, here, I have show sample, and depending on what parameters passed in for method, I'm just calling on the samples, which is the class, and I'm calling the right method. All of these are, um, you know, methods in the class that's coming together as a partial class. Um, so I can put a breakpoint there and, and be okay. Um, so, um, so that's kind of where we're at. So let's go ahead and debug it. Um, I want to, let me do it on the simulator so that we can see the output window here. Um, so let's go back here. And fingers crossed now that our problem is gone. Excellent. We've done a few things. I uh, will change a little bit of our configuration, so hopefully it will be fine. Um, and you can see here, actually, um, so I have, um, well, let's just, you see our window right here is not very pretty. Um, and, you know, I see all the buttons that I can call. I said some breakpoints earlier. Um, so let's go ahead and show you the DeBi experience. I can come back here. Um, and let's just click on event handlers. And you see here, um, I hit the breakpoint. Um, so the, you know, debugger, this is what our debugger looks like. And again, we didn't show it earlier, earlier so I'll show it right here. Um, the debugger will have um, right here um, many different tabs. So I have my autos, which is the things that are being used. Um, so this is automatically created by you. All of these tabs you can remove, by the way. So if you decide, hey, I don't want to ever use these tabs, like I never use autos, you can remove it. Um, just close it right here, and you can go away. Um, I have a local tab, which gives you all the local variables. This is kind of um, um, in LLVM for me, the equivalent of doing a frame variables. Mm -hmm. uh, where I see everything that's there uh, in the local code, uh, scope. Uh, and then I have this watch window where I can drag items, type any, you know, anything I want to evaluate. So for example, right here, um, I can just drag this button and I can either drag it from here, just bring it there, or I can type. Um, I can evaluate something against the button. So I can say b.content and see what its content property is. Um, and you see that it's evaluating all those things. So this is my watch window. I can have many of these, so I can have up to four watch windows on the debugger. Um, so you can create two or three, depending on what method. I tend to do it where, when I'm debugging something complex, I might have two different watch windows, one for you know, kind of different scopes in the, uh, in the method. Um, here's my call stack. Um, so you can see here, we just click on the show sample. Um, you see all my breakpoint windows here. Um, I have a command window where I can tag to Visual Studio. So command is where I kind of tag to Visual Studio. So for example, here, I can say help, um, I don't know, page. Um, and it's going to launch the help file okay. um, and show page so you can navigate. And from here, I could run a batch file or a build command or anything that I wanted to. Um, so um, You can so also I, use the command line debugger here too, right? Um, or well, or like interface with the debugger from here. Yeah, but well, so the interface from the debugger is actually in this immediate window. It's slightly different. So command window is talking to Visual Studio. Immediate window, I can interface with, with the debugger here. Okay, uh, so the immediate window here would be like the equivalent of uh, the LLDB window in Xcode or something like that. Well, I right. think they're all, like our watch windows are also the equivalent of that. Where well, I, I just mean the watches. console where we yeah, can type. Yeah, console is there. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Uh, and so for example, here on the immediate window, I can say, you see right here, I got b.content equals event handler. Um, I can just go here and type a method or a count this property and say v.config equals Eric. Um, and that's actually updating it right now. It updated the UI and it's updating this property. All of it propagates so I can interact right. with my code, evaluate. I can say v equals no, right? And it's going to say false. I can you know do any kind mm -hmm. of evaluation as I go. Um, and here I have my output window. So here is where I see my login because we have debug login on this. So um, I'll just press F5 to continue. Um, and I'm going to um, interrupt you again one more yep. time. There's the other questions popping up. Uh, but as far as like dependency injection frameworks and uh, entertainment libraries go, or not entertainment, like uh, MVVM libraries, uh, we're going to talk about that later in a coming session. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, we don't have IOCs out of the box, but there's plenty of libraries and there's plenty of frameworks mm -hmm. that you Like Unity and MVVM Lite. Um, yep. yeah. yeah, so Castle, or, you know, all the, the typical IOC containers um, or implementations are available um, for .NET or generic stuff. Mm -hmm. So here, I'm, you know, I'm stepping on to the next. Um, I can obviously change, um, you know, set my next statement to be something else. In this case, what I want to do is I want to land a plane uh, because I wanted to show you. I mean, land the plane. I have another breakpoint um, right there in the event. Um, so I can just go back there and just, you know, continue executing here. Um, and I'm landing the plane by. So you can see here, you see my login, my, um, you know, my logins happen there where the event fire and it says AS23 has arrived. Um, I fired it. If you look at the code where we, where we use this, we subscribe to the event, fired, and then it's unsubscribed, and then fired again. So we shouldn't see another message here. 
Um, so you see um, all the examples that we talked about. You see the debugger, everything that we saw with regards to code, um, you'll be able to look through these. Um, if people want to, you know, like or people that need to know more, because everybody wants to do more, um, there's a really great book called Essential C Sharp 5.0. Uh, the problem is that it's a thousand pages. It's a very, very detailed. It's kind of like, a, you know, very much like Is a, that the O'Reilly book? Um, no, it's by um, Addison Wesley. Okay. Um, and, the, um, the O'Reilly C Sharp in a nutshell is also, it's not very yeah. nutshell, uh, but that's a good reference. Uh, there's a lot of really great references. Um, so there's a really big, thick book, thousand pages or so, covers absolutely everything. Um, I think if you walk through the sample, you'll get, and then we also have really great documentation for the language and the dev center. Um, so this is kind of an in-between. Walk through the sample, get through every, you know, become familiar with it, just play with the code, with breakpoints, try to run, you know, write your own person object, write your own, write your own casting, et cetera, and you'll have something to go back and forth. Um, right. Honestly, learning um, C Sharp or, you know, getting familiar with C Sharp if you're coming from the Objective C world is going to be very, very straightforward. Um, so that's it with regards to um, kind of C Sharp dive for Objective C developers. Um, everything that you're expecting from C Sharp, you will be able to have. Uh, option from Objective-C, you'll be able to find. Um, the main difference is understand the fact that we're a little bit more stronger type, so you'll have to um, deal with that a little bit. Um, and then deal with the new names, right? Delegate is an yeah. event. Uh, or a delegate is a type of block. Um, it's used for eventing. Um, it's still a very similar concept where you're implementing delegation, but it's a different term. Protocol, uh, or, you know, in, yeah, what protocol becomes an interface, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, in, you know, what's an interface by default right. becomes class. So it's just right. understanding the terms. That, that's probably the biggest hang-up a lot of people have is getting caught up on the terminology. But if they just watch this talk, read those slides, uh, everything should be okay. Yep. And I, I should add here, so for example, here, uh, our intelligence is very, very straightforward. So here, right. you see I do samples. Dot. This is a partial class, but I can go back and forth anywhere here um, and, you know, see all my classes there. If I'm looking for a different type, something we haven't used, um, again, I showed it this earlier, I can say button B, and then I can go find every single property. Um, I can right-click here. Um, and for example, um, you know, again, go to the definition. I can pick the definition while here, so I don't have to navigate away. Um, so all of that is available for uh, for users there. Um, so you'll be able to go back here, navigate across the class uh, because this button has very little functionality. So I can go to button base um, and see all the functionality there. Um, so again, nothing too hard with regards to learning Objective C. Right. Um, if you come from Objective C, another option is C++. C++. Um, we have C++ EX, and you'll be able to write Windows Store apps. Um, the language there is a little bit, um, we have extensions on top of C++, so it's C++ as you know it, and then we have a few extensions that we use for ARC, uh, for the reference counting, so it will be pretty straightforward. Uh, for this class, we chose Objective-C because, again, we see a lot of people navigating towards... I would certainly say, uh, or starting in C-sharp uh, with XAML for writing uh, Windows Store applications, you're going to have a much easier time than uh, starting with C++. Yeah, exactly. Especially coming from a language like Objective-C, which gives you all sorts of nice things. Yep. So. Um, so that's it. I don't know if you have any questions open, Eric. Um, I, th I think the only one outstanding is uh, persistent storage, and we are going to briefly cover that uh, in one of the upcoming sessions. Yep. Uh, that's going to be the app model. Um, I'm actually going to be giving that talk. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about the storage types and what you can do in Windows to basically uh, store user data, store user preferences. And then I'll mention as there's a SQL Lite, uh, but we're not going to go too far into detail on that. Yep. Um, so great, so let's give them a 10 minute break uh, mm -hmm. and then we will come back next with asynchronous uh, and some of the networking APIs. So see right. you in 10 minutes. Hello, we're back. Uh, I'm not Eric Jeffers again, uh, for which he is profoundly grateful. Uh, I'm Sean McCune. And I'm going to talk about uh, asynchronous programming in C Sharp on Windows Runtime. Windows Runtime is an asynchronous uh, runtime for all intents and purposes. Any operation that was uh, greater than 50 milliseconds was essentially made asynchronous. And uh, C Sharp has several features that allow you to have a very easy way to both write and, more importantly, read and understand asynchronous code using the async and await keywords. And like most platforms, uh, most UI platforms, you can only update the UI from the main thread. And so if you're doing something in another thread asynchronously and you need to update the UI based on uh, the results of that processing, you need to do something to, to cause that UI updating code to happen on the main thread. And, and when we say, just to make sure, we, um, when we say that anything that takes 50 milliseconds or more, um, to clarify what we've done is the people that designed the language said, oh, look, there are these operations that might take 50 milliseconds. There's no magic underneath where we look at something and we're like, oh, this is taking long, let's make it asynchronous or something. Right, not on the fly. What we did is the, you know, the runtime designers said, look, 
all the operations that could take 50 milliseconds or, long, or longer, even if they don't, we will just write asynchronous API for. Um, so for example, if you look at uh, our file APIs where we are you know, opening a file or reading and writing to a file, those are asynchronous by design. Right, so what you're gonna see is you open up the API, the, the framework, and you're gonna be like, oh, how do I save a file? And you're only gonna have a save async method. You're not gonna have an as a save method. Uh, but again, with what you're gonna explain in a minute where we talk about await and async, um, we make it pretty easy for people to consume um, asynchronous operations. So um, so it's not gonna be a lot of overhead, but that's just kind of what, what we've designed for. Right. So. so let's take one second and review how Coco handles uh, asynchronous code. So as we say at the ranch, uh, Coco got blocks. Uh, Bing it if you're interested. But uh, blocks are, are lambdas, essentially, anonymous functions uh, that, uh, that Coco has. And uh, GCD has queues, uh, asynchronous uh, uh, dispatch queues that run code asynchronously. You can run them both uh, serially or concurrently asynchronously. And as with Windows 8 and every other platform with the UI, you have to uh, update the UI on the main thread. And with GCD, there's a main queue that you can queue blocks uh, to run on the main thread. So let's take a look at one of the ways that's most similar to Coco uh, to do asynchronous code in Windows 8. So here's a method that uh, is using the HTTP client object and it's going to do an HTTP get request to download Bing's homepage. And we're going to call get async on the HTTP client object which is going to run code asynchronously, going to run code in another thread to actually perform that get request. But it, since it's happening asynchronously, this code will not block here in, in, in the calling thread. Get async will return very quickly and will return a task object that uh, represents that code that's running asynchronously. And we immediately then call the task object's continue with method and pass in a lambda, uh, an anonymous function, that we want to run when the task is completed, when the actual HTTP get request is completed. And this lambda gets passed in a, an HTTP response message object that uh, here we're calling response uh, that contains the results. And, and then we can do whatever processing we need to do with it. This, this lambda that we're passing in to the continue with method is known as a completion because it's the code that we want to run when the asynchronous task has completed. And note that the lambda here contains another asynchronous piece of code. It's going to get the take the response object, get its result, and get its contents, which are the actual HTTP uh, message contents from the response. And we're going to call read as string async on it, which is going to read the, the actual contents of the downloaded response into a string. And that's just doing that asynchronously because it may be a lot of contents. Uh, it's going to return a task just like get async does. And we will immediately return continue with, or call continue with on that task object. Uh, to pass in the code that we want to run when we're done reading in the next string. And in this case, this uh, lambda that we're passing in to continue with just gets uh, a string object, or sorry, a, a task object that uh, contains the, the text result, which we simply are writing out to the debug console. So notice here we're actually chaining multiple snippets of asynchronous code to run one after the other. We have the initial get async, which runs code in a task to do the download. After it's complete, we run the very first continue with lambda, which immediately calls another async piece of code, which will run asynchronously. And when it completes, we run the fourth snippet of asynchronous code, which is the, the continue with lambda, uh, the innermost continue with lambda. And the, the, the interesting thing is, look, these continuations are very simple, but when this is real code, things get a little bit messier. It's right. much harder to read. That's kind of the point to make here. Right, yeah. This, this, is, this is very similar to Coco's blocks because we're passing the lambda, and, and a block is, they're yep. both closures. And in real world code, you could have a lot of code here, yep. you know, and you should probably wrap some of it up in a, in a method so that uh, it doesn't all have to be in line. But it, it can get uh, rather verbose and crowded in there uh, with lots of indents and lots of punctuation, lots of curly braces followed by parentheses, followed by semicolons. So it, it can get harder to read in the real world. Uh, so let's take a look at the way C Sharp supports doing asynchronous programming with the async await feature. So we're going to do the same operation, only this time we're going to use async await. And notice that in this code, we have an async uh, keyword in the signature of the method. That denotes that to the compiler that this method uh, can run some code asynchronously. And we're still going to be using the HTTP client object and calling get async on it. But in front of the call to get async, we use the await keyword. And when client.getAsync 
creates the task that it's going to run asynchronously, it returns that task object, but this time it's returning it to that await keyword. And in the calling thread, that await is going to immediately return to the caller of, of this method. So it doesn't block, just like before. However, when the task that get async is running, that's downloading the home page of Bing, when it's completed, the await then runs all the code that follows the await from the, uh, the var result, getting the results of the await operation, all the way down to the end of the method. And that code is known as the continuation. That's what continues, that's what will run after we have awaited the completion of the get async operation. But notice that it allows you to write this code in what looks like straight down the screen procedural code, line after line, you know, gets executed. It, it doesn't because the compiler generates code to implement a state machine that takes the, the pieces of this method and runs them whenever the various asynchronous bits complete. So again, when get async finishes its download, the continuation that's been awaiting its completion will, will, will run because of the state machine. And notice that the very next thing we do is we hit another await statement, just like before, we read the contents in asynchronously, and so we're going to await that result, and there's a second continuation there, which is the string text variable getting assigned, and then the rest of the code. So again, we have chained serial, or chained synchronous operations that are going to be executed serially, and it's very similar to queuing up multiple blocks on, the, uh, on a serial queue in GCD. The only difference is we don't have to have a queue object, and we can simply write code that looks procedural, you know, straight down the line. So it's, it's a very easy, compact way to write the code. It's very easy to understand once you realize that that await keyword lets you return to the caller automatically, but there's the state machine in the background that takes the continuation that comes after the await and will run that as soon as the asynchronous task is completed. So I'm going to demo that code to give you a better idea of, of how that runs. I'll set some breakpoints so you can see when the actual code runs. So we'll take a look at these exact same code, the exact same code you saw in the uh, slides. So here's the async keyword method. I have a breakpoint that I've set right after the, uh, the second await so that all of this code that you see here should finish, all this asynchronous code, getting Bing's homepage and reading it into a string. That should all complete asynchronously before we hit this debug line breakpoint. That means that we would have returned already to the caller of this method long before we hit this breakpoint. And then we also have the, I'm going the wrong way here, and we also have, wow, this is strange, the, the completion method where we pass in the lambda, I have the same thing, I passed in or I had set a breakpoint right in the uh, lambda that gets sent into the second uh, read as string async call. Again, this will only hit after we've done all the asynchronous operations. And so by then, you know, we would have uh, returned to the caller. And if I go down to the code that actually calls these two methods, this is a method that uh, gets called in response to clicking on the button in the UI, and you'll see that in a moment. And we're just going to run both of these methods. And I have breakpoints set at these debug write lines right after each of these methods. We should see these happen first, because we're going to call this first, the async keyword method, and as soon as we hit the await in there, we will immediately return and hit this breakpoint, because we will not block there, because the rest of the code runs asynchronously. And then we'll immediately run the second asynchronous method, the download file using completion, and as soon as we hit the continue with method that we call there, we'll be done, we'll return from that method while the asynchronous code has yet to run, and we will hit this breakpoint. So both these breakpoints will occur before the breakpoints in the asynchronous code to prove that you know, we are actually running asynchronously. So here is the, uh, I'm, actually that's running from before, so I'm going to start it back up from scratch. There we go. Okay, so up at the upper left hand part of the screen, you can see this button that says async keyword in it. I'm going to click it, and the first breakpoint we hit is this one because we've executed the download file using async keyword and it does not block. We did not hit breakpoints in the asynchronous code yet. I'm going to continue. We blew right through the download file using completion method, did not block, and we hit this breakpoint. 
And now, eventually, the this uh, asynchronous code has completed. We hit its breakpoint. This is in the uh, using completion method. Notice that it happened first. It completed first, even though it was called after the async keyword method. And continue on. And then we hit the breakpoint from the download file using async keyword. So these continuations are running asynchronously after the asynchronous calls to get the uh, home page of Bing and to read in the contents asynchronously has completed. Yep. So I'll switch back and continue on. Now here's an example of that state machine. This is generated code uh, from the compiler based on that, uh, that method that uses the async and await mechanism. There's a, a tool from JetBrains called .peak that essentially is a decompiler. And so it decompiled the actual running code. And you can see the state machine that the compiler generates. It creates a uh, structure called, well, d underscore underscore zero. This is not very human readable because it's generated code. But it's, it creates a structure for the download file using async keyword method. And it inherits from an I, I async state machine interface. And it has a, a method that basically has lifted bits and pieces out of the method that we wrote and put them inside a state machine that it can run to run these things asynchronously. And so you, dot .peak is a free tool. You can download it and uh, run it on the uh, example that you just saw and dig more into the state machine. But it's not very human readable. Uh, but it's an it's a interesting tool to you know, take a look at and, and see what's going on under the hood. Yep. This is not something users will ever need to see. Right. So that's, yeah. we're we just showing you what's under the hood so you know how it's implemented. Right. This um, is if you're, if you're interested in, in seeing exactly how uh, the async await mechanism is actually running these things asynchronously and, and serially stringing these asynchronous snippets together. Yep. So if you notice, if I back up here, at the very bottom of this method, there's a method called swap button text async, which sounds like it's going to swap the UI uh, text in the, uh, in the button on the screen. And if that's UI code and it's running in this continuation, we know that we can't just update the UI from within this continuation because it's running in another thread. So let's take a look at how we do that. So here is that method. And it is asynchronous. So we're going to run something in another thread. You can probably guess that we're going to run something on the main UI thread so that we can update the UI. So immediately what we're going to do is we're going to await something. And we're going to await a task that's going to run the UI code asynchronously. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the this object, which is the object that this method lives in, which is presumably a page object. And you'll be seeing more of the page object when we get into the XAML code in a, in a later section. But it's, it's a UI object. It's a page that defines what you see on the screen. And we access its dispatcher property. And the dispatcher is the thing that is responsible for running uh, Windows events and processing them for the UI. So if we're getting that object, we're going to be getting something that, that runs on the main thread. And we're going to call run async on it to hand it a lambda so that it can run it on the main thread. Now, the, the dispatcher has a priority. Um, I've never used anything other than normal. Uh, and then we pass in a dispatched handler containing the lambda of the UI code that we want to uh, have update the UI. And it's simply, it's simply going to swap the text of the button between two values simply for demonstration purposes so that you can see the slide. It's not anything real. So that's how you would uh, run a lambda on the main thread to update your UI. For the sake of completeness, here's that, that code that the button click calls. You know, so you can see that calling these asynchronous methods that we created are nothing special. You just call them as normal. And you just have to remember that these methods don't block. They're going to return immediately, while the asynchronous code that has been set up is probably not yet even started, much less completed yet. So a few notes about async methods. Uh, you cannot have ref or out parameters in your async methods because uh, we have to pass everything in by value because they're going to be running in another thread. And we can't have things being done to them uh, you know, between tasks. They have to have return types uh, of either void, task, or task of type t. Result, it's a result type. The reason is the, the caller uh, is going to be returned a value by that await statement. And if the type is void, obviously there's no value being returned by the, the await statement. And that's for a kind of fire and forget asynchronous operation. The caller simply wants to kick off the asynchronous operation and doesn't care about it, doesn't want to know when it's done, or, or if there's any result value, it's just going to start it off and, and let it go. So that's, that's a void return type. But the caller may want to know when the task is completed. And so you can return a task 
as the return type of your async code. And the await will see that, and when it returns to the calling routine, it will return the task that the statement that it's awaiting, such as that HTTP client's get async method, returns to it. And it can use that task to interrogate um, to find out when it's completed or not. It can also return a, a task of result type T. So if you're doing an operation that has a, uh, a result value, it's doing some calculation and it's going to come up with a, a number, or it's going to come up with some more complex object that is a result of whatever it's been doing, that can be the result type uh, and a result value that's set in the task. And the caller may want to not only know when the task is complete, but might want to find out what that value is and, and do something with it. So you can return a result of, of task of type T, and the, uh, the await statement will return that, and uh, so you can uh, make use of the result. Finally, lambdas and anonymous methods can be asynchronous, so you don't have to, uh, you know, just create methods that are asynchronous. You can on the fly create a, you know, snippet of code, whether it's a lambda or anonymous function, and make it async simply by putting the async in the uh, in the method a signature, basically where you where you have any uh, where you have the, the parentheses, you know, af after the arrow operator, and uh, you can also then use the await inside the body of the, of the lambda. Now, in the operations that you saw before, the, the asynchronous operation being performed in another task was being handled by a Windows runtime API call, such as HTTP clients get async method. But you may have your own long-running operations that you want to be able to call asynchronously. And so here's how you would do that. So I'm assuming here that we have a plain old synchronous calculate Fibonacci method that's going to calculate you know, a Fibonacci value, which can take a long time for large values. So we want to be able to call it asynchronously. So we created a, an asynchronous version of the method by tacking on the word async at the end of the method name, but more importantly, using the async keyword at the beginning. And we give it a result type of task of type int64 because we want the caller to be able to see the result when the task is done. And the way we run it asynchronously is we wrap the, we actually send that, uh, the calculate Fibonacci call into task.run and we await its, uh, its return. So we don't have to uh, just use Windows API calls that are asynchronous. We can create our own. Here's a little bit more about the tasks. Task objects can run tasks asynchronously, and you don't have to use them with the async await method. You can simply pass in a lambda and into a new task and start it, and it will run asynchronously. But uh, it's a lot more convenient when using the async await operation because you can use it to essentially queue up serial bits of uh, asynchronous code, just like queuing up blocks on a serial dispatch queue in Cocoa. So that's it for async, and I'm going to move quickly into web services because uh, you've already seen a bit of that in the async code. So web services are basically using the HTTP client object that you saw before, and you can call get async on it, you can await that to get the response asynchronously, and it returns an HTTP response message object. Um, there's an ensure success status code method that will essentially throw an exception anytime the result code of, of an HTTP uh, request is not in the 200 range, 200 to 299. And then, of course, you can read the contents asynchronously. However, there's a little more to it than that. There are several methods uh, that basically implement the HTTP get requests, uh, delete requests, post requests, and put requests. And you can pass in a URI either as a URI object or as a string. And for the post and puts, you can also pass in an HTTP content object that contains the contents that you want to pose or put. And there's also a send async method that lets you construct an HTTP request message separately of whatever type you want and then pass it into the send async method to, to have the request executed. And all of these methods return a task of type HTTP response message. There are a few alternative get request methods. Uh, you can get your results as a byte array, as a string array, or as a stream, and you can stream the results in. And any time you're going to be doing uh, get requests where the download, uh, downloaded response might be 50 megabytes or larger, you probably want to use get stream async because that will give you much better performance than using the default buffering of the, uh, the other get methods. Finally, there's another web request object, HTTP web request which uh, lets you create any kind of HTTP verb, not only get and put and post and delete, but also option, trace, and head. 
And you can set the method directly. You can set the headers, both standard headers and custom headers. And you can stream in the contents that you want to post or put, and then stream out the results uh, from the response. And so I'm very early, so I hope there's some questions. I mean, let me check that. Ah, this has to log in. Um, I can check. There wasn't that many. Um, it's a, you know, there's a couple of comments on async in a way it looks really clean. Um, it, there's a comment on are the continuations run on the main thread? So, and generally, no, uh, because the main thread, I mean, I guess technically, I mean, it, it could queue, so I mean, it could run something asynchronously on the main thread and it, be handled in the loop, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, async, the continuations will come back to the thread that called it. Mm -hmm. So when we call, like, for example, in this case, you were calling, uh, like, if you call the get async from the UI thread, um, the whole, the HTTP get is going to happen in a background thread, comes out of the thread pool, but then when it returns back, yes, we will move you back to the UI thread. Mm -hmm. So okay. you, it will just come down to the, to the calling thread, um, which are things we're going anyway. Right. And then... Uh, and then, of course, from within that continuation, even if it's running on the main thread, uh, if you do another asynchronous operation, of course, that asynchronous operation will run in another thread, and then its continuation would, would come back to whatever its calling thread was. So it depend, depends what thread you start out on. When you, when you call an asynchronous method, that's where the continuation will run. Yep. Um, so that's the one question that's about async await. Um, there's, a, there's a couple in there um, about uh, which somebody was asking, um, debugging uh, to service RT devices via USB. Um, when using VMware, um, and I now understand the question better because I didn't quite understand it earlier, because um, they're just looking at how to debug. Um, my answer there was if you're going to debug against a, rem a service RT, use the remote debugger using network like TCP IP APIs. It's much easier, much cleaner, much more, much more performant. Um, I don't specifically know if we support it out of a USB, like connected via USB. I thought the answer was no, but I've never done it, so I don't want to say no. Um, oh. So JPM, let's think offline, but if you want to debug, like what I said earlier was um, if you want to debug on the service RT devices running on ARM, then um, you can use remote debugger using networking um, like TCP IP, and it works great. It's pretty seamless. Yeah, the remote uh, debugging for the RT over Wi-Fi is really handy because yep. you know the, the Surface RT is a portable device, and you can sit there in front of your development machine and hold the, the Surface and do your thing with the UI and watch the debugger, and it, it is very handy using it over uh, Wi-Fi. Yep. Um, and then there's one more comment there um, that um, has been there for a while. And um, can I develop iOS applications using Visual Studio 2012? Um, so no, we're all, all we're talking about here is building Windows Store apps. So um, you can definitely develop Windows Store apps from within your Mac OS, you know, using Bootcamp for virtualization again. But we're talking about building Windows Store apps. Um, Apple has this policy where they don't let anybody build iPhone apps outside of Mac anyway, outside of their Apple Mac OS environment anyway. Um, like Xamarin has to even compile in their environment anyway. Um, so that's it. You you don't get Visual Studio um, <laughs> for developing iPhone apps yet. So um, those are the two questions that we had. So if we don't have any more questions, uh, we can give them um, what we call the meal break here. Um, so we're going to come back at the top of the hour. Right now I have 12-12. So that means we'll have 48, 45 to 48 minutes. And then we're going to come back. And in the afternoon, we're going to cover SAMU. We're going to cover all the app model. And then we're going to cover contracts and notifications real quick and the store. So we have a pretty packed afternoon. Is there any way to give them a half an hour break instead of a 45 minute break? So, all right, we'll go live, top of the hour, one o'clock, and then we're going to go 60 miles per hour. <laughs> all right, thanks for sticking around. We'll see you soon. Welcome back. This is our second half of our MBA Windows Store for iOS developers all day session. And we have Eric back on stage with yes. us. Um, and we're going to spend the next hour talking about UI presentation and SAML. Um, and I have to preface this with the fact that um, teaching SAML, how, how many days do you guys teach SAML in the course? I think it takes us probably about two days. Two days from yeah, the five-day course? Yeah, probably a day and a half. Yep. And so, then XAML uh, still makes its way sprinkled into everything else. Yep. So, so um, I have one hour. There's no way I can teach you XAML. My goal for today is actually to just give you a good introduction so you know where to go. And the good news is that we cheated. And last Friday, in, here in the Microsoft Virtual Academy, we presented an all-day XAML training. Um, I know the videos are not online now. So if you're watching this live, the videos are not um, available yet. But I know that in probably in the next three to five days, all those videos, a whole day of XAML, introducing every concept that I'm going to talk about here for about an hour uh, will be available. Here, I'm going to spend five minutes. 
last Friday we probably spent 45 minutes to an hour. So, um, so all I can say is um, I just want to point you there and give you some context. And but I do want to give you an overview and kind of map the similarities and differences between SAML and um, you know what you get out of Xcode. Uh, at the end of this, you probably won't know or feel super comfortable using XAML, uh, but you'll know enough to know what you need to learn in order to be XAML proficient. Yep. And you'll be impressed. You'll be like, yeah. XAML's cool. <laughs> um, so just very basic introduction. XAML is nothing but XML. Um, so it's just an XML representation for serializing and initializing objects. Again, I compare it to SIB, um, where if, I, if you open a SIB, you see that all you have is a serialization of um, what a control or any kind of um, UI object would look like. Um, in, it has a hierarchy. SAML is very expressive. Um, I have this little snippet right here. Um, and just for context, in just these few lines of code, I, I can tell you some of the things that we're expressing. For example, um, we have the concept of containment, like, hey, who's my, you know, kind of there's a hierarchy here. There's a visual hierarchy here about a page with a grid inside of it, with a button inside of it. Um, so there's a little bit of a visual hierarchy going. Um, we also have styles we're going to touch on. Styles is what we use to customize the look and feel of our user interface. Um, I always kind of um, try to recruit them to the equivalent of UI appearances. Um, if you're familiar with CSS styles, um, the cascading style sheets, that's the concept that we have. Um, so if you're familiar with that, this will be, this will feel right at home. Right. And coming from iOS, you'll quickly learn to appreciate styles and how much easier they can make your life. Yep, exactly. Um, and then we have controls. Uh, and for example, here we have a button, a control. We have an outlet, which is this X name. So we are expressing the exact same things that you're looking at. Um, we use data binding a lot in our SAML world, in the .NET world. This is an optional thing. I'm not telling you that data binding is the only way to go, but I will give you a little bit of an intro and tell you a little bit of what we have. Um, and then, of course, um, within the SAML, we embed a lot of layout constraints. Uh, and mm -hmm. as you'll learn today, our layouts are a lot more dynamic. So, um, so we tend to focus a little bit more on layout than what you traditionally get, get out of Xcode. And, and that's to account for uh, the many different varieties of screen sizes and form factors that you have on Windows devices. Yep. Yeah, Windows runs on everything. <laughs> exactly. so, uh, so you're going to have a balance there. Um, and then the last thing I do want to mention a little bit is uh, everything that I'm going to show you is toolable. So SAML is very toolable. I'm going to spend a little bit of time in Visual Studio. I'm going to type a lot of it by hand because I wanted you to kind of see it and learn it as we go. Uh, but everything can also be done in, done in Blend, which I'm going to open the tool and walk you through dragging and dropping a few elements and creating hierarchies and everything else. So um, um, everything that you can do here should be able to be, to, you should be able to do from within Blend or from within Visual Studio by dragging and dropping objects. Um, and then the last thing is um, everything you can do in SAML, again, because it's nothing but initialization and serialization of objects, anything you can do in SAML, you will be able to do from code. Um, that said, I definitely tell people that I always tell me from iOS, because iOS people, some of them, they like to just use code and avoid using X code or SIBs or um, storyboards, et cetera. Um, you will be fighting pretty heavily right. against the current if you try to do everything um, in code. You're just you know, very much like Xcode, um, where you end up writing a lot of code for things that would probably not be too hard to do uh, with a designer. In with SAML, that compounds a little bit more because, again, we have layout bindings and other features that, that you want to take advantage of. And I think a big reason for that is uh, zibs. Uh, that while they are kind of human editable and readable in their XML format, it's not really done that often and you're not really supposed to. Interface Builder is your view into the zib. Uh, whereas XAML, it's, you can easily go in and edit it by hand if you need to uh, or rely on the tools in order to generate it for you. Yep. Um, but it is very much more human readable uh, and, yeah, writable too. Yep. So let's start. I'm going to give you a cool, uh, it's a really simple demo just so that I get I think, everything going because we had a problem in the first session, so um, we didn't get you know, enough XAML out of the way. Um, and um, finger crossed now that the project, the problem there is going away. Um, and I'm just going to give you a very basic kind of demo for dragging and dropping objects so you get an idea of the relations between UI and SAML. And yeah, this time it works. So um, fingers crossed, knock on wood, um, every possible um, blessing that I could have, please you know, keep an eye on it because I'll be nervous for the next hour. Um, so this is our Visual Studio. This is our design surface, very much like Xcode, where you can go in there and drag and drop objects. We can do the same thing. So for example, here, um, let's say I was just going to drag a button. Um, I can just drag and drop from here, um, and then I can resize it. I can you know, change foreground. I can change um, you know, anything in here, change the text size, change foreground. Everything that you would expect out of a designer, you'll be able to do here. So here, let's make that a red button. Uh, and then let's, for example, go down further and change the text to be um, a different size. So I can just go back here and make the font a lot bigger. Um, so I'm just giving you this um, because I drag and drop. Now, let me show you how we usually work. Um, you'll drag and drop if you want to use the designer. Um, and then we have different modes here. So for example, right now, I'm kind of using what we call the split view. Um, and it's actually showing me the SAML on top and, oh, I'm sorry, the designer on top and SAML at the bottom right here. And you see kind of what it generated, right? So um, it added a button and it added horizontal alignments and margins. Um, some of these things I can later on decide to edit by hand. Um, something that we do a lot in the SAML world is we edit things by hand. Um, so these are all the elements that it added, um, you know, through the designer. If I, for example, want to change this margin, we tend to come here and say, oh, that was supposed to be 300. 
um, or this was supposed to be 50, um, we tend to come in and edit it by hand. Um, we get really great IntelliSense, so our SAML is just one file. It's not like a story where we have a lot of them, so with regards mm -hmm. to source control, um, it's XML, so we have really great tools for differentiating um, or you know, diffing the, the two files whenever you're checking something in, et cetera. We do good about merging. Um, so developers tend to come in and edit these a lot. So if I, for example, wanted to add a checkbox, um, I'll just come back here and start typing, and you'll see good IntelliSense checkbox. You know, we're looking for the content property, and I just type, you know, something like test, um, and I can continue in there. So, for example, check or is check. Check is the event handler. If I just type check equals something, um, it's going to automatically say, hey, you want to create a new event handler? I just click there and let it generate for me, which will generate the code behind and everything for me. Um, so this is very common for us to go in there and edit SAML by hand. Um, so, for example, right here. Um, if I go to the code behind page, which you're going to see more as we go, um, this will give you, um, you'll see right there, the event handler. This is the event that will fire whenever that checkbox is checked. Um, we're not going to use that, so I can go back and delete it. But I'm just giving you an intro because I felt like earlier we had a problem where this demo was going to happen in the earlier session. Um, so that's what time is, is the serialization of those objects. Um, let me tell you what other things that you serialize so we can kind of get a full view, a full view into what we're doing. Um, Obviously, we're dealing with UI, so uh, everything that we will have are controls, very similar, same term that you use um, in iOS. Um, we have controls, and they're reusable units for presentations. Um, and to me, controls are kind of a combination of a UI, um, kind of a look and feel, and then the behavior, right? For example, a button is there to be clicked, the checkbox is there to be checked, um, sliders have values that you drag and drop, and, and I think these are, these are a lot of value with regards to familiarity with the OS. Um, right. We have a lot of controls that have very specific, at the end of this session, I'll talk about the Windows controls, kind of the personality as I call it, and you'll see that certain controls have gestures that users will get to expect. Uh, for example, our lead view with selection and with the dragging and the panning and all these things, and you'll want to leverage the, the controls just so that you get all of that functionality for free. Um, we have a content model. I'm going to explain real quick the content model before I give you the controls so, so that you can kind of think about it as we go. Um, and when we think about SAML, we think about um, two types of control. One of them is called a content control. Um, and this is a control that can have one piece of content inside of it. Now, our controls are very flexible. For example, a button can have text or uh, image or you know anything inside of it. Literally, you'll see later as we go through demos, I'll be able to go in and do the button and add anything I want to. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a content control. The only restriction it has it can have one item, one content item. But you're going to hear me talk about grids and panels. And what you do there is you insert a grid, and then that grid inside of it, the one little you know, item that you answer inside of it can have 10 more items. Um, so there's no restriction here, but you do have to think about the difference between a content control and an items control. An items control is what we use when we have a list, and we have lots and lots of lists. Um, you know, rather than having like UI till view and collection view, right. we have a lot more options like you know tree views, toolbars, uh, grid views, etc. So as, um, as yeah, you go we'll see them later. But uh, yeah, grid view is very much like UI collection view on iOS. Uh, table view is like the list view yep. on iOS, and, and you'll see that how that becomes obvious very soon. Yep, and those are our workhorses. Grid view and list view are the workhorses mm -hmm. of collections. So um, if you become familiar with those and the rest of the controls, you'll be fine. Um, I have screenshots here of all the other controls, uh, just so that you know you can look for the ones that you're familiar with or the ones that you're looking for. Buttons, hyperlinks, toggles, sliders, different names from what you get in iOS, but all of these maps directly to iOS. Um, you know, activity indicators and progress rings, we just have different names. Um, but functionally, they're pretty much the same. You'll, you'll be able to go back and forth very, uh, very seamlessly. Um, we have text boxes, password, bo password boxes, the one that has the little um, special characters so we don't show the text. We have multi-line text boxes. We also have rich text boxes that display RTF. Images, pop-ups, which is kind of a property sheet. Um, we will have those list boxes, combo boxes, um, you know, web views, um, daytime pickers, everything that you would expect is there. So, um, so there's no surprises there. Um, and I'm going to walk you through every single control. I think most people understand those. What I'm going to show you is a little bit of the features that we have within some of the basic controls. Um, so let's go back here to that little demo we added. Um, and I'm going to go back. And I added one button. Um, so let's do a couple things first. First of all, I'm going to change the layout here uh, from this grid to a stack panel. Uh, and you'll see here, for example, right there, I changed that grid to be a stack panel so I can stack items one next to the other. Um, and you'll see here that it automatically changed the bottom. The closing element for that button changed underneath so that I would have, um, you know, for the stack panel changed underneath. This used to be a grid, so here, you'll see here, if I change this, the bottom is changing too. So we are very optimized for editing things by hand. Right. And that's just um, IntelliSense helping you out. Yeah, right? and that's just IntelliSense helping you out. So um, I'm going to go ahead, let's actually leave that alone and let's add one stack panel so I can show you a few features. Um, and in fact, let's just remove the button. And I just want to show you a few three features with regards to styling. Um, and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to add two button. And just you know leave them pretty empty. They're in the stack panel right now. Um, if I zoom here, you should start seeing them. Um, you'll see right there that it's a very simple button. Um, they, they're not sized. We can barely read them. Um, there's just three buttons right there. 
And what I'm doing this is I'm going to introduce you to the concept of styles. Again, I mentioned that we have these styles that are like sheets, like cascading style sheets. So I'm just going to go right here to my page, which is kind of my controller for this page, the container, and I'm just going to edit the resource collection. Um, so the resources is a kind of a property bag where we will put things that we're going to reuse across yeah, across the page, things that we want to share. Um, and here I can find a style. And that resources uh, dictionary lives on each control. Yep. Um, so yeah, page every UI element can have its own resource collection. Normally, because we want to share them, we will put them at the page level and at the app level. So mm -hmm. app, you can have share resources. Um, and that's actually how we get theming. Uh, if you look at Windows, um, we will have two themes in Windows, a dark theme and light theme. And then um, you can just swap and forth, back and forth by switching the theme. You just said, you know, prefer theme equals light, and you'll go back and forth. Um, and you don't have to tweak your code. And that theme just changes the default styles that yeah. your app runs with. Exactly. Um, so here I define a style, and now this is, um, you know, in place style. So this will be, because I didn't give it a key, um, this will affect anybody that's a button in the concept of this page. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just defining a style, um, and then here, styles are nothing but setters and getters. Um, so I can say setter property equals uh, background. And that's IntelliSense knowing the yeah. properties that are available uh, because for, you've set a target type. For button, button yes. Um, and then value equals red. And what that's going to do is immediately, it's going to turn all those buttons into red. Um, so you can see here, this is a reusable style. Now I can give it a name and use it only on specific buttons, or I can go back and leave it like here by type um, and uh, you know just make it uh, something that applies to all the buttons. So here I'm just going to say with uh, value equals 200 to make them a little bit bigger. Right, and you see that it's changing. So this is the concept of styles, and this can trickle down, mm -hmm. right? They can also be inherited. So for example, right here, I have search, you know, style target type equals button. Um, if I wanted to do something special here, I can just say X key equals red button. Um, and you see that when I gave it a name, it no longer applies to all the buttons. So now I would have to go somewhere underneath here um, and actually um, give it, you know, reference that style by name. Um, and the reason I gave it a name is so that I can go here, um, and then I just say um, style, um, target type equals button, um, and here I'm just going to say based on equals static resource red button. And that static resource right. keyword is uh, um, part of the XAML extensions to XML that let you basically access things that are within your uh, within scope from a resource dictionary. Yep, definitely. So, we, so our XAML is mostly XML, and then we have these extensions, for example, extensions for uh, resource lookups, extensions for data binding. Um, so what you see here is I declare another new uh, style, this one's target type button, and it's based on that red one. And you see that now my buttons, again, are working. Mm -hmm. um, and here I can extend it. So for example, um, I can just say, again, add another setter um, and say property equals foreground uh, values equals yellow. Um, and all I'm doing here is customizing the look and feel. You see that that takes change. So that's the concept of style. Now, again, this is reusable at the page level. If I move this all the way to the app level, now I have not just modified the buttons look and feel for my whole app. Mm -hmm. um, so the concept of style is that it will drive reuse. Um, and that's a very interesting concept that you will have to, or that you can become familiar with and leverage it a lot. Again, I equate this to UI appearance, um, but in this case, we're doing it declaratively. And also on each button, uh, you can override the style that had been applied to it by setting properties manually on that yep. button. Correct. Yeah. So, um, and I'm going to show you one more thing real quick, so because this will be coming up later, and I'll show you. So I'm going to actually show you the designer tools. So I'm just going to write here something that we haven't shown is Blend so far. Um, so I'm in Visual Studio right here. I got this app 17. I'm going to click on it and say Open in Blend. Blend. Oops. Yep. Go ahead and save everything. Uh, Blend is kind of a, it's another designer that we have for user interface. This is very much optimized for designers, like the designer role, not developers. People that use Photoshop, Illustrator. Um, you can see here from the look and feel, um, the design. You know, it looks very much like something. You know, you have a palette here, like you look uh, that you have in Photoshop, and you have properties and stuff like that. You'll see as we tweak them. Um, this is very similar to what we would um, see from a main designer tool. Um, and the real difference between the things you can edit in Blend versus Visual Studio is that you can do animations and uh, keyframe animations. Yep. Uh, uh, so, out of Blend. Um, yep. And we'll probably see that later. Um, well, we'll see. Uh, we might not have enough time to see it. Uh, so, but what I have here is, so I have the exact same three buttons. I'm just showing you that I can open everything in Blend. Um, here I have my properties. I can go back and customize. For example, if I wanted to customize a button here, uh, maybe this one, I just want to override the local value for the background. I can do that. I can just click on background here um, and then go back here and just, you know, say, oh, let's make a gradient background for this button. Um, I'm not a designer, so I'm going to create really ugly stuff here um, where I'm just creating this yellow. Know, migrate into with this darker button, and now I have the foreground button is you know yellow and you can't read it. So we'll go back and swap that and make it red. So here I'm just customizing the look and feel for uh, for this button. 
as we go. Yep. Now, the reason I came into Blend is because I wanted to show you a different concept that we have inside, um, you know, in SAML that's going to make it really easy to customize. Styles are very powerful, but styles can only customize the look and feel of something that already exists. So it's only setting properties that exist on that the That are button. exposed on that object already. Yep, exactly. So here what I can do is I'm just going to click on this button, and I'm going to say edit the template, and I'm just going to say edit the copy of this template. Um, and what it's going to do is in SAML we have this concept of loopless control. So we say, look, a button has a behavior, and its behavior is click. Um, and a button also has um, you know, this look and feel. And for Windows, the look and feel is very simple. It's kind of like a rectangle. You know, like Literally, that's what it is, a rectangle with a content presenter inside of it. Um, so here, if I click here, OK, you'll see that I have kind of a template that I can go back and look at. Uh, and the idea behind this is, of course, to completely divorce the look and feel of a button with what it actually does. Yep. So literally anything could be a button. Yep. So let me go back here real quick, make sure. So I was in here, um, and I just say a template. I was just making space. Um, and I'm, yeah, that's why I'm just creating a template here. Um, and you'll see here I have my control template. I think it's up at the top left there. It's a what? If you you got to scroll to the left a little bit in that window. No, maybe. there's no. Uh, that's, I'm trying to resize the the window a little bit. So okay, so well, let's go look at it inside. In that, in that pane at the bottom there, the scroll bar. Yeah, but there's no. Oh, you're saying go. Oh, All yeah. right. Uh, yeah, there's your control template. It's that little square there. Yeah, but this is not. I was expecting to see rectangles and everything else. Let me show it to you in SAML to make sure we're on the right page, because this is looking wrong. So see how it's just adding in the template there? That looks so right. let's go back here. No, it should be a full, um, it should have the whole thing here. So let me go back here and make sure that I didn't open here. So I'll go back real quick. So I have my button here, I have my grid here. Let's just do it like this, we'll drag a button. The window is a little bit off, actually. but I still should be able to see this. So let me go back here, and I'll just drag a button. Um, and it's inherited, so it, yeah, so let me reset the style here. Because it's overriding, let me see. Yeah, so this is because I already overwrote it, so let me reverse the engineer here. Let's do it like this. New item, blank page. Because somehow I think the style that we created by hand mm. might be giving us a conflict there. Let me just click here, right click, edit template, um, edit the copy. So now this go. is what I wanted. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to show you this is the template because that one, because I started typing the style by hand, it must be conflicting with what I did there. But um, what I have here is I have the button, um, and you can see the look and feel of a button. The button is a grid. Uh, with a border inside of it and a content presenter inside of it, and then it's got two visual states for focus, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, here that's the default looking feel for a button. Um, I can go in there and change it. I can go back and say, look, let's remove the content presenter, um, and let's make this button something like a round button. So, a round button, so I can remove the grid there, um, and I can come back here and add, for example, an ellipse, right? Um, so now I'm adding an ellipse onto that grid, um, and then I'm just going to go back and add the content presenter again. Um, and I go back and make these ellipse something that um, right now the ellipse on the margin, it's got a fixed height. So I'm just going to go back and say, um, you know, set it to auto, right, so that it stretches up. And then I come back here and I say horizontal uh, alignment. And now I have a button there that would have a round button looking mm -hmm. feel. Yep. Right. So here I just redefine. This is the concept of a template, um, and I just redefine what a button looks like. That's the whole point of, um, of having a control template. Now, obviously, here, the, you know, you have, um, in this case, we have, um, you know, a white ellipse that we added. Um, so I can go back to the top right here because we added a fill. And I can just say, oh, use the default um, template binding color that you have because we added something that was white and it's conflicting. So I'm just going to bind the background of this ellipse that we added onto the background of the control. So when I add it, it becomes black again. And now, again, I have a round button. And mm -hmm. that's the concept of a control template. Right, so those are two concepts. Again, each one of these takes me an hour to explain most of the time. Yeah. You just touched um, on quite so, a few long concepts there. Yep. Binding so, control templates. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so that's kind of just giving you an idea of the things that you're able to do. Go watch the sample session because I got to move and show you a couple more concepts. Go watch the sample session and then you will see a lot of these applied. Again, mm -hmm. full one hour explaining you exactly what we did. Uh, but in case you're wondering, so for example, right here, um, we have this one button. Uh, now it's a real button right here. 
Um, I can, for example, go into the button and change their foreground to be red, and you see that the ellipse, because we connected the background of the ellipse with the background of the button, is now red. Um, so it's all working there. Um, I can also do something where you saw me earlier how we had a style and we were using the style. So I can come back here and I'll just add a new button, right? And you'll see right here when I say apply style, um, you know, apply resource, I can apply the style and then it makes it a round button again. Now this one's not red because all we did was change the red here, the background locally on this one instead of the style or the template. I can go back to this, the template and make some match styles and templates you'd made a style to create the page a branded level. button. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the concept. Let me go back so I can show you a few more um, of the things that you have to learn. But that is the concept of um, styles and control templates. Um, and now we go back here. And I want to introduce you to one more concept, um, which is the concept of panels and layout. Um, in SAML, um, one of the things that we do with regards to Windows UI is we have a myriad of devices. Um, here we have a Surface Pro that's 1920 by 1080. Uh, yeah, 1920 by 1080. These here we have things. bigger you know, monitors that we have um, higher resolution. I have my laptop. So on Windows, you will see that you have to write UI that's resized a lot. Right. Um, and for that, we have the concept of a panel. Um, and a, plan, a panel is just a very simple class whose job is to lay out um, its children. Layout means position. Right? So for example, um, you know, we'll have a panel that has a table-like layout. Um, we call it a grid. And that's just going to have table-like functionality. Um, so let me show you a couple of the panels that we have. Um, there's a lot of panels on the platform, and a lot of them are extensible. I'm only going to touch on Canvas, Stack Panel, and Grid, uh, because those are the ones that are, are across all SAML platforms. Um, and those are kind of the workhorses. After that, the other apps are more specialized, and they tend to be used for, for example, um, inside a, a grid view or something else. You're, you won't interact with them as much um, directly. You'll just take advantage of them through using some other control. Um, Canvas is very simple. This is very much like I always lay out where things are absolutely positioned. Um, so I can just say, oh, top left zero and get something there. I can say top right zero and move the button over here. So Canvas is just absolutely positioning its children. You tell it where, and there won't be anything affecting that. No matter the size available, no matter anything else, Canvas will just, you know, it's absolute position. Um, and there's also implicit Z ordering, too, uh, in that the order that they appear in the layout uh, is the order that they're rendered. So if you put two things in the same place, the first one's going to be drawn under the next one. Yep. In so, so we do have the concept of Z index. So if you want an item to be in front of another, you can set it to be a higher Z index. Mm -hmm. But by default, you're right. Like um, if you have three items in a canvas, the you know the last the one declared at the bottom of that right. SAML uh, or the one declared last is the one that can be in the front. Right. And yeah, you can always override that with an explicit yep, index. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so we also have the concept of stack panel, um, and stack panel just stacks your children um, in one direction. It can be barely called or horizontal, and it's just stacking them in that direction. It has a well-defined behavior that it does. And then the workhorse here is the grid. This is the one that has more flexibility. You can see here it's a table-like layout where I can define the rows and the columns. And here, when I define rows and columns, I can use anything I want. I can say these rows are fixed size, like they're going to be 100 pixels or you know X hundred units up, um, or um, or I can go in there and say, oh, this is a percentage. I can say, oh, look, um, we use the star very much like uh, the table layout in HTML, mm -hmm. and where we can say, look, there's so much space available. I want to take 30 percent, 70 percent, 80 percent, and this is space available after anything that's fixed height. Right. Right, and then the last thing that we have is we can have rows that are just out of size. So you can insert things and just say, oh, my row height or my column width is just out of size. So size me to whatever my content is, and, and that's how much I'm going to take. And you um, can use all three of those types in combination as yep, well. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can have elements that expand multiple rows and multiple columns. So um, you see here um, a little bit of that. Um, let me show you layout. Um, I have a little, really ugly, but um, I thought it would be useful for the code sample. Um, and by the way, what's happening here is saying, hey, the um, project for App17 has been modified externally. That's because we went into Blend, yep. and we edited the project in Blend. In fact, let's go back to Blend. I can show you this layout uh, better in Blend. Um, so um, actually, App17 was a brand new app anyway. Um, so I have a different app here. Um, this is Bind Examples. I need to open the Layout Samples. And I'm opening from Blend. So I'm going to open. Project and all these demos um, you will be able to get um, with download for the course. Um, so you'll see right here I have just one little main page um, and it has all the layouts inside of it. Um, um, layout resizing. Yep, let me zoom out. I did the wrong thing. I opened it in Visual Studio. Um, so let's go back into Blend. I actually, let's just leave it in Visual Studio. Maybe. So here what I've done is I have this little flip view control and inside of it I put all the layouts and you'll see the SAML. Um, I put layouts with different element sizes, so I can show you a few of the concepts here. Um, so let's run this demo, and I'll show you what we have. Um, so this is a grid, and it has a couple of rows. For example, right here, the first row is 100 pixels high. It's fixed. Um, same thing for the width here. Um, it's also fixed for this column. And then you'll see here I have different sizes of rows and columns. 
Um, and this rectangle, for example, is taking, um, you know, this blue rectangle is a five star, five of whatever is left over, um, same thing for the bottom. So we have different sizes columns here. And one thing that I wanted to show you is this, um, as the width resizes, you see things resize. Um, right. So that's the advantage of grid is that it's resizing its children, it's reorganized. So you could go much fancier and say, oh, I'm gonna change, you know, the layout where I no longer use a grid, I can use a stack panel or something else. But by default, just getting nice resize behavior is it's good enough. Right, and, um, and that resize behavior, it's really mostly useful uh, for when you wanna target multiple different uh, stack of devices or screen resolutions. Yep, exactly. Uh, you can make um, something that looks good on your device, and if you set up your grid right, it will scale perfectly for yep. other devices. Uh, or percentages as orientation changes. Mm -hmm. If you want to keep a percentage or something like that, this can do all of that. And what you see here is I have these sliders which are data bound onto these objects, and they're just tweaking the layout for that demo. And you see that the item resize. You see, for example, row zero is never ever resized. No matter how small uh, I make this, this that will never be shrinked. And because um, that's the one everything you else is, yep, that's the one that's fixed size. Yep, so that's kind of a basic one. Um, here I have canvas, and you'll see here at canvas, um, as I resize it, um, you see that it starts clipping, right? Because the lowest I can go is 400, and you can see at that point it's no longer visible. The, this yellow rectangle is no longer visible. Uh, so canvas is kind of the basic one. Uh, again, canvas left, top, right. And that's uh, because very, very that yellow rectangle, you assign something yep. more than 400 to its uh, top. Exactly. Um, and then here I have a stock, uh, stack panel, and here has three types of controls, a button, a slider, um, this is a functional slider and a rectangle. Um, and here you'll see, kind of does something similar to Canvas, where as you shrink enough, um, it might start clipping, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you know, but that's just kind of the behavior that it has. Now, I did it this way because I wanted to show you a couple more properties. So um, we also have the properties on margin, on padding. Uh, so for example, right here, I have this rectangle, this blue rectangle, because this affects layout too. And the, the rectangle has padding. Padding is the space between that element and the children inside of that element. Right, so if I want to have 10 pixels border across all my UI, I can just come back here. So for example, right now, these boxes are data bound to this padding text box. So if I just say 10 right there, everything got padded by 10. If I say 100, everything's getting padded by 100, all corners. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have to go that way. I can, for example, say 10 on the left and 50 on the top and you know 100 on the right and 20 on the bottom. Um, and you see that these are changing the padding. It's always left, top, right, bottom. Mm -hmm. Right, so you see that the padding and it's the space between that and its children. So that's something that you're going to want to leverage uh, as you go. And I'm using it here inside the canvas in a border, but you can use it across the board. Uh, padding, most you know, UI elements, all the controls will have a padding uh, property that you'll be able to set there. And the next property that you can also use for um, layout is margins. Uh, so you see right here, I have stack panel, um, and um, they're all next to each other because they're, they're just kind of stacked or, um, um, horizontally. So I can come back here and say, oh, I want margin. Margin is the space between an element and the element next to it, mm -hmm. right? So for example, here, same thing. I can just say the margin is 50, and you see now I have 50. Um, actually, I have 50 100. right here on the left and 100 in between these two because um, now they're both, now they both have a margin. Um, so this is kind of the concept of layout. There's a lot of you know, dynamic behaviors um, that we can do. Margins, padding, we also have alignment where we can say, oh, I'm gonna be aligned to the top left or I'm being, gonna be aligned so I can stretch. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that in the grid, all my elements were aligned and stretched so that they stretch the size of it. Um, so with that, you can combine, you can combine and mix and match as much as you want and create some really, really dynamic layouts. Um, and the interesting thing now, if you look at this demo, um, the interesting thing about that demo besides the layout and the ugly UI is this. Um, here's the main page, um, and I have the main page, and I have everything there, right? And then let me show you the code behind for that, um, and there's no code at all, right? So what I did there was all those controls were data bound, and you could see how I was binding text boxes which had properties of type thickness, et cetera, onto uh, the controls, and everything was data bound. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a concept that we also have in, you know, in, in .NET and SAML, which is we use data binding a lot. Data binding is connecting two elements together so they can be bound. Now, here I was showing you data binding from one control to another. You can also data bind from one control to uh, your business objects. And that's um, probably so the most common use case for data yeah, binding. Yeah, that's definitely uh, the most common use case. And we could spend half a day on that easily. But <laughs> for that half a day spent on binding, I would say uh, yep. watch the day of XAML that will be posted soon. Exactly. Um, let me show you one of the demos that we use on that day of XAML so you can see, again, the downloads that you have. Um, it's already right here. Somehow, oh, yeah, so it's um, already right here. Um, and I just want to show you one concept that's really interesting, and I'm not going to dive into it too much, um, but I do want to show you because coming from iOS, it's a very relevant thing. Um, so I have a sample right here. It's called Collection Samples, and it's got a collection of people. Um, so there's got persons with images and everything else. And what I want to show you here is that I didn't set up the data source, um, but I want to show you something. Earlier, I showed you a control template. I told you, oh, with a control template, you kind of define the look and feel for a control. Right. Um, and what we have here when we have items controls is we have the concept of data templates. Um, and a data template right here is, you know, I have a list view, um, and I have a data template that I'm defining here, and very much like a UI table view, you know, in UI table view, by default, you get one of those four templates that has title, subtitle, et cetera. That's right. So we can, we have the same concept, 
but we don't ship with a data template out of the box. We tell you, hey, you write your own data template, but with our data templates, you can do anything you want. Uh, so for example, right here, I have a data template that has a grid inside of it, uh, it has two columns, it has an image and text box, and it's kind of aligning these persons that we see. Um, so if I just show you this sample real quick, I just run this project, I'm gonna run it from within Blend. Um, so you can see here, uh, run it, I click on the collection sample, and you see here there's a collection of people. Um, this is from last week's demo, so we only have two pictures. Um, and you can see here, for example, um, I can have persons and the collections growing, um, so you can implement collection chain notification and everything else, and it's all data bound. There's no code fitting that other than the definition of the persons and the collection for persons that we see. And so just um, to kind of recap that, uh, if we have a, like a, a items collection, in this case that was a list view, uh, and that is bound to some source of data, in this case it was person objects, the data template is how we tell uh, the list view how to render each particular item yep. in that uh, yep. yeah in that items collection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can have many data templates. So you can have a template selector. If you have a list view and um, it's kind of got you know home or heterogeneous data, you can have different data templates and do a template selector. Um, if you like to data bind, if you want to do list view and get callbacks the way you do on table view, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. I was just showing you the concept of being able to a design time create all these objects because a design a designer can come back here and do a really great job at actually designing. Uh, so for example, right now I didn't have data context, but if I just um, and I haven't tested this code since last week, but if I just bring that code in there um, and build, oops, nope. and yeah, so um, I no longer have these objects because I copied and pasted it from the other one. Um, actually, just comment these out. So I'm trying to bring you something that has the sign time data so you see what a designer would see uh, with regards to being able to edit and you know customize the template here. Very much like the experience that we got when we did a template, um, when we did a control template, um, I can come back here and give them a design time experience that's actually useful. Um, so I'm just going to comment this. This is also that. one of the other beauties um, of So you can see here, yeah. So what I did here is um, I'm still a design time. I'm inside Blend, right? Um, and what I did here is I just enabled a design time data source. Um, so I'm inside the tool, and you can come back here and right-click on the list view and edit that template and really tweak it to where the foreground, the foreground, you know, everything's perfect. So a designer can come here and do the work. Um, you know, and get a really great, perfect look, looking um, item, which is design time data. Um, so that's the concept of data templates. Um, and I gotta move on to the next one so that we can try to get done <laughs> close to one time. Good luck. So um, we'll push it, uh, uh, I think we'll be close. So that's at the high level, most of the sample stuff. Um, and I, the way I would, you know, top tips before I move on to patterns and stuff like that, I would say, um, Number one is feel free that SAML is okay to use. You're not, um, if you're afraid of SAML, you're gonna be generating a whole lot of work for yourself. Um, SAML is okay to tie by hand. Um, so the designer, like in the morning, we have problems with our designer. Um, you know, we will have that often. Sometimes you'll be much more proficient at typing things by hand. It's okay to type by hand. We optimize our designer a lot so that these people can use that. So we go in there and trim the SAML. We have really great parts, et cetera. So you'll be okay. Um, you should definitely understand layouts. Those three that I show you are the key ones. Um, and then from there, when you get into items controls, you will get into more layouts and you'll see. Um, but those you will leverage, you don't have to touch. Um, panels are, by the way, extensible. So if you want to create your own panel, it's very, very straightforward. Again, look at the SAML training. Um, and then I'll say consider data binding. And then I have a base that Windows personality, which I'll show you the Windows controls app a little bit later. Um, so that's it. That's kind of uh, the basic, um, you know, kind of um, introduction to SAML. Now, the next thing that people always ask is, okay, well, I'm used to MVC. What do I get out of um, SAML? And how do I kind of create my MVCs? And my, you know, my theory here, or the way I talk about it here, is pretty simple. Um, I have an MVC here, and I have the usual mechanisms that we use to connect outlet, target action, delegation, um, and data sources. That's kind of how we connect um, in Xcode. Um, and we have something that matches every single one of them. So an outlet is an X name. You've seen me do it two or three times already. Whenever I X name something in SAML, that automatically creates the outlet. Uh, for target action and delegation, we already talked about it for throughout the training. We use events. It's very similar. Um, you're just you know listening to the events and doing that. And then for data sources, I would recommend data binding. If not, you can have data sources the whole way and just get callbacks uh, for everything you do. Um, so let's create something real quick, just so you know we can recap a little bit of the structure. Um, um, and I'm just going to go here real quick and just say. You should show that uh, the generated intermediate code if yep. you can, yeah, of the partial yeah. class. Yeah, so, um, so I'm just going to go here, new project, very simple, uh, blank application, app 18. Um, oh, interesting. Did I just use a phone, a phone one? Sorry, I thought. No, Windows Store. You're good. Cool. Yeah. I was just telling people I can use phone from here. <laughs> I thought I was doing phone. So here, you know, I, you saw me do this earlier. I actually dragged the button. Um, and but I closed the solution. Uh, so I'm going to do right here the very the most simple uh, random number generator. Uh, I've been to enough ignorance treatments now that I learned. I've, I've seen how people actually um, learn from random number generators. So I'm going to steal it. Um, I have a button right here, and I have a text block. 
Um, and I'm not going to customize the look and feel much other than I'm going to make these uh, readable. Bump um, so on the text lock, yeah, I'm just going to go here uh, and bump the, uh, the size for the text. Right? So this is a very simple, um, you know, random number generator. That's what's what going to be. Um, and I have right here a button. Um, so you've seen me do this earlier. Um, actually, let's go ahead and do it um, here where I'm just going to create the outlet. Text name equals button, uh, which I don't really need. I'm just showing it to you. Uh, and then, for example, right here, when I'm in the button, I can come back here to the property editor. I see the list of events, and I just type on click so I can wire something up. Right? Um, and you'll see here the on click automatically gets added for me. Right? Um, and I got to go back and do the um, random. I'm, I'm, I, I got to give an outlet to this text box right here. So x name equals, oops, what's going on here? I'm just going to call it random output. Right, so this is the output we'll have, um, and I change the alignment here because I drag and drop something, but I leave it like that. Uh, so this is just creating the outlets. That's that's all it's doing. Um, and I can go back here and look at uh, the code behind so far. There's nothing other than the event handler. Um, so here I can just say random r equals new random. Um, and actually, I should probably do it outside so we can kind of reuse the same seed. And I'll add seed, uh, seed, and then I'm right here. I'm just going to say random output dot text equals r dot next. In random outputs in scope because uh, he added it into the XAML. So. Yep, so it's in scope because we added it to the XAML and we have the outlet. Right, right? and the XAML so, is what's actually at runtime going for the other half of the partial, or other third actually, yep. of the partial class. Exactly, so what you see here is this. So here's the relation. So first of all, uh, you see random output here. If I right click on it and I say go to definition, um, it's going to take me back into the XAML. Mm -hmm. right? So this is the connection that we do have, so you'll be able to go back and forth very, very easily. Now the other connection that you'll see is I have right here page x class equals app19.main page. So this is kind of like you know creating a partial. The, the tool will generate partial classes behind the scenes. I'll show you the output in a minute. Um, and it's actually going to connect it to this main page that we've been using. Uh, so you can go back here to the code behind and see that here's kind of the code of my controller, and I have a main page partial class. So we have a view and a code behind. I think of the view the XAML as a sib. I think this is the controller, um, and you know they're kind of tied. They're a little bit more tightly coupled than when we get out of Xcode. But I'll show you in a minute how to fix that. That class name uh, that's listed there—that's kind of like uh, the default implementation when you create a new instance of a view controller that's also tied to yep. a zip. Uh, it will just use the name of that view controller minus the view controller. Uh, look for that zip and then instantiate it. Those two things are doing the same exact thing: uh, the class definition of the XAML and the view controller searching for something it's with its yep. own name. So. Yep. Now, if you Same go back concept. here, yep. If you go back here, you'll see this. This partial class main page has this method called initialize component. Now, this I didn't right. add. This was added by the tool. Mm -hmm. So I can right click here and say, hey, go to the definition of that. And here's where you're going to see the code that's generated by the tool. Um, so here's the code. So you can come back here and see the code that the tool generated. Here's how I created my outlets. So it has right here declaration of button, uh, and then it's going in there serializing um, and creating everything, and then it's going in there and saying find by name that button, and this is how it's connecting the outlets. Right. So it's all coming together there. You have a model view controller like architecture. Um, and this one is a little bit highly coupled because the view and the controller are tied mm -hmm. uh, in one class. Now you can play around with it. You can you know create your own main page class and subclass and tie them together that way. There's a lot of ways that you can get around it. This is what comes out of the box, um, and it's very similar for most people. If you're only creating one you know a view controller with one view, this will work out of the box. In that yep. code, while it's generated and searching by name, uh, if you've ever seen an Android or program for Android for that finding by name and then assigning to a reference should look extremely yep. familiar. Uh, but this is just done automatically. Yep. Now, if you read anything about Microsoft and UI and SAML, you're going to hear about this other pattern that we use, which is model view view model. Um, and this one is it's nothing but a model view controller. But all we're doing here is um, what we had earlier, the X name stays. And instead, before, we were using events. And here we have the concept of command, which is a little bit of a more loosely coupled target action pair. Right? And then we use data binding for connecting everything. So we're not going to use outlets in this model. We're just going to use a um, slightly different command. No events. Oh, we're not going to use events. We're going to use commands. And we're going to use data binding instead of setting the code by hand. Um, right. And you'll see in a minute that the code looks exactly the same. Um, so I can come back here. Oops. My escape is now. There we go. Um, and I'll just add a new project real quick. Um, and I'll just say add new project. Um, and I'll make it a blank app.saml um, again. Hey, we recycled. We went to app one. It's like maybe it's only got 10 or 20 to do because we went to 19 and now we're back to one. Oh. Um, and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to copy and paste the XAML. Um, so you see that I'm not cheating with any of that stuff. Um, and I'll copy and paste what we created here. And then we'll do um, a little bit of um, taking stuff out. Um, so we have a grid right here. Uh, and I'm just going to paste it here. And I got to remove all the outlets. So here's the X names. These are outlets. So we remove these, uh, remove, the, remove the outlet here. Um, and then we're going to replace those with bindings in a minute. 
um, and I got to remove the click event handler. Um, the button had a click event handler, so let's go here um, and remove it because we're not really going to need it. Um, so we'll do that. Um, and let me make this my active project. Um, and then I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to bring two classes, but I'll walk you through it, through them. Uh, so add existing item. I'm going to bring two classes. One of them would be there by default um, if we were uh, using any template other than the empty template. Um, so we have C SAML. Uh, where did I put those samples? Oh, sorry, this is from a different. Uh, so I have these two classes right here, random number view model, which is what's going to replace our controller, and relay command. If you had opened any kind of project other than the empty one, you will have a relay command out of the box. Visual Studio would have generated it. Um, relay command is a generic implementation of command. Um, I command, if you look at the interface here, is just a very simple interface that has uh, only three methods, uh, or two methods, can execute and execute. Uh, this is what we're going to use to connect a button to an action. Um, it can execute something where the button calls onto this interface and says, oh, can I execute? And if we tell it no, the button will disable itself. Right. Right. And execute is when the button, when somebody clicks on the button and says, oh, execute the action. That's the loosely coupled um, action pair that we have. Um, and relay command is nothing but a generic implementation of this um, that takes the callback, and we're going to use that. Uh, and then I created here a random number view model. Uh, and it's got two properties. One of them is number, um, and the other one is called click command. Uh, number is a generated number. Click command is the command that's going to fire whenever something is clicked. Um, and you'll see here, um, you know, click command. It's got a call for the unclick. Here's where we're going to generate our number, our random number. And the last thing that you see is that this business of this view model is implemented I notify property change. Um, that's what's making it observable for the UI. So this is the, in the interface that you implement to notify the UI that properties are changing on your object. Um, it's a very straightforward interface. You just got this one member called property change, which is an event. And then you have to implement it where whenever the number is getting set, I'll just fire the property change uh, for that number, and that's all we're doing. Right. And this right. view model is in no way other than your own intention connected to the view or the page exactly. in any way. Yep. Right. So I can go back here to the page, which we knew was empty. Right now, it knows nothing. And I'm just going to say, um, earlier we had a click. So here, I'm just going to say command equals binding. Um, and it's called click command. Right. Um, and then here, I'm going to go to the text box. And I'm looking for the text property. And I'm just going to say text equals binding. And again, this binding is another one of those uh, extensions that makes XAML different from XML uh, in that we're using these curly braces and it's going to execute some sort of expression. Yep. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so these are one of the extensions. And then the last thing I have to do, so now I have a view and I have a view model, but I haven't connected them. Uh, and there's all kinds of ways to connect them. Here I'm going to take the shortcut uh, and I'm just going to go to where the page is created and I'm going to set the data context um, for this page. Um, data context is a special magic thing that we use where we say the data context for this page will be this and anybody underneath has access to this data. So I'm just going to say these new data and context. And this data context property is available on all UI okay. elements as well. Exactly. <laughs> and it's inherited. So if I put a page, everybody underneath it inherits, or everybody, every element anywhere on the tree can actually right. um, have Unless they overwrite context. it with their own data context. Yep, exactly. Very similar to the styles. Yep. So here I have these are data context, example random view model. Um, so this is what's connecting everything together. Um, and now I can come back here and just say debug. This should launch app one. And so that binding expression that you made for the command of the button, where it was bound to yep. uh, button click, is now searching the data context, that object you just created, and is assigning that command to the button. Yep. Um, and now when I click on it, it's number. generated a random number. Now, this is completely loosely coupled. Um, if you look at this, um, you'll see right here, um, the, the only relationship between the page and the view model is this. Uh, and the reason we use view model, like this view model pattern, besides the fact that the data binding budget a lot, it prevents it from having to write a lot of glue, um, the reason we use the view model is because this is very testable, mm -hmm. right? So when I write my business objects or my logic, I can go in there and test the view models. I can use the view models to um, exercise them to test my UI and do screen captures and do kind of UI testing. But for the most part, I usually test the view models really well, and then I trust that Microsoft got data binding right. <laughs> so I'm not testing as much as UI because UI automated UI testing is hard. Right. Um, so this is kind of the you know like this is the pattern that we use the most. Um, for writing unit tests is a piece of cake, especially in Visual Studio, and yep. you can use all of that against the view model. Exactly. Right. And that's so, the big motivation. Yep. That's why. We, that's where we come from these. And then, um, again, I inherited, I right now tied the, um, the page to the view model to this one line of code so they know something about each other. You can use IOC or any other pattern in there um, and actually decouple them even farther. Mm -hmm. um, normally, if I had time and I didn't last the phone here today, so I'm not going to take the treatments up. But when you download this demo, there will be a project there that has a phone project. And normally, I show people, oh, let me show you this exact same, you know, this exact same view model. In fact, I just link to that code. Um, I don't even copy it or anything, running on a phone project, and then you'll see the view model there. Right. Um, so, um, so that's kind of where, where we're going to be at, in fact. It's that same mentality of yep. divorcing the UI from the behavior that, or the 
the behaviors that it can accomplish. Yep. Um, and what I did here is I didn't launch the emulator because we had problems just earlier, so I kind of keep want to keep things low. So I didn't launch the emulator, so I'm not going to show that one. But you'll have the code for that. Um, and that's why we use MBBM. Um, and you see here, the only thing that changes is that we use commands to communicate and we use bindings to communicate. Um, outside of that, it doesn't deserve a new name, but we use it that way for, for convenience. Now, you saw me do a lot of the UI, and I want to give you a couple of very iOS-specific terms. Um, in particular, you saw that um, I gave you the controls, but I never talked about controllers. Um, right. So in our pages, what we do is we do very similar to UI um, navigation controller. Um, we do navigation across those pages. You've seen me do a little bit of that. So what we have here is um, we have a frame. We have a window and a frame. The frame is a, you know, the container, and he can navigate pages in and out. Um, that's kind of the pattern that we use the most. If you're thinking, well, how am I going to do a tab bar or something, I'll show you controls like app bar where you get a very similar functionality, uh, but they're not part of our navigation uh, functionality. They're not core to the navigation, so you'll see how all those fit. Um, and then, you know, that frame can contain all kinds of pages, and then we can transition in and out, and we give you all the animations to uh, transition in and out. Um, I didn't show animation in Blend because I know I'm short on time, um, but, um, but that's just where, you know, we have transitions and animation all across the model. Um, with regards to navigation, I want to kind of build a correlation here between our frame and the navigation controller, because that's what you that's what you see. If you look at a frame, you see the same events here, navigated, navigating, navigation failed. You see very similar events, and you see the navigate methods here, where this is very similar to what you use with navigation controller when you're presenting, kind of pushing and popping controllers in and out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something we do. Um, we give you transitions the same way, um, and you know you can just go back and forth across the controllers. Um, and then we also do the same for page lifecycle. Page right now is kind of being our view controller, um, and I want to highlight some of the events that it has. Um, it has the unnavigated to and unnavigated for, uh, unnavigated from, and then it also has a loaded event. And if you think about a view controller, right? On view controller, you have a view will appear, mm -hmm. right? Then you have a view did load, and then you have you know unload and uh, or will disappear and unload. Um, and this is exactly the same. Like we map very very much back to back uh, with regards to what you expect out of page lifecycle. So you will have similar events. Um, with regards to going in there uh, and doing page and navigation. Um, the last thing I do, I want to do is I want to just highlight Windows personality controls, and I'm going to do it through a demo because um, it's actually easier. So I'm here in search, and I'll show you one of my favorite Windows 8.1 apps, which is health and fitness. Uh, not that I'm healthy and fit. I just like the look and feel. And it actually has really great uh, articles like working out on vacation, um, which, you know, I'll read it and I probably won't follow it. Uh, but this is kind of a... <laughs> it's it, vacation. It, yeah, yeah, it's a vacation. I'm like, it's but it has a few of the controls that I think are interesting. For example, here you see what we call the hub. Um, there's kind of a hero shot right here on the left hand where this is our hero shot, and then there's a lot of content that you can scroll through. Um, so that's kind of what a hub is. It's kind of a, a hero shot with a lot of content, um, and for the most part, you're panning through that content. Now, we have, for example, a semantic zoom control where I can stop it there, um, and I can do uh, my touch here. Um, I can do a semantic zoom. So this is all content that was represented there, and from here, I can jump around, so I can go into the medical section of all that content. This is another control where Two, two controls are related semantically. Uh, one of them is kind of the grouping of everything that it contains, and you can show the UI so people can navigate very quickly in and out. Um, you see here throughout, you see a lot of a grid views. So you'll see, for example, right here, this is a list view. Um, and again, it's using those data templates we showed you earlier. Here you see a grid view um, where um, it's actually just the collection view. Mm -hmm. right? So you see a lot of our controllers. If you click on anything here. And all of um, this is actually within a grid view, too, the whole big thing that's scrolling. Yep. Well, it's all within a grid. Uh, and then it's got the hub control, which right. is the new control that we have with the container for all the sections. Okay. Right. So hub is new in 8.1, so okay. you're, it's not on your training yet. Not there yet. yet. All right. <laughs> uh, but and then we have here we have on top we have a navigation bar, which is a really good way if you're looking for tab bar navigation, um, a tab bar or navigation controller. We have a tab bar on top, and then you can also have an app bar at the bottom. That's the one thing this app doesn't have. Uh, but these are some of the controls that, for example, right click. I'm click, right clicking on the page, and the nav bar is coming down. And those animations you can see here. Um, there's an animation that comes out of transition and everything. Those are all what I call the Windows personality, and this is what you get out of using the native controls that are coming in the box. Uh, you're going to get a lot of functionality for free, right? right? So now to go back to your point, um, those are some, some of those are A1 controls. So um, just I want to point here, reference to the controls that I just showed you a little bit. Grid view and list view, it's collection view um, and UI table view. Um, there's really great samples on SDK. These screenshots came from that sample. Um, so you're going to get you know, rich data binding from these elements. You're going to get UI virtualization very much like you get in Xcode. You're going to get this really smooth scrolling pan, um, pan zoom uh, from those controller. Um, I didn't show you an app bar in health and fitness, but app bar is the command bar that will be at the bottom of the page. I show you an app bar, which is at the top. Um, and this app bar is right here at the bottom of the page. And you know it's got all the integration where, um, you know for example, when you turn to orientation, the UI shrinks. Maybe it doesn't show the text. It just shows the buttons. Uh, it resizes. It does 
a lot of things out of the box that is, you know, kind of familiar Windows look and feel, things that you expect from every app. I'll show you semantic zoom, which is just the ability to go between two controls that are related, two views that are related, semantically link them and navigate across them. Um, I didn't show settings flyout. This is the flyout that you've seen as we come out with the charms all the time. It's a flyout that comes from the left. Um, and just kind of, it comes from the right and it just kind of shows you a, right. a little bit of UI. And it's just um, a fairly standard way that users will be expecting to see in your app to basically go in and change settings yep. uh, and specify preferences. Um, and in the settings flyout, you can put any content you want. You see here a whole lot of options, uh, a whole lot of, um, you know, uh, toggle switches, buttons, etc. You can put any content you want. Um, you saw this control earlier. This is the flip view. Is the one it's like UI page view where I can just go back and forth um, one page at a time or one screen at a time. You saw this when we did layout. Yep. Um, so it's kind of an items control there. Um, and then we have a web authentication broker, which is what we would use to connect to anything that's using in, uh, kind of internet standard like OAuth, OpenID, uh, and it's a system-wide um, dialogue that you can use to connect to all the systems so that the user is very familiar. They know, oh, I can trust this code because it's running uh, the system-wide dialogue. Um, and everything else. And then we have flyout, which is just smaller versions of the settings flyout. So you can kind of pop in and out, do the equivalent of property sheets. Pro the difference between flyouts and pop-ups, which I mentioned earlier, is flyouts right here are actually um, light dismiss. So if I show this UI and I click anywhere else, that flyout will go away. Right, it's not um, modal, it doesn't block the UI. It's not modal, yep, UI. exactly. Um, and then I do want to, you know, as you were pointing out, um, some of those controls that I just showed you, like for example, Hub, which was not listed there, are actually in 8.1. Um, if you want some of these controls in 8.0, like flyout, menus, or settings flyout, those are actually in the Callisto library. This is a library shipped by Tim Hewer. He works from Microsoft. He works in the SAML team. Uh, we just knew there were controls, some controls that we couldn't ship on time for 8.0. Mm -hmm. uh, so anybody that's using 8.0 today, um, you can go download the library. It's open source. It's got all the, you know, it's got the right controls, the right source, and those will, you know, transfer really well towards 8.1 right. when these controls are now in the box. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it for SAML. Um, I was close enough to on time, just three minutes over. <laughs> Uh, so that's a marathon. A that's a marathon. Uh, yeah. He had no faith in me. Uh, <laughs> we, he probably was looking for an hour and a half. Um, that's what I thought it was going to be. Is there any questions from there? There's a. Uh, actually, there's no. Not, there's not a lot? Okay. There's, there's nothing. Yeah, we have Ben Riga and Matthias Shapiro answering questions. So um, the yeah. fact that we don't have anything to read here probably just means that they've been answering them. So keep, ask, keep asking questions there yeah, as we go. Yeah, popping up and disappearing. You know, um, and keep going from there. Uh, that's some, um, again, um, once we this go, this course is live too for on-demand view and we will also have a link to the SAML course for on-demand view and that was another eight hours and we dive in depth into a lot right. of those concepts. For what's worth, that was SAML so, as short as it ever could possibly be. Yep. Uh, um, <laughs> hopefully at least give you the, uh, the sense. Uh, SAML is very, very powerful. That's the one thing that I tell everybody uh, who's coming new. Uh, don't fight it. I, I do see, and you know, when I code, for example, with storyboards, I definitely see in the pain of uh, source control and all the stuff when I code Xcode apps. But uh, I think on our side, um, the pages are individual. Uh, we do a pretty good job of different. So if you look at our source control and our differentiator tools, uh, it's pretty good about differentiating. And I think in the end, the benefits that you're going to get are all that styling, the data binding, all the resources, all those concepts. Um, it's going to outweigh the you know the fear that you have of oh should I just do everything in code? Oh, wait, um, so we got a question from Ben. Question from Ben. He's asking if he's going to get paid. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see. Um, we'll have some session available in a few more days. They do. No, last one. Oh, that one. Highlighted. Oh, some questions about when to say, when to use third party frameworks. Oh, perfect. Uh, so that's a good point. Um, so there's a question here about when to use third party frameworks. So um, here's where we are today on 8.0 and 8.1. Um, so, first of all, what I showed you there, um, most of the controls that I show you, all the core controls that I mentioned, those are actually standard across the board. The reason I have, I call them core controls, and that's why it came from stuff that I do when I present Windows and phone and everything else. Right. Um, so, those are core controls across the box. Um, and those are very easy. Those are um, great for people to use. Microsoft has a philosophy where we focus on our platform um, a lot. We kind of say we will build the primitives and then we let other third party vendors build more control. So, for example, if you come to us and say, Hi, man, I want really good charting. Um, you're going to get them from Telerik. Um, you're going to get them. Um, yeah, you're going to get them from Telerik um, um, or other third-party vendors. Infragistic component one. There's a lot of people writing some really great controls. A lot of those are specialized, like you know, charts and grids. Some more line of business-oriented controls is great to go from a third-party framework. Another thing that's very popular for third-party frameworks for us is um, actually um, you know, model view view model. Right? You saw me there. I had a I kind of say, oh, I'm going to cheat and bring you this class that's implementing change notification, and I talk about maybe using IOC. There's other several frameworks to actually implement model view model. And they provide much more robust uh, like implementations of a lot of those relay commands, yeah. that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. So they, you know, they, they have their implementation of relay, relay command. Uh, for example, last week in the SAML training, uh, my co-host was Lorraine Mignon, who writes MVVM Lite, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably one that we would recommend. Um, it's kind of a very pragmatic MVVM implementation. It has relay command. It has ways to message back and forth. 
Microsoft View model and a little tiny IOC. They're not using tiny IOC by hand. I think it's using simple IOC. Okay. Uh, but it's just giving you enough so you can get started. There's others out there like Caliburn, more powerful, but a little bit more advanced. So, um, so you just got to figure out where do I land uh, with regards to those. Now, uh, for those controls, Callisto is very safe. It comes out of Microsoft. It's very, you know, it's very safe to use. With regards. It's open source anyway. So if you need controls like flyout, set, uh, settings flyout, things that were not in AO, I highly recommend you use Callisto. Um, something that I tell everybody, which is really cool, and if you go look at this animal training, for example, uh, when I taught layouts, I showed uh, some library from uh, Winterleg that had um, custom layouts. Okay. Right, and it had a lot of layout controls, and it's so for me, those are really great just from a learning standpoint. Like, if you go in there, I use that to teach people how to write a custom panel. Uh, so on that side, it's really great to go look at the open source. Um, for Silverlight, for example, uh, which is very similar, it's the exact same SAML, same controls, um, Windows Phone has always shipped something called a control toolkit that has a lot of controls. Uh, and again, it's a really great way for people to learn. The learning is very important out of that. And they have transitions, and they have all kinds of um, nice things that if you're writing a Windows Phone app, you will need the Silverlight control toolkits, and it's in CodeFlex. Um, so there's a lot, like, I'm, I don't fear third party. I mean, you know, in a, with Xcode, fearing third party is almost impossible. Yeah. There's a lot of tasks that I've never written. Like, if I was writing NSURL connections or, you know, networking, yeah. I would have to use a third party library. Uh, so there's a lot of that here. Uh, WinRT, there's not a lot of third party libraries that you're going to need. I think on the UI, because I get custom, there'll definitely be some third parties that you're going to need. And, and I think to answer the question, or question maybe, like, when should you use a third party framework? Basically, if you're going to be doing MVVM, you should spend some time exploring the third party frameworks. To do your own MVVM by hand with no frameworks at all, you can do it, but it won't be nearly as fun. <laughs> yep, it's right. You know, you're going to spend, you're going to write 500 lines of code that you didn't have to write because right. you can go find something that, that was reusable, reusable there. Um, and that's it. Again, I recommend looking at the code from learning. Um, and I definitely do recommend looking at some of the third party vendors because um, they do have controls that are nice, they're optimized, and they're inexpensive with regards to if you pay $100 for a control because you buy a third party license and, um, and you get you know, free royalty or free distribution, um, that's much less than you know, you're spending three hours writing a control, even if you could write a control in, in three hours. Right. Now, that's it. With styling, uh, you know, with the combination of styling, control templates, it's hard for me to think of functionality that's in the box, like click behaviors, sliders, anything like that, that where you have to go and do third-party controls. A lot of our stuff is very customized. The big one for third-party controls is a uh, graphing. That's even the case on like iOS as well, yep. is creating elegant, nice-looking charts. And I, I think that's actually Telerik's claim. Or, like, yep. big. So, yeah, Telerik has some Shinobi controls, for example, right? Mm -hmm. They write controls for iOS now. The guys, right. they started writing controls for Windows many years ago, and they're taking a lot of that, and now they have them from everywhere. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next section. So we're going to take a 10 minute break uh, and then we're going to come and do app mode. Yep. Yep. Sounds good. All right, back in 10 minutes. Thank you. All right. And we're back. Uh, so uh, I think we're going to talk about app model now and uh, how that works. And that's going to cover everything from as far as what's actually contained in the application package, uh, what that means to process lifecycle, and then a little bit of just by necessity of how to run applications in the background and do stuff in the background. We threw uh, everything we couldn't fit anywhere else. We threw it here. It was an app model. Yep. Right. Uh, so to start, we have this fancy graphic of uh, Windows Store app acquisition. And basically what this is showing is Every like app as you get from the store basically is downloaded in a zip package and within that zip package is a whole bunch of stuff And what happens in install time is a very deterministic process where basically that zip is unpacked uh, And things that can be deterministically undone are done to install that application uh, So what that means is when the user uninstalls your app uh, it can be guaranteed that nothing that uh, Was or nothing can be left over. There's no side effects left uh, after the uninstall and so you can see there's the stage and register step uh, that basically installs this application for you. And so moving on, uh, this is what actually is contained in that zip. Uh, it's the app package, if you will. And the most important thing that we'll look at more closely here in a demo soon is uh, this app manifest. And basically what this is, is it's the thing that tells Windows uh, what your app can do, uh, what its capabilities are, what its contracts are, and uh, basically everything else about it. It's also where you specify your launch images, splash screen images, all of that stuff. Uh, very much similar to info.plist in iOS. Yep. 
And then there's this block map, which is really important, uh, and that's basically contains hashes of everything inside the app package. And it's what allows updates to happen pretty easily. Uh, basically, if, there, if you issue a new update to your application uh, and put it up on the store, it, your block map will be compared to, to a new update on the store, and you'll only download the pieces that you need, and then your app will be patched with that new information. And then a signature, in combination with this block map, are used to ensure the integrity of the application package. So basically, after you download it, you can't go in there and modify uh, or mess with anything of that app and still have it run. It's how the security of it's guaranteed. Yep. And this is all transparent to the developer. You submit your application to the mm -hmm. store, we deploy it for you, we install it, we uninstall it, like Windows, the platform is doing all of that. So it's very right. much like iOS where you know, they do all the work for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, just to start with that, uh, this is the app bundle in iOS. It's a pretty similar concept. As you can see, if we're actually looking inside the bundle, uh, this is a screenshot out of uh, one of the BNR books, uh, the homeowner application, home owner. Uh, there's the actual executable itself, and then there's uh, the nibs, which are used for the views. Then there's the info plist, which, as we said earlier, is kind of like the uh, manifest in that it tells what the app can do. Uh, and so the situation in looking at a Windows package is very much the same. Uh, we can see here at the bottom we have this exe, that's the actual executable. Uh, and then there's also these XAML files, which just like the nibs, they get redistributed with the application and are parsed at runtime and turned into their classes, as we saw earlier in the XAML stuff. And then there's also the app manifest is in there as an XML file, and then there's the block map in XML. And again, all of these are just, this is just the inside of what your app is actually installed as. And so, again, just a little bit more on the manifest. Uh, this is the place where if you said wanted to access the user's uh, music library or pictures library, you would say, I want access to that here. Uh, also, if you want to use devices or internet or access GPS or uh, any other sensors like that, you would declare this in the manifest. Uh, it's a security thing, it lets the user uh, know what's going to happen to your application, and they can also revoke these privileges on a per privilege per app basis. Yep. Right. And uh, we'll see when we get to a demo the editor that's provided for AppX Manifest, so you're not sitting there editing XML by hand. Yep. And the beauty, the, to us, the beauty of having the capabilities, um, not only is asking the runtime, because you know, you're like if you compare it to the iOS world, where at iOS when you when you're about to use webcam, iOS comes up and says, hey, do you want to allow them to use webcam? What we do with the manifest that is also when you go to the store we give you that information. Right. So before you download an application, we tell you, oh, you're about to download an application. Like, imagine you go in there and you try to download a Sudoku game, and it's saying, oh, it's, one, it's going to want to access to your documents library and it's your, your location. Uh, location right. and everything else. You can go back and be like, hey, that looks suspicious. Maybe I should install it. Right. Um, so that's what we do. We use that for certification. If you gave us that Sudoku game and you'll try to access documents library, we probably would fail it or we would question the developer a lot. Right. Um, so that's, you know, it, it kind of adds up to that confidence that we want users to have that they're not going to break. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. And so this is just another thing uh, that comes along with the whole app package and the way everything's set up. And that is complete and total process isolation. Again, on iOS, this is a very similar situation uh, in that no process can know about each other. They have a separate context that they're running in uh, as far as file access and storage. And then in addition to that, they have a separate networking context as well. So even if you somehow built a server into your uh, uh, like Windows Store application, uh, you could not talk to another app using that server uh, or anything like that because there's separate network context to keep everything directly separated. However, as we'll see in the next session that Jaime's going to do, uh, there is a way to shuffle data or information between different apps, and that's contracts. However, these are brokered by WinRT itself uh, rather than by each app knowing about another app. Uh, you just tell the system that you want to expose certain information or that you want to receive certain information, and WinRT handles that for you. Right. And so it's, this is just a way to keep everything secure. So, that being said, uh, let's go ahead and open up Visual Studio and just look at that capabilities, manifest editor, everything like that. Actually, I had a camera demo for this. So, this actually opened right up into the uh, manifest editor. Uh, and this is an SDK sample uh, from Windows, uh, from MSDN, and that's going to show us some camera capture. We'll see that in a moment. But here is the application UI section of this manifest. Uh, we, we can specify our display name. This is what will appear on the start menu. Uh, we can specify the entry point. That's the uh, class that it should look for and load. Uh, language, uh, that's internationalization stuff. Uh, you can specify your uh, pr orientation preferences, uh, like the launch orientation, iOS kind of thing. Um, and then here is a whole bunch of different images that you get to specify for your titles and logos, uh, store logos all of that kind of stuff. You should totally be familiar with that. And then there's this capabilities tab. And here in uh, this application demo, there's webcam and microphone are already checked. Uh, if we uncheck these and run this application, you'll see that when we click this capture photo button, it's going to say, we need uh, permission to use the camera. And it says you can change this in the app settings. However, since we didn't request it, oh, whoops. 
Yeah, permissions. Okay. Uh, it says this app does not use any system capabilities because we didn't specify that in our manifest. So if we go back in here and tell it to use webcam and microphone, those two are kind of pair usually on those systems, uh, and run this again, and we hit capture photo, we now are prompted because we requested the capability, and we can hit allow here, and you'll get this awkward shot of us from way back here. Uh, great quality, excellent quality. Uh, <laughs> how bright it is, they can see the light. <laughs> and so we can also, even though we have declared this in our manifest, the user, again, all of these permissions, they can revoke them on a per app basis. So I just turned it off. And now, since I actually declared that properly in my manifest, it's there and it's a switch that I can use. Simple stuff. And that UI would add it by the system. So you didn't have to do right, anything to go back on the settings. You didn't have to go into right. the to turn it on and off. Absolutely. Uh, this, yeah, this UI, this is not written uh, as part of the application. This is just WinRT reading our manifest and saying, oh, I'm going to provide the switch to the user. Yep. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to our slides. Yeah, show them, uh, close guess, that one there, or go to Solution Explorer, show them the XML version if you want. I thought uh, okay. Just um, right click. Yep. Yeah, just so if you're curious, um, and you just want to, or if you're feeling particularly masochistic, and you want to go in here and add XML manually, uh, you can see what it looks like. Basically, we specify a package as our root element, uh, and then all of those other things kind of are fairly obvious there. Uh, eventually, we get to applications. A package can contain more than one application. Uh, and you can see where everything that we set up in that manifest the kind of visual editor uh, is reflected here. Yep. So pretty simple. And there's the min version, max version, all that fun stuff that you would tend to expect. Also, identity. That's, that's a good one, too. All right, so let's get out of that and go back. So that was just kind of how everything works uh, or as far as acquisition of the app package and installing it. So that kind of brings us into the application lifecycle now. Uh, so this is when your app is running, uh, or not running, or in any state, the user's interacting with your app. Uh, how do you basically know what state you're in, and how do you basically uh, save information and deal with the different application states? Because again, these are resource trained devices. It's not like you can just have a window in front of it. So. On iOS, we have these five states. Um, there's a chart that I'm sure most people watching this have seen, uh, where there's these states not running, active, inactive, background, and suspended, uh, where we have various different uh, things that the app could be doing. So if it's visible, receiving events, or executes code. Uh, the active state is when that active app is in the foreground, and it can, it's visible, receiving, touch events, and also executing code. Uh, and these, this is the, the direct analog to the running state on Windows Store apps, uh, which is when the app is in the foreground, and that's what the user is seeing and currently interacting with. Uh, the not running state is also direct analog, where that's the app's just not running at all. It's not in memory. Uh, it's just terminated, gone. Right. Uh, and then there's the inactive state on iOS, which that state only exists for the case where, say, a modal dialog appears over the app that you're using. Uh, so we have mostly visible here uh, and not receiving events, but that's just because the app is still it's still there. It's what's like the one that's right exactly uh, a phone call or something like that. Um, but your app can still be running in the background. So if you're generating primes, then by all means, yeah, it's still working. And that is not the case on Windows Store apps because we don't have any sort of those modal interruptions uh, or anything like that. Uh, the same is similar situation for the background state on iOS app. There is a, not an equivalent state for that on store apps because that's background tasks, which are an entirely different concept that we'll cover at the end of this, but are technically a contract. Uh, but we'll see more about this soon. And then there's the suspended state, and this is also a direct equivalent uh, between iOS and Windows Store apps, where the app is just freeze-dried, canned in memory, uh, not really doing anything, uh, not receiving events or executing a code, but everything is still cached in RAM. It has not been taken out of memory. And then on Windows Store apps, there's also these two additional states that we'll see why they exist here soon. Uh, that's terminated and closed by user. And those states are they're roughly equivalent to not running, but when you're coming back from those states, you're going to want to do a little bit, things a little bit differently. And there's a table that makes that very clear soon. So this is the actual application lifecycle uh, for Windows Store apps. The vast majority of the time, you're only going to be concerned with the circle on the right hand here, uh, where your app is, say, terminated and not running. Uh, it's get activated, the user taps your tile, you go into the running state, uh, and the user navigates away from that application, suspends, uh, you go to the suspended state. Right. Uh, there's some subtleties in here that we'll deal with soon, but like this whole left side, but the vast majority of the time you're going to be over here worrying about the three states, running, suspended, and terminated. So to highlight some more on those states, there's this ni nice little animation here. All right. Whoops. Okay. So the user launches the application. They start by seeing the splash screen. The splash screen goes over, and the app is now running. It's in the running state. They're interacting with it. They're doing anything they want to the app. Then there's the suspending event that happens. Uh, and this is the notification to that running app that, all right, you're getting ready to not be running anymore. You'll no longer be able to execute code. 
and that's in a suspended state. Uh, no code runs. So, and you go into suspended. So, so we, we have one foreground app. You can go into suspended when the user switches to another app. Right. Right. So you're kind of going from the foreground to you know to something right. else. From the foreground to no longer on screen. Yep. Exactly. Yes. Uh, because there is the case where the apps could be snapped next to each other, and two apps could be in the running state at the same time. Yep. Exactly. Uh, but when the app is no longer on screen, is when it's suspended. Yep. Uh, and so then, from suspended, uh, the application could be resumed immediately. Uh, so this would probably be the example where. Uh, well, I actually have another animation coming up to show it, but the user switches away from your app to check their mail or something for a very short amount of time, and there's, you know, you're not running a lot of other apps, and the system isn't constrained, uh, so it just keeps your app there free, tried, and RAM. However, if resources are tight and your app's been suspended for a little bit, there is a case that it will be terminated, and that's when it's dropped out of memory to free up memory for other applications, uh, and you'll have to restore from scratch. So, just to kind of seal the deal on that, uh, this suspending event, which we'll look at more closely soon in code, uh, you have five seconds to handle suspension. And that's five seconds of real time or CPU time? No, that's five seconds uh, real time. Real time, right. So from when, the, from when we fire suspended, we call onto your suspension handler. Uh, so you, you can wire up to the event and you'll get five seconds. Um, you can make an async call and get a deferral if you want to, um, but you'll get five seconds of real time. Okay. Um, technically, if you really need more than that, first of all, you should not need more than five seconds because you should say state as you go along. Right. Um, that's better. And if you need more than that, the trick is you can also listen to visibility change because um, visibility change will fire 10 seconds, be 10 seconds before we suspend you. Um, so you can be like, oh, I'm no longer visible. And then what we do there is we actually wait 10 seconds. And you probably shouldn't be assuming on these numbers because they might vary. Um, these are system numbers. But, um, and then after that, we call on to suspend it. Um, and the reason we do those 10 seconds is because, for example, sometimes I'm doing um, Windows tab to switch across apps. And I kind of switch to something and then come back immediately where I right. do it by accident, like I've done it many times today. Yeah. Um, so that's what you'll see. You'll see that uh, those 10 seconds will buy you some time. It's right. a great place to start saving if you, if you really need it. And uh, actually, a question just came in. And so if an app is busy loading something from the net and the user switches away to check mail, the loading is stopped until it is released from suspended. Uh, yes. Yes, that is correct. However, if you are downloading something big from the net, uh, as we'll see in a bit, uh, background tasks will be the way you want to deal with that. Yep. For background for file transfer, we have background file transfer, mm -hmm. download and upload. Um, so, and those background and that's APIs, managed by WinRT. Yeah, those are WinRT APIs, and you don't even have to write a background tasks. Uh, you can also write your own background tasks, but for background file transfer, we give you the API. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. All right. And so moving on, this is just another uh, illustrative example that can show what can happen when running multiple apps and their switching of state between running suspended and terminated. So we start with this one app that is in the running state, uh, and then we switch to app two that is now in the foreground. Uh, this is app two is what the user is interacting with. And then after that five seconds that we saw earlier, app one, it goes to suspended. Uh, we then switch to a third app, app three, it's now in foreground, and it moves to suspended and so on and so forth. Eventually though, uh, as we get further on into app n, uh, the app, the well, it's partly deterministic, but uh, apps can be terminated. Uh, you know, and there's no notification from the suspended state to the terminated state. So everything that you're going to have to do to save state has to happen between running to suspended, uh, because your app's not receiving any cycles or any sort of notification. This is a little different um, than could be the case in iOS, where you'll get messages about each of these state transitions and the chance to run code. Um, but right, it's essentially the same thing. And so we switch back to app two, which was never suspended, and now it's back in the running state. Uh, there was no need to restore state manually. Oops. Um, so that's just kind of that. All right, so that's the theory of it. Uh, here's how you might actually go about saving state. Um, so there's this thing called Suspension Manager. It's a, it's a class that's included with a lot of the templates in Visual Studio when you're creating Windows Store apps. Uh, I highly recommend using it. Even if you uh, make the blank app template, you should still pull the Suspension Manager from somewhere and use it, along with its uh, counterpart layout aware page. Um, so basically, Suspension Manager, as we'll see soon, is just a big dictionary for all intents and purposes with some functionality. So here we have a we're getting a reference to the suspension manager, uh, which is available in the common name space from the templates. And we're basically just storing uh, game status in, a, in the dictionary under the key game status. And then to restore, we just pull it out and everything's good. So that, like, we do that. So when does that actually happen or become anything? Uh, in app XAML at CS, this is like the equivalent of uh, your app delegate. Uh, this is where we would register, subscribe to this event with our on suspending handler, and we would say, all right, we're going to acquire our deferral. This is what lets us basically run uh, potentially asynchronous code from within this non-suspending event and not have Windows uh, kill our app before everything's actually done. And so we would, this is all generated in the templates for you, but suspension manager.saveAsync is called. And what this does is basically takes that dictionary, uh, which you can store primitive types in, serializes it all out to a file, and saves that to local storage. Uh, and because it's doing all of that, it's asynchronous operation, and we can call it with the await keyword. Right? Uh, and then once that's done, we would complete our deferral. Relatively simple. So 
again, this is a uh, that session state dictionary that suspension manager owns. Uh, it also we were or in this slide we were just writing to it directly with our own values. Uh, but back in this slide, you can see that it also holds for each layout aware page that is a member of like the application. Uh, it also has a dictionary that is the page state. So each page will have its own dictionary. And moving on, we can see that every layout aware page subclass, which is what you should be using. Uh, has these uh, method subs, save state, load state on them. And basically, each one's passed in the page state dictionary that comes from Suspension Manager. Uh, and what you do is you store uh, just the same things in there. So here we have page state dictionary. We're adding our greeting output text to it. And then we're adding a value of our greeting output text block into that. And then restoring state, we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, the save state method will be called, uh, thinking back to the navigation stuff that I talked about earlier, uh, the save state gets called when you navigate away from a page. So this happens automatically just by implementing this method. Uh, every time you navigate away from a page, save state will be called and you can save this dictionary. And then if your app gets suspended or terminated, uh, this will all be serialized out. And then when you resume from the terminated state, you'll get this uh, load state method will be called when you navigate to the page uh, and supplied with the page state dictionary that you can then use to set text uh, on like the UI or something like that. And of course, page state is null. That means it's the first time your application has been run, and you should do whatever it is you need to do to set up your data and redo it manually. Right. So back to these uh, terminated and closed by user state, or not running and closed by user states versus terminated. Uh, essentially, terminated, when you're checking your uh, previous execution state, uh, which is done in app.xaml, this is where you want to restore your session data. Uh, so this is where you would call suspension manager restore async. Uh, and basically let it populate all of those dictionaries again so that your application will continue to function with all of these pre values. Uh, however, if the previous execution state was closed by a user or not running, you're not going to want to restore that data uh, because that means that the user either explicitly closed the application, which means that they're going to want to see that splash screen again, uh, or that the application crashed, uh, or it's the first time running, and you're going to want to basically remake all of your data. Yep. Right. Cool. And so, uh, just kind of on the same note, uh, this is storing user preferences. This is a very similar situation uh, as it is to iOS on for NS user defaults. And that is uh, basically just another dictionary, uh, except this can be local or it can be roaming. And that works exactly how you might imagine it. The local settings are specific to the device that that user is on, and the roaming settings are global. Uh, any app that I have installed on multiple different devices, say, on the Surface, if I had a mail installed, and if on uh, my computer I had mail installed, and I was changing settings and sync settings on them, I'd expect those settings to be the same on both devices. And so that's how you can do that. Code's yep. fairly straightforward. Yep, and the roaming is done all automatically. The system does it right. for you. You exactly. just give it your lab ID, or the user has to have the lab ID enabled, mm -hmm. and then we will run them across devices right. as they go. Mm -hmm. so. And it's, you know, that's all managed by uh, Microsoft servers, and it's, it's not really instant, but it's probably about 10 minutes it takes for the, everything to sync up. Yep. Okay. Um, and cool. the one caveat with that is there is limits. Like, don't try to run books or anything like that. Um, usually, this is for settings. So, an application will, you know, we, we tell people by default, try to run less than 32K. Right. Um, so, yeah. just make sure you're saving just, just settings. Don't try to save like, right. a document we're working on or yeah. anything like that. You, you can't can be putting pictures or anything in here. Exactly. This is just preferences. Yep. Uh, these are things that you use to basically shape your app. Kind of thing. Exactly. Right. It's not for data, not at all. Uh, SkyDrive integration is what you want to use for that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, all right. I believe that it's time for the suspending and resuming demo. All right. So this here, uh, there we go, is a very, very basic application that is nothing but a button hooked up to a timer, hooked up to a text box. Uh, and we're going to walk through the suspending and resuming events and show them in the debugger. Uh, let's see, where's the kind And suspend and resume. All right. So just to you know, give you some context on the code, we have a basic dispatcher timer, which is a timer that runs on the main thread. Uh, we basically we set up a tick event for it that basically updates the text block every so often, every interval, which I believe I have set to 100 milliseconds. Yes. And we have that wired up. So if we run this and put it next to Visual Studio, OK, we can see that it is there counting, still counting. And so we're going to suspend this around seven seconds. OK. Well, no, I missed it. All right, well, 8.4 is what it looked like there. So right now, the app is in the suspended state, uh, which this is kind of debug, so it's a little bit weird. You would never normally have an app that still had a position on screen that was in the suspended state, but because we're in the debugger, we get to do that. So if I resume, you can see it picked up right where the timer left off because everything was just freeze-dried. Uh, nothing changed. OK? And it's really that simple. Uh, can you yeah. just try to zoom in? Yep. Oh, OK. Um, all right. That should be a little bit more readable, I hope. 
Yep. Maybe? Okay, cool. Um, and so what we can see in here is that we have this on suspending event. And we hit this on suspending event. And this five seconds rule that is normally applied to these Windows Store apps doesn't apply when you're debugging the application. Otherwise, that would get really frustrating really fast. Uh, so we have infinite time here to basically poke around this. Um, and right, you can see that by this blank template uh, that does not include the suspension manager, there's no save async in here. But we can open up a new app and show that in a moment. Uh, but yeah, that's it. It's suspending. Continue running again. Suspended. There's also the on resuming event, which we are not currently subscribed to. But we can subscribe to it real quick. You have to stop it. Right. Um, so this is going to throw an exception when we do it, but oh well. Suspend. There's our unsuspending message. All right. Then we resume. And here's app resuming. And let's just throw that exception and get it over with. All right. So that's pretty much it. Um, just to show a little bit about Suspension Manager. Okay. You'll see it generates, uh, when we use anything other than the blank template, uh, we get this whole big common folder that's filled with lots of goodies. Suspension Manager is one of them. Uh, that's big enough, I think, maybe? OK. Um, and we can see our save async method here where basically we iterate over each frame, or page rather. Um, frame is just the superclass of page. And we call this method save frame navigation state on each frame. And if we go to the definition of that, there it is. OK. Um, we save that into the frame state dictionary. Right. Yep. And that is pretty much it. All right, that's the special manager. I don't see any questions sitting in here. So OK. With that, we'll move on. So. The background state is something that uh, we don't exactly have an equivalent to. Uh, oh, wait, we're actually doing activations now. Sorry. Um, OK. So in addition to uh, the PLM and like, state, there's also activations. Uh, these are basically uh, different things that your app can do, uh, like different intents almost. Uh, in iOS, there's only really only one other type of activation, and that's a URL activation, other than the app user just clicking on the uh, app icon from the home screen. Uh, that's that your app can be opened with a URL, and the path forward looks like this. The app goes from not running into URL activation, no, and then the application did become active, and then it's in the running state. If there was a URL provided, then it first goes into this application handle open URL, and then that's your chance to basically deal with that URL and then open your app in the right way. Right. Uh, Windows Store apps is a little bit different uh, because of contracts and because you know your app, it's no longer just the app that you can launch from the start screen. Uh, it's much more powerful. And so we have all these different places for activations. And looking at that graph, that can be a little bit confusing, but it's actually really not that confusing. Uh, activation by contract is the way you'd want to think about this. And so here's just a big list of a bunch of different contracts that Jaime is going to cover a few select ones in the next session. Uh, but basically, when your app is invoked with one of these contracts in mind, it the idea is you don't want to present the, your normal UI, or you don't want your app to act like the user tapped on the tile from the start screen. Uh, you want it to do something different. So with that being said, uh, on launch is your normal event. Uh, that's what you're going to get. That's the message that will happen uh, if the user taps on your application from the start screen. Uh, it's the normal standard flow. Uh, all of these other activations, and I don't, this probably isn't a complete list. Um, in fact, I know it's not. Uh, there's other activations as well. but. These are mutually exclusive to on launch and mutually exclusive to each other. Uh, whereas in iOS, you saw we had a path that was uh, like the same, even if it was a URL. Uh, we got certain messages that happened despite the fact that there was no URL or was a URL. Here, we, can, we get messages per activation. So if you get activated by a file picker contract, uh, you'll get the file activated or message. And what you'd want to do here is not do any of the restoration of state or saving of state. Uh, you'd want to do something totally different that is specific to that contract. Yep. And you don't have to handle. So this is if you're implementing the contract. If right, you're right. not implementing the contract, then none of this will fire, and you'll have a very trivial on launch the way you have in iOS. Right. Absolutely. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. There's a. This is not compulsory by any means. The only one that is compulsory is on launched. Uh, the rest of these are opt in, and you'll never get these messages unless you declare them in the contracts tab of that manifest. Yep. All right. So. All right. That's background, or that's activations. Now we're on to background tasks. So this is a contract, uh, as we talked about earlier. It is a, it's what you use to basically stay alive in the background kind of thing. Uh, so this is, example apps would be like Skype or something, uh, where you're chatting and you want real-time communication, 
or mail if you want it to keep updated, uh, get or like a text messaging application even if you want to get push notifications. Right. So this is a screenshot of the manifest editor again. And here it's just showing that we've added a background task as a contract. Uh, and we've specified a few different options for that. And we'll explain what all of those mean here soon. Right. So this is some code to register for a background task. Uh, there's this object called the background task builder uh, that you use to basically create your background task. Uh, it lets you specify a name, entry points. All of this needs to line up with what you specified in the manifest too. Uh, and then it also lets you specify triggers. In this case, we're specifying a time trigger of 15 minutes. Uh, and that second parameter there is one shot, uh, which is should this be repeat or should it uh, happen only once? In this case, we've specified true for one shot. Uh, and then builder set trigger, we're setting a trigger on it. And the rest of that is a condition, uh, which we're saying in addition to the trigger, uh, we also want there to be a condition on internet available. And so the way that works is if after 15 minutes when this timer trigger fires, uh, we only want our background task to run if in addition to that, there's internet available. If there's not internet available, then our trigger or our background task will be latched and run the next time there is internet available. And then finally we call register on that background task that we just created. And that registers it with WinRKey and says, Here's this background task available uh, from this namespace in class, which is, this came from a Flickr app, actually. So that's how you would register for one. And this would be the actual implementation of a background task. Uh, background tasks need to be sealed uh, because they're, you're bas they're basically WinRD components. Uh, and so what you do is uh, there's only one required method of the iBackground task interface, and that's run. Well, only one method at all because there are no optional methods. Uh, and what we're doing here is just some pretend work where we're getting something from the web, uh, could take a while, uh, we're taking it, writing it out to a file, and then we're updating a live tile. Uh, that's you know a pretty typical situation of what you'd want to do in background task. And so this, as specified earlier, would get run every 15 minutes only if there's internet available. Okay. All right, and so this is kind of a graph that should show you the really the background task structure and kind of how uh, background tasks are almost totally separate from the app and managed by the system, really. So the first step is this, is to register your trigger. That's that registration code we just saw. Uh, and basically, we set that up. And then we also register the class with the trigger. Uh, that's like the manifest that we saw, uh, where you specify the entry point there that has to line up with the registration of the trigger and code. Uh, and then after you've done that, it's waiting. Uh, the system will then decide whether or not to fire a trigger. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, the conditions and, la uh, conditions and triggers have been met and satisfied, uh, the background task is launched. Okay, and so there are a lot of different types of triggers uh, for background tasks, and there's also this uh, distinction between lock screen apps and non-lock screen apps. Uh, by default, lock screens are, they're given much more, or lock screen apps, these are things that can show icons and badges on the lock screen. Uh, they're given much more priority over non-lock screen apps, because the idea being that if you're on the lock screen, uh, you, you know, the user's gonna see that a lot more often. They should say more updated, uh, updated frequently. And so the time trigger, push notification trigger, and control channel trigger, these are all triggers that require lock screen access. And lock screen access is something that you also uh, clarify or specify in your uh, manifest. Uh, so you can't be on the lock screen uh, unless it's specified in the manifest. And then in addition to that, the user has to opt in to putting your app on the lock screen. Uh, they can remove it at any time, and you're by no means guaranteed access to be on the lock screen. There's only seven apps in the lock screen per user. Mm -hmm. So it's a priority against Skype, Mail, all kinds of other apps. Right. So I, I would probably you know, not make an app that requires, relies on the fact that it's on a lock screen or something like that. Uh, so you know, we have these time trigger, push notification trigger, control channel trigger. Uh, the first two are pretty obvious. Control channel trigger is uh, basically what Skype's going to be using uh, or any sort of real-time communication application. Then our non-lock screen triggers, uh, we can, these are things we can hook into that are called system triggers uh, that let you run when certain events happen. Um, and these don't require that you be on the lock screen. So for example, if the internet becomes available, be notified of that. Uh, and then the rest of these are all fairly obvious. Yeah. And on top of that, this is not an exhaustive list of triggers. Uh, these are just the most frequently used ones. There's some other obscure ones too. So in addition uh, to all of those other constraints, there's even more constraints because these are battery powered devices, uh, low energy, that kind of thing. So background tasks are constrained uh, both in how frequently they can run and in how much they can do. Uh, so there's a CPU quota that if your app is not on the lock screen, you get one second of CPU time. And again, this is CPU time, not real time. Uh, so one second of CPU time is actually a pretty reasonable amount of time. Uh, you can get a lot done then. And that does not count if you're waiting. Uh, like if you have a HTTP connection, 
and you're waiting on something or for the result to come back, uh, that does not count towards your CPU time because that thread's sleeping. Uh, and so you get one second of the CPU usage every two hours if you're not on the lock screen. And if you're on the lock screen, you get two seconds every 15 minutes. It's pretty simple. Uh, and then in addition, there's a cellular and Wi-Fi quotas. This is an example Wi-Fi quota. It's, there's a formula that you can look up to roughly figure out what, might, what it might be. Uh, but this would be uh, one megabit per second, like real download speed on battery connection. Um, you know, your data limit will be like 0.469 megs if you're not on the lock screen, which isn't really that much. Uh, or if you're on the lock screen, every 15 minutes for a total of 45 megs daily, and then 0.625 megs every two hours, because that's your refresh time if you're not on the lock screen for a total of 7.5 megs daily. And again, as soon as you connect to a power source, uh, these quotas are lifted. All right, well, so that was pretty much it. Uh, just to kind of recap, we went over the app package and model, which was basically just everything from the manifest to what's actually packaged. Uh, then we talked about the process lifecycle, that's state, uh, basically everything you're gonna wanna do, you wanna do in suspending, uh, and you're on suspending of handler for that. Right? And then background tasks, which basically lets you keep your app updated fresh and stay alive. Yeah. Yep, and I think one thing that you touched on that um, we're not gonna touch on this anywhere else, but um, we talked about the app model, and we kind of have one foreground app, mm -hmm. but technically we are multitasking, like, you know, there's times when you have multiple apps, you, you can have multiple apps running. That's right. Um, so you, for example, show them snap to you, which is where you have one app that's snapped and one app that's in, you know, kind of the field mode. Um, so you can see that, um, so, so this is truly multitasking. You have to be aware of that and you have to implement it such that um, your app behaves the right way. Right. So, for example, here you have weather and the store app in Hera. Right. Both of these um, apps are in the running state right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and the same thing that we have is you have to look at re-entrancy re because um, the other time when you have two apps running, kind of, is when we, which we'll talk about next, will be when we get into contracts. Right. Um, and where you have one app and it's sharing against another app, or even you could have one app and it's sharing against itself, and then you end up with two instances of the app running. Um, so this is truly multitasking, something you should be aware of because it's different from the iOS world. Right. Like, see, um, this little charm that just opened up on the side now, this is actually the mail app that's providing the look and feel of all of this. So exactly. both of these are in the running state right now. Yep, right? Exactly. Because they, they're both technically in the foreground as well. Yep. Right. You're only not in the running state when you're not in the foreground, although the start menu doesn't count for that. <laughs> uh, the, both of those apps are still in the running state, even though the start menu is on top of them. Good. All right. Um, I don't see any open questions. I saw some, but I think they're closed now. Um, so I don't see any open questions. So I yep. think we take a break now, and then we'll come out for a double header where we do um, contracts and notification in half, like half an hour each, and you know we get them done in one hour. Um, so we can be back in ten minutes, right? Sounds good. Right. Thanks, guys. Welcome back. Um, we're into the contract session now, um, near the end of the day, three to go. Um, and this one's a short one, so hopefully we'll be able to um, get people through quickly and move on to notifications. So, um, I, you know, whenever I talk to people about contract, I like to begin by telling them mostly where contracts came from and where Microsoft was designed for as we um, talk about Windows 8. Um, and what we saw was that most, can you switch us to the slides? Sorry. Um, that most apps have, you know, rich content that the users want to either find or share or save and enhance, um, you know, saving one app and enhancing, you know, into that app, in that app and share it back or something like that. So, so there's always this kind of innate notion that no app is an island. Um, and as Eric talked during the application model, we do have this high confidence requirement where we don't let apps talk to each other. So we wanted safe ways for the apps to communicate and collaborate as we went. Um, and that's kind of how Contract was born. Um, a contract to app is nothing but app to app communication, and there's kind of two different types of contracts that, that I can th that that we I think of as two different types of contracts. The first one is, for example, um, file open, save, picker contract, which you're going to see in a minute. And these are kind of declare on the manifest. There's a lot more interaction and back and forth. Um, and then we have these other um, contracts that I call extensions, where, for example, I can do autoplay or file activation and protocol handling. Right, these are ones, the extension ones are very similar to what you have in iOS, where um, from within one application, you can just do a file activation um, against anybody that will, that's willing to handle that file extension or anything like that. Um, but they fail, they, they file open, save, search, etc. are kind of more intricate contra um, contracts. And we're growing those in 8.1, where we're introducing uh, a contacts card, and we're also giving you access to calendar. Um, so you can see the paradigm will continue to evolve and will continue to enhance as, as we go. So um, with that, let me give you a little bit of sense of what contracts is. So I'm going to go right here to the start screen, and let's just start with mail. That's a good example for showing a lot of things. So here I have my mail. Um, and for example, here I had this email from Eric that I was going to show earlier before we had a network connection. Um, and um, 
Um, I can just click on this link right here, and you'll see that the email application just did a file activation against the Big New Ranch website. Right? And you see, actually, there's a contract here where the mail application knows or has you know, kind of a sense of how much space it's going to need afterwards. So it's kind of delegating half of the screen. Um, so with 8.1, in 8.0, you don't have control over how much space. With 8.1, with Windows 8.1, you actually can say, oh, make me really small or make me medium or you know, give me a specific size. And this is the simplest one, this file activation. There honestly is nothing here that this application knows about just launching the file. All it's going in there and it's launching the file URI, and then whoever is you know, registered to handle that URI is taking care of it. Um, so this is one example. This is the simplest example of something that you would do. Now, things get a little more interesting, for example, here, where um, I'm in this URI, I'm in the Bigner Ranch website. If I wanted to share this URI, I could just come back here. Um, and from within here, let's just go make a full screen here. And from, from within here, I can come back and say, oh, let me send this URL to somebody. Um, you know, for example, I can come back here um, and just say, I'm going to share this um, on Twitter. Um, and this is really interesting because now Internet Explorer knows nothing about Twitter. They don't know about the 140 characters. They don't know about the OAuth. They don't know anything about that. Um, in fact, if I go back here, you'll see that I probably have two or three Twitter apps. I have Twitter. I have Rowie. Um, usually I have Twitro. Uh, and all of these applications can connect and post to Twitter. So here I can just choose. Um, and all I'm doing is implementing a share contract. So my it, you know, IE is becoming a share source to uh, the share target that is any kind of Twitter app that can go back. Um, I can do the exact same thing. This is full circle, right? So I'm right here in IE. We start with mail, so I can also open up mail and send an email that has this link, right? So I can, you know, send it to somebody else and go full circle where I started in mail, went to IE, and then now I'm out. Um, so that's kind of where you're coming from with regards to sharing. Um, another contract that we have, um, which this one's evolving, I'm actually running 8.1. Um, so in 8.1, slightly different from what you see in 8.0 is that um, is a search contract. Um, the search contract is pretty simple. Um, Windows always has right here on our terms. Um, this is our terms window. That's what we call it. That's the term that we use. Um, and you'll see our start menu here. you see settings. Um, um, and then there's always a search um, option here. And from this thing, you can do, from this, from this search option, you can do two things. The first one is I just launch share. And here I can search everywhere. Now, in 8.1, this is evolving. In the 8.0, what we used to see is whenever I type search here, I, for example, will start doing help. And I would see a list of all the applications that were handling search down here, and any of those applications could be launched. Um, this is something similar or here where you see the health and fitness app. We're doing this, what search is doing now is search got more streamlined. We're kind of changing our search design um, and got more streamlined. Here what we're doing is it's first searching applications, then it's searching all my file systems. Oops, um, and I clicked on, um, then it's searching my file system, um, and then um, it's actually um, afterwards it's searching uh, for regular terms um, and around. So for example, here if I do search, I'll get these new kind of search results. We call them the hero. Um, these are the search results, and here you see it's listing all the applications. Um, so I could launch an application uh, from here and pass that. Um, it's launching all my file system. It's looking at my photos. Um, it's searching on Bing. Um, and you can see the interesting thing, the evolution of search now is this. Um, I'm right here within the Hero app and the results, and you'll see, for example, I found Wikipedia. Um, and it knows that I have the Wikipedia app installed. So from that search window, um, I've actually just open Wikipedia with that health parameter and everything else. In 8.0, you would go straight into the app. But what we heard from users was that, hey, you know, when I go in and I look at search, when I search for a term, I have these 25 apps that can return me the right result, and I'm not really visualizing which one's going to be the right one. So I kind of do a lot of trial and error. I click on the wrong one, click on the other one, um, and with this new you know, search hero, which applications can actually connect into, you'll be able to connect into it, and now the user is more in control and it's streamlined their search process, their uh, productivity, uh, the effectiveness of the search. Um, so this one's evolving a little bit, but those are a couple of examples of contracts that we have. Um, and the last one, I'll go back here to um, mail, and I'll show you the last one, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and here what I'm doing is I'm going to create a new contract, uh, a new um, email, and I'll just send it to Sean. Um, and what I want to do is I want to add a file. Um, so what you'll see here is, that, for example, let's say I want to add a file. I'm within the mail application, and we have this thing called file open picker and file save picker. Right? So this file open contract and file save. So here I want an attachment. So I can click on mail, attachments. Um, and you'll see, well, this is on the, you know, something else. So this is actually launching an application that's in the system that I can pick files from. Uh, so this is one of the SDK samples. Um, but you can see here, normally when you do a file picker, where uh, when you try to pick a file, you will get something that looks like this. Right? You get the file system with, oh, navigate to your file system and go do that. Now, here I actually hit through the file open picker contract. Um, there's applications that are implemented in the contract, like SkyDrive. Right, so this is a SkyDrive application. The operating system knows nothing about connecting to SkyDrive or Dropbox. Right, so I can click SkyDrive right here, um, and this is the SkyDrive application owning that user experience and navigating my content. So, for example, here I can go to iOS Day, and I added a small file for the demo yesterday. Um, I can just attach here, and that file just came from SkyDrive. 
So Mail, who knows nothing to connect about how to connect to SkyDrive, can actually go in there and get a file from SkyDrive. I could add another attachment here where, for example, um, this time I you know, go into Dropbox. right? So I can go back here and pick a file from Dropbox. Um, so let's see. Um, let's just find a little one. So, and most of these files are not there, so I, I won't attach it because most of these are going to be large. They're Illustrator and Design files. But um, what you see there is I just connected to Dropbox, and I can go back and attach the files and do everything else. And Mail knows nothing about connecting to Dropbox or SkyDrive or any of those things. He just knows that, oh, I can go in there and call into this file picker, um, and whoever is implementing the contract is going to do it for me. Right. Right? So this is the content of having these apps be connected. And, and from a developer perspective, the, uh, the developers can write their apps so that they can uh, explicitly provide uh, you know, search results to the, to the Search Hero app to let it know that you know, this is the content that I have that matches your search request. They can write apps that you know, say, I'm willing to uh, receive shared content of this type, you know, images, text, etc., so that, that any app that has that content can share it to your app and can provide files that are within its application, you know, users' files that they have saved within its own little application sandbox, but it can provide them to other apps to say, you can open you know, these files just as if it was a file system, and also allow itself to have files saved to it as if it was a file system from other apps. And uh, so that, that's very powerful because they're formalized ways brokered by the operating system, by the Windows runtime, uh, that lets your apps do this. Yep, exactly. Um, so um, let me show you here real quick. Um, if I'm just showing you a manifest now on the screen. Um, and what you see here is this just a shared target application. Um, and I'm just going to show you this before I go back to the slides so that we don't have to jump back and forth. And what you see here is this is my application manifest, as Eric showed you earlier. Uh, and here I have all kinds of available declarations of all the things that are contracts that I can pick. Uh, so for example, again, we talked about the protocol search, right? If you're going to handle FTP or if you're going to handle PDF or something like that, you can find a protocol and then they'll just launch your, uh, your application. And those are easy. Um, all of those are pretty easy because um, file type association, protocols, et cetera, somebody just launches onto you and there's not a lot that you have to know. They just call onto the shell and say, launch this file. Um, and you know, your application doesn't have to do a lot of work. Um, the other ones that I said again, you know, share, um, search, those are the ones that I'm going to give you examples so you see an idea of what are the principles behind implementing contracts and you see how easy it is to implement the contract. So, but before I go in there, I did want to give you um, a sense because I'm going to cover three contracts and there's like right here there's on this list, there's 10 or more than 10. Um, so again, a lot of these like file type associations or protocols, these are nothing but a little configuration option. So um, you just click on it uh, and then you'll configure um, a couple settings and then you'll be able to go. Um, the ones that you have to write code, I'll give you the patterns right here. Um, this is kind of my um, interpretation of the patterns that we always um, you know, do. First of all, in a lot of contracts, there's kind of two parties involved. There's a source and a target, because that's when you're sharing data with another. Um, without just launching them, that's when you're sharing data. So there's a source and a target. Um, and then I kind of looked at it from, um, hey, there's a design time behavior or kind of a compile time, like what you do before you ship your app, and then there's a runtime behavior on what has to execute when you ship your app. You're obviously writing all of your code at compile time, uh, but you know that's something that kind of the way I think about it. So um, the patterns that I see a lot is um, sources don't have to do a lot of work. Um, like on a design time or a compile time, um, they don't have to do a lot of work. They don't declare anything. Targets tend to have to declare something on the manifest. So if you're a search, if you do search, or if you do a shared target or, you know, um, something like that, you declare on the manifest. Um, and then often you have to write a um, user interface. So you saw that file picker contract where I showed you that was, that was SkyDrive UI. You saw the whole screen turn blue, right? That's SkyDrive UI that's executed. If I show you a search contract again, or a search contract again, some of those you have to write the UI for. So this is stuff that you do as you prepare. Um, and then a runtime, what happens? So you declare it out in the manifest, you write your code, and then a runtime, what's going to happen is everything always begins with a source. Um, so a source is listening for an event to do something. Right, whether it's sharing or um, search or anything like that. Um, and the source will listen in there and fill the data. Um, so you know, some data will happen. Let's say I want to share a file with you. I'm listening there. The user clicks on a button, and then it's like, oh, I'm ready to share. Um, and I fill in some structure, fill in the data, do the work there. And then the target will be activated. Eric talked about activated, and he gave you a list of like 12 different reasons why we activate apps um, and different paths that we use to activate apps. Most of, that, most of those were contracts. Right. Um, and that's just us passing you the, you know, the parameters. Kind of, um, did launch with options where you can look at the parameter there and you're like, oh, here, this is, this is how you were launched. Um, it's very straightforward. But usually once you handle that activation, then you have to do something to process the data. Maybe show a, a target screen or show a, you know, search results or kind of what I call pick and basket from the file picker. Um, so this is kind of what you have to do every time. And then when you're done, you always have to report event completion so that the transaction kind of ends. Um, and again, the one thing to look at is when this kind of uh, you know things are happening, something you don't see is usually there's something in the system in the middle that is you know brokering the communications between the two of them. These are not there's never a scenario here where 
target and source are talking to each other directly. They're in process and talking to each other directly. There's always something in the middle. We call them brokers, and they're doing um, kind of the proxying back and forth um, to make sure that everybody's safe and the user is, has high confidence. Um, here's an example of declaring some contracts in the manifest. I showed you those earlier. Um, again, it's just a matter of configuring a few things. It's all XML. It's the exact same manifest that Eric showed you. Um, so let me walk you through um, kind of the, taking that theory of here, these are five steps that we do. Here's kind of what happens when we do um, a share, right? Um, so if you're looking at share and you're just a source app. So now one thing with regards to sharing, uh, you can be a source or a target app or both. Um, so you can say, look, I just got a lot to say. I'm going to share, but I don't really want to listen to anybody. So I'm not going to take, you know, files or content from anybody. Um, so I'm not going to be a share target. Um, so you see kind of what happens here. The source app is just registering from a data transfer manager event. You'll see in a minute, receives the event, fills in the data. Um, and then, you know, gives it to the operating system, um, and then um, the operating system passes on to the target app, which is activated for sharing, processes the data package that the share source, um, you know, supplied, and then reports complete, right? And in between, there's some user experience there that's done by the operating system, you know, that um, the user um, doesn't have to worry about, right? Um, so here's in code, just to give you an example, um, and this is a very, very straightforward. Doing, being a share source is very straightforward. Um, in fact, in 8.1, one of the things that we've added is um, your screenshot. By default, we give you, if, if you're not declared at your share source, um, we can do the screenshot, and then users can share a screenshot. So you kind of have a, oh, let's share the screenshot of what I was doing in this app. Like, I just won. I just own you on this game, and I broke your record. Um, you're laughing, but you know, I know people that do that. Not me. Not <laughs> no, me, but people do not. that, you know? Um, so, um, so here's simple, right? You just you know, subscribe to this data transfer manager, um, and you handle the data requested event. Um, and then you fill in your data. Um, and I'm not, this is not all the options for data. There's a lot more, but you can put in title, descriptions, and you can put in many different formats like text or HTML or image or just a file. Um, so this is not giving you the whole thing because I needed to keep it to a page. There's other formats and they're sensible. Um, and then when you're doing here, you can provide more than one format and you should provide as many as you can because what we do there is with whatever you provide, we look at the formats and then we go back and look at the list of applications that are installed and we say, oh, these are the possible targets. Right. So if you list five formats, you're going to get, you know, you'll 10 ma targets. You'll maximize the if number If you list, you know, one targets. format, you only get three targets. So yeah, maximize is the right, the fancier word. Um, <laughs> Now, share target is kind of, um, the first thing that you do is declare on the manifest, and I skip that step right here. So uh, step zero, or step one is declare on the manifest. Uh, step two is, um, you know, kind of like handle the activation. Um, and for SAML C Sharp apps, you actually get overrides of the application um, class, which is equivalent of app delegate. Um, and you see here we have on share target activated. Uh, and from here, all I have to do is I look at the share operation, and then I start exploring its properties. And I can kind of uh, explore, like, hey, what kind of content do you have? Do you have a web link? Do you have, um, I kind of repeated the bug here. I copy and paste the same thing. I was going to do two formats. Do um, so you see that I, did, I repeated a bug here? I just said standard formats with a link and web link again. But I can search for the other formats, like custom, um, text, async, you know, get item storage. So I can, te I can test against the format and then handle it. And then, very, very important, you have to report completed. Um, so this is your shared target app. Um, and it's literally that simple to become a shared target. You're just inspecting it. And there's a little bit of work, obviously. Once you have the content, you got to do something with it, save it. Uh, for the most part, with a shared target, you save it so the user can use it later. Um, I do want to show you a quick demo of a shared target. This is just an SDK sample, but I want to give you tips on debugging these things because that's, that's where the interesting stuff is. Um, the code is very straightforward. Um, so here I have my shared target application, um, and I'm going to debug in the simulator. Um, I highly, like, if you're looking at the charms here, this is what we call light this maze. As soon as I click elsewhere, that thing goes away. Um, and so are the charms, like when the search, you know, or the, or the share comes, comes, comes out, um, those are also like this maze. So um, mm -hmm. what I highly recommend to people is when you're going to debug one of the um, contracts, do it on the simulator. Um, so here I'm going to go into the simulator. I'm going to set debug for the simulator, and I'm going to go, uh, and I'm going to look for share target properties, um, and I'll give you a, a, the tip that, you know, that makes this interesting is I'm going to say, um, you know, my target is a simulator, and the one magic thing is right here, do not launch for share. Uh, what that's going to do is that it's going to be ready listening, but it's not going to launch the application. Normally, when we're debugging, we immediately launch the application, and then all the stuff happens, and, you know, we kind of launch, we're in control. But with some of these contracts, you're kind of waiting for somebody else to do an action and then take out, you know, a call you on it. Mm -hmm. So what you do here is just click do not launch, and then what's happening is it's going to look broken. I'm um, going to launch the simulator. Um, and um, it's going to come back here, and you see here, for example, I like to see that app, and nothing happened. My app says tells me in the debugging, but I'm not seeing any action. Um, and the reason for it is because nobody shared anything with my app yet. Um, so I, I was I actually had that sample that I um, that I just deleted. Um, is a shared target um, source application, so I got a shared source here, um, and it's just a little sample that I can use to ch to share like an image or just text or link. Um, so let's just go back here, click on um, let's just do the simplest one, which is text. Um, and then the data package title is going to be test, just so you see that it's real. 
and I add, I'm adding a description, and then I'm going to go ahead and share. Um, and here I'm sharing. It's bringing up all the applications that can handle text. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the operating system doing the work. And you see a shared target sample there, which is the one we're debugging into. And that's going to that's going to activate the app, and the debugger will take over and let you exactly. debug it. So uh, assuming I left any breakpoints there, um, you'll see that shared target is launched, and then now I got my own shared target activated, which was step two. Um, and then from here, I can just run, and you'll see that here I'm expecting inspecting um, the package. So you'll see all the available formats you can see here. Data description, package name, logo, data square logo, thumbnail, uh, quick link ID. There's all kinds of interesting stuff that I could share. And here I'm starting to expect the formats, right? And then I'm just sharing or saving the data for later. Um, so that's what the shared target application does. Uh, so I'm just going to say continue um, and then let this run. Um, and then I'll go back here. Um, and again, it's important that you report completed. Uh, if you don't report completed, the next time I try to share, I might run into an error or I might get into this undetermined state. And usually for that, you end up having to kind of um, restart your application and shut down um, everything there so that you can kind of clear that up. Um, we also have this concept of a quick link, which is kind of um, when, when you share, sometimes you want a shortcut. Like if I email you a lot, um, the mail application can say, oh, you want a quick link to um, Sean so that you can continue to email him. And the next time I go into share, I'll see that email application will have mail, and then you'll have a couple of quick links where I can say mail to Sean directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are custom to your application, so, um, so you can implement one of those if you want. So there, I did a report completed, and I'm done with the sharing. Um, and it's that simple. If you look at these, there's not a lot of code. Um, and think about the flexibility that you get out of it, right? Being able to not have to write code to go to Twitter, Facebook, High Five, all the networks right there. LinkedIn, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of power for developers to not have to write any of that code. Right on, um, on iOS, a lot of developers are essentially using Dropbox as a back end to pass files around to each other. And this way, you can pass files directly between apps through the operating system. You don't yep. you don't have to go over the internet. Yep, exactly. So yeah, you'll see that in a minute as we go. Uh, I'll talk about it. And you saw it earlier when I showed you uh, file contracts. Um, and we're going to show you how to implement a file contract here. Um, so the next one we have is search. Um, and the beauty of search is that it makes your application reachable from anywhere in the system, right? The search is always there. It's kind of what I would say it's one swipe away. So you swipe, you type search, and now you can launch your application and get results out of it. And even with the new hero screenshot, you have the ability to have your, you know, if you have great results, surface and, you know, take over. So there's a lot of relevance there. Um, this is what search looked like in 8.0. Um, my, again, I'm running it once, so I no longer have it. But it used to be that I could come back here and just say type search. Um, and then you'll see a couple of things. You have suggestions. Um, so the bottom, like the bottom over here, which is weather, weather channel, weather channel. Um, dot com and web development. These are kind of suggestions where I've been passed on to Bing and Bing saying, hey, do you want to hear some suggestions? Um, you can also provide results. So you'll see right here that, you know, they're already setting the weather in Redmond is 70. Um, so it must have been July because that's the only time when the weather is 70 and sunny. Um, and, then, um, and then you also see the list of applications from what we had before. These are all applications. In 8.0, they're just listed. Again, in 8.1, we move all these lists down to the hero shot. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what you're getting. Um, so you have your search box, you have all the apps that are implemented and the query suggestions and the result suggestions um, as you go. So um, how do you implement this with regards to code? Very, very simple. Um, you handle OnSearch activated. Uh, so you declare on the manifest, you have to do that. Uh, you handle OnSearch activated, um, and there you're going to be passed an ARCS, and the ARCS has the query tag. So it's just, you know, a little string that you can then search against, and you can have spaces on it. Um, so it's actually, um, you know, but it's still a string. Uh, and then you implement the query submitted event handler. If you want to um, kind of like, you know, handle it when they type enter, then you'll go ahead and handle it, produce your results, and then you just provide the results. It's very, very simple. Um, you can also provide here, I'm providing suggestions. Um, as you saw on the weather app, the four lines of web suggestions and the results, you can actually just append them onto this collection, and that's how easy it is to, um, to handle search. Um, it's very, very simple. Um, there's nothing to it. Um, so you can see here, um, like line by line, how I'm appending the Spain suggestions. Um, and I'm giving it an image with the result and everything else that's needed, right? again, to get that experience where you saw um, the sunny um, in Redmond. Um, um, I already mentioned in the demo of these already. So um, in Canvas, for in 8.1, what we're going to expect people to do is in Canvas search. So you still can implement the search contract, and you can be in Canvas. Uh, just have a search box. We, are, we have a new control called search box, which you can use. And then you'll implement search within your Canvas. Um, and then you will have also system results from within your search. Um, and as of right now, we haven't, we haven't docu fully documented how you integrate with the hero search. Uh, this is something we just launched in 8.1 like two weeks ago at Build. Uh, so I haven't seen the full documentation, but there will definitely be the ability for people to integrate with the hero shot. Um, if you want to see what that experience looks like, and I no longer remember if I showed this earlier, but uh, if I go here into the hero shots and I so search, um, you'll see, um, again, I can come back here to search for health. Uh, and for example, for prototyping, there were some apps that do have, for example, Wikipedia. Um, so when I'm clicking there on that result, I'm actually launching the full Wikipedia. This is the app and the native experience and the great, you know, um, touch and everything else that I would have out of the app. This is not the website. Um, so that's an example of how we're going to integrate onto the hero shot. Right? Um, 
So, cool. Um, so that's it for search. Um, and then the last one I want to talk to you is the file picker contracts. And you saw me, that's the one where I did a load and save from the files. I did my attachments on emails with the file picker. Um, and they're very, very straightforward here. Here's kind of the workflow. Um, the user is calling file open picker. Um, and then from your file picker, the operating system is kind of loading the defaults and doing the right things. Um, and then pretty much you have to implement that UI so the user can pick a file from you if they're picking a file from you. Um, so you kind of like write a user interface that um, implements what I call the basket, where you show all that, those file dialog, all the files that we had in Dropbox or anything like that. Um, so it's very, very simple. Um, and then eventually um, the user completes the async call as you go. So um, they'll pick the location, you know, they'll pick the file, and then that file gets transferred um, onto the other application. Right? Um, implementing a file picker is very simple. You'll see the exact same pattern here. Um, declare on the manifest, handle activation, and then do a little bit of the work. Um, so this is very, very simple. Um, here I left the populating the basket out because this was a grid view and there's a lot more UI. You're not, you don't have to do a grid view. That's kind of standard visualization um, that most people use. So um, you saw that both uh, SkyDrive and Dropbox had a kind of a grid view with just files. Um, you could do something nicer or something different if, you, if it's applicable to your app. Uh, but all you're doing is implement the on file open picker activated. Um, and then later on, when the user selects a file, you provide the file. So you just say search file equals, and then you get the file that they've selected. Um, in this case, a hard coded path. Um, and then you go to the file picker open UI and add the file onto it, and that's it. Um, you're done right there with file picker. Um, there's, you know, there's limited time. They're all, they become very repetitive. So what I did here is I said, look, here's a contract cheat sheet. Um, and I say, look, uh, what I told you is, hey, you know, if you implement this contract, do you have to declare on the manifest? Um, do you have to handle activation? And in some cases, I said, do you have a Visual Studio template? I didn't demo this but, uh, because I gave you the shared target that's already written. Mm -hmm. But if you go into Visual Studio and I say that um, you're in, in your SAML and you say add new uh, page, you can do an add, uh, you know, and implement the shared target contract or the search contract, and it gives you a template for the results and gives you everything wired up. Um, so we give you templates here for share target or search or file open and file save. So that, gives, that does a lot of the work. Um, and they get repetitive otherwise. So you'll see here where we have a template. And then I also um, kind of gave you uh, what I call the jumpstart, which I told you, hey, if you want to learn about search, go to, you know, go look at windowsapplication.model.search. That's the namespace that uh, all the classes are going to be in. So I kind of gave you the shortcuts here um, so I wouldn't have to repeat it. Um, I also added a couple references here um, where I can say um, the app contract. Um, I added references for the full documentation for contracts and extensions. Um, I also added uh, the session and building apps that work together. Um, and then the updates for search, where are coming, both of them are coming at once. These are recent videos of sessions we just had built two weeks ago, and they're good updates on everything that's not already listed on the app contracts page on our developer center. Um, so that's it for contracts. It's very easy, very powerful. Everybody I talk to on iOS is like, they love that feature. They're, they're like, this is something that iOS should have. Um, you know, for example, Android has intents and other ways that they collaborate that are closer. So, um, so it's kind of a, a model that, that people are kind of embracing. So. Okay, so we're going to talk about live tiles and notifications on Windows 8. And so in this session, we're going to talk about tiles, and tiles are uh, the what's on the Windows Start screen. Uh, instead of just a static grid of icons, uh, you get to see uh, large, multicolored, uh, image-laden tiles that are actually alive with, with data from your apps. Uh, also, there are secondary tiles, which you can think of as just as there's you can bookmark a web page deep within the hierarchy of a website. You can think of a secondary tile as a bookmark deep into the content of your app that, that can be pinned to the start screen. The user can click that secondary tile and be taken right to that area of your application. And we'll also talk about notifications on Windows, which lets the, uh, uh, the user be notified of events that are going on either locally from, from the app, from the Windows system, or over the internet from uh, some push notification service. We'll also talk a bit about Windows Azure mobile services as one of those services. And finally, we'll talk about lock screen integration, which uh, lets an application uh, put you know, badge and notification information on the lock screen. So live tiles and notifications. Windows notifications are similar to Apple's uh, iOS model. You can have badges, you can have local notifications, and you can have push notifications. Uh, badges are simply little, little round uh, number indications uh, on the uh, tile that look like, uh, you know, just looks like a, a red circle, lets the user know that eh, this app has 
you know, five unread messages, five unseen messages, and so forth. Uh, local notifications are notifications that come from the local system, from the local app, and then push notifications uh, come over the internet. The, uh, the little bit of extra ability on Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 is live tiles. Your application tile on the start screen can display content from within the app rather than just a static text or image. And that lets a weather app, for example, update its tile with current weather conditions rather than just showing a, a static uh, sunrise image or so forth. Uh, and the live tiles can be used as your business card or the first impression. It's a differentiator in that if you make wise use of the live tile to display good information on the app tile in a way that's uh, attractive to the user and gives them information, and your competitor doesn't or they don't display it in a very uh, useful way, or maybe if they display it in an annoying way, it's a big differentiator. It draws people to your app, and uh, if your app uses advertising or in-app purchases you know, for monetization, the more times people enter your app, the larger there is a chance that you'll be seeing some revenue. So Jaime's going to do a demo. Um, yeah, can you move to this screen? <laughs> so this is not a big demo. All I wanted to show you was kind of what a start screen looks like. And the reason we're doing it on this machine is because I'm running 8.1. Um, and the machine that we're projecting on that side is 8.0. Uh, but what you see here is just live tiles all over the screen. So you see right here, um, for example, my mail application. So first of all, you see the four sizes of tiles that we have in Windows 8.1. This is the smaller size. Um, this is um, kind of our medium. This is the wide and the large. Um, and anywhere right here, when I click on, for example, um, this uh, application right here, um, I can go back and resize the tiles. So I can go back here and say, you know, this is, you know, right now it's large, make it just wide. Right? And then you see that it kind of um, trickles a different effect. It's using the different templates. You might see that all these templates or all these um, you know, tiles look a little similar. It's because we have predefined templates, which John's going to mention. Um, so we have their cycling at system, like the system is controlling how often they cycle. The system is controlling, uh, or you choose your template, but the system is controlling how often they cycle so that we don't consume too many resources and so that things are not just kind of fighting for attention uh, within what you have here. Um, and what you see here is just a live screen with, uh, again, the four different tiles, the four different tiles right here. Um, you see I've been here all day, so right now I have 99 emails or more, 99 plus. Uh, that's probably since lunch um, right here, um, you know, from people who have who've sent me some emails, so my, that's my batch right here. You see that there's different formats for the templates, like for example, this one has a little um, icon right here. Some of them have the name of the app, so there's a lot of flexibility. There's, there's a lot, a lot of templates. Um, and again, you see the four sizes, so you see the large tile right here that's coming in at one. Um, and you're in control, like when you ship your app, you should ship as many icons of those as you can. Um, and then the user is in control with, uh, you know, what size are going to show. Um, and the last thing that we tell people is um, if you have a white tile or if you're expecting to, um, the user to use a white tile, make sure that it's alive, right? So, for example, right now, like I have um, games right here and it's not doing it. It's not doing much. Or the store, um, it's not doing much. It's a demo machine, so I haven't launched this as many. There's no there's not activity going on there. Um, so if you ship your application by default, you want to be white, um, make sure that your tile is live. Um, because otherwise it's kind of wasted space there to have that ability without anything um, anything else. And, and if the user doesn't want your tile to be live on their system, they're in control. They can turn yep. the live tile off yep, and exactly. return to the static tile. Yep. So here I can, uh, and they can unpin you anytime they want. So that's another thing where um, here I can unpin this application, which will remove it from the start menu altogether. Um, I can uninstall the application if I wanted to, or I can resize this tile, for example. This one's not moving, so I can just go ahead and make it small. Um, the small ones, ironically, if you just give us the medium tile, we will make the small one for you. We will just automatically shrink. That's why you're seeing here, there's some 8.0 apps here that, um, you know, these apps haven't been updated. Because in 8.0, we only had two sides of tiles. We had these right here. We had the medium um, and the wide. Um, in 8.1, we're introducing this little one, the small one, and we're introducing the large. Um, so that's just kind of what we have for tiles. Um, and that gives you kind of an idea of everything that's with tiles. So, go ahead. Okay. So... If you can put my, there we go. So here are an example of the different file or tile templates that exist in the system. It's not inclusive. And in fact, I think there are about 48 of them in Windows 8, and there's probably more in Windows 8.1. I haven't yep. seen the exact number. So there's a, there's a large number of different kinds of tiles. Uh, you can display you know, an image you know, all across the tile. You can display a, an image and various kinds of text of different size and different number of lines. You can display uh, images that are uh, kind of a collage of images that uh, even change over time. Uh, you can have several sets of images that cycle uh, from one image to the next over periods of time. So there's, there's just a, a large number of different templates that uh, you, know, you could find to, to use what you need. Well, let's go back, take a look at that. So here's, here's an example of just kind of showing you how some of those how some of those templates cycle back and forth, and you saw that on, on the demo. 
So as Jaime said, there's, there's four sizes in Windows 8.1 and there were only two in 8.0 and they are template driven and, uh, and they can be badged, but the user's in control. They can control the size, they can control whether it's live or not, and they can totally remove you from the start screen if they, if they want to. The tiles can be updated either locally from, from within your app while it's running, uh, it can be pulled periodically, from, say from a background task, uh, or you can have a push notification uh, update the tile or the badge. So the tiles are built from an XML template, and it looks somewhat like this. And uh, this is actually f a lot more complicated than the ones I saw in 8.0, so I'm assuming this is an 8.1 uh, schema. Yep. Uh, you don't have to deal with these directly if you don't want to, but here's what they look like under the hood. And basically they, they just describe, you know, they have a template name and they describe what kind of information can be in that tile. Yep. And you really you kind of want to uh, include as many different tile sizes as possible in your, uh, in your application. That way the user can uh, display tile, your application as a tile of various different sizes and still get live action. So here's, a, here's an example of updating tile locally. There's a notification extensions uh, sample uh, library on MSDN that you can download where you can essentially just fill out a bunch of content. Uh, you have a, an iTile square 310 by 310 image uh, tile content template that you can set and you basically just hand it the text that you want, the images that you want uh, by referring to them as URIs uh, and you fill all that information out, you don't have to deal with the XML directly. Yep. And then at the end, once you're done filling out the structure with all the different kinds of tiles and the images and text that they contain, at the very bottom of the, the slide here, you, you call tile update manager, uh, the create tile data for application method and then call update on that passing in your tile content, and that's what updates the tile on, yep. the, on the start screen. Yep. And the extensions are just a little library. It's a code snippet that we give you as part of samples, and all it does is give you kind of an object-oriented, strong type, you know, set of um, APIs to update the tiles. Otherwise, you're dealing with XML. Right, and it's better to deal with strongly yeah, type structures. Yeah, you to deal with strings, so, um, so you just need to deal with um, those strong. Those are, those are optional. You can do the XML if that's what you want. You don't want. Yep. <laughs> you can also pull uh, for tile updates. You can set the, uh, the polling uh, frequency and you can give it a, a bunch of URIs that it cycles through, I'm assuming, when, uh, uh, if you know, one's available. And then again, the, the polling routine calls the uh, uh, tile update managers, create tile updater for application, but then it calls a start periodic update batch to, uh, to hand that off to the system so that it will periodically pull those URIs for tile updates. Now, at those URIs, that's where you need to have the XML, don't you? So I, well, I yeah, so use are those URIs you you got you have the XML mm -hmm. um, and the images or anything else that you might be referenced with? Yeah. Right. So that that's um, one place where you need to have the XML. Yep. Uh, those URLs you would feed the XML, or if you're using ASP.NET, the notifications extension library that we give you runs mm -hmm. or Azure. Um, mm -hmm. All of those running Azure and ASP.NET, so we give you kind of a, an they object, an, an object API model, for it. Okay. right? But if you're using PHP, then yeah, you just generate your XML and that's what you provide us back. Okay. Um, and all the polling is done by the OS, so you just tell the frequency, and then the OS will do its best to keep up. It will download the tile for you, so you don't have to write any code. You don't have to write a background task. Okay. Background task is a different way where you can um, code a tile, or you can update your tile, but you don't have to. If you just want to, you know, just do it server side, like for example, you have new offers. Um, or something like that, new content arrive, and you just want to update whatever's you know, coming down from server side, like weather, mm -hmm. um, it's easy enough to do it server side, you write less code. Right. And next we'll move on to secondary tiles. And secondary tiles, they increase your start screen presence because you have your, your main tile, your main application tile, which just launches your application to its main screen. But if you allow the user to provide secondary tiles to the start screen that deep link into the content of your app, all of a sudden you might have five or six tiles on the user's start screen that launch your app. And so again, the more, the more space you're taking up on the start screen, the more likely it is the user will be going into your app as opposed to somebody else's. Uh, the other thing is the secondary tiles, the launch leads to relevant content because it's, it's a secondary tile that the user has chosen to pin to the screen that deep links into your app's content. It's going to right where they want to be. Uh, it also supports roaming, so you can, you can pin this tile, uh, the secondary tile, onto the starter screen on one device and any other device that you're logged into with that ID will get that same secondary tile pinned to the start screen. And as before, the user is always in control of pinning and removing. You can't just write code that starts pinning thousands of secondary tiles to the user's start screen. They're always you know, prompted for approval. Uh, secondary tiles are similar. They're, they have a, uh, uh, a structure that you can fill out. And uh, so you create the secondary tile, you pass in you know, logo information, you pass in uh, uh, text, and pass in a size, and 
You also have to pass in an ID, and you have to maintain those IDs. I mean, you have to know what those IDs are so that you can later refer to them. So this is something you should probably set uh, somewhere in settings and so forth so that you can uh, access those uh, IDs later. But you basically just fill out the structure as before, and then you can request uh, creation uh, for the selection. And one of the things you can do here is when you, when you at the bottom of the uh, slide here, you see the code actually requests the creation of the secondary tile. You can pass in a UI element that you want uh, to have a pop-up that where the user will get uh, a chance to approve or, or disapprove of the creation of the tile, and you can have that pop-up uh, appear right next to a particular UI element. Because usually what happens is you're at some screen with some relevant piece of content. The user wants to put that on the pin that to the start screen. They pull up an app bar, and there's a button there that they click to uh, pin the tile. And you want the pop-up to appear near that button, so you pass in that button's UI element to this routine, and the pop-up will appear there, so it's right where they're looking at to begin with. Yep. If you can switch to this screen, I can, because uh, I forgot oh, to do that part of your demo. Sorry. Uh, we, we talked about doing that. And I, um, so here I'm in, you know, for example, I'm in the weather app, uh, and I can come back here and, you know, go home. Um, so right now I was searching for Atlanta, Georgia. But, you know, let's say um, that I'm in the weather app, and I can just search right here for something like New York. Oops. Um, and I can just search for New York um, real quick and can go find the city. It is New York, New York, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I can just find like New York uh, right here and I see the weather at 87, so it's a little hot there today. Uh, and I can right here say pin to start. And what this is doing is this will not create, so this creates what we call the secondary tile because this is not my weather icon tile, right? That one is there, that one's configured, but I can just say pin to start right here and it gives me options of, hey, what kind of tile, what size of tile do you want? For example, um, right here it's got the white tile. Um, I can choose the, you know, actual um, kind of the um, regular tile on the small tile. Um, so let's imagine that I choose this one right here and I just click pin to start. So the user is in control right there uh, with your actual pin and then I can go back to my start menu um, and you see right there, it's New York and it's a live tile now. Like you see it's got the 87 degrees and then it'll update on its own and it'll do the right thing as we go. Um, and it's got the little batch right there that you're seeing. So uh, one of the batches there um, for, the, you know, the inflammation point, that's the batch. Um, it can be badges, can be a number, or it can be a set of predefined icons. There's like 20 predefined icons that we let you use badges. Um, now the beauty of this is that if I just close search, or if I go back here to search and or to weather, um, and I'm in something else, right? So I can go back here to Atlanta, and then when I go back to the start screen, um, whenever I launch right here from New York, um, I'm going to go in there, and the weather application gets past the parameter that tells it to go to New York. That's what the shortcut is about. And the so, app. The app is navigated to the New York screen, but you can go back from there to the Atlanta screen. So it's yep. not it's not like it's totally uh, put you in a new context that has no no a link to where you were. Yep, exactly. So you can go okay. ahead back to this. Right. Okay, so now we'll talk about toast notifications. Uh, toasts are a way to notify the user about some important action that they may need to take. Uh, it's presented no matter what's going on. If you're in the application itself. It will, it will appear, it can be pushed to the application or scheduled to appear at, at some particular time in the future. And toast notifications show up as a little rectangle that slides in from the upper right hand corner of your screen that uh, displays some, some text and maybe an image telling you what's going on, what you need to do. You can uh, uh, start to take whatever action it's uh, asking you to take by clicking on it. The uh, app or the, the toast may also play a sound, it actually may loop a sound, or there's a number of different options that, uh, that it has. It can be long running, such as if you have a if you have a VoIP app and you have an incoming call, it may uh, ring, the, make the telephone ringing sound, and it may loop that over and over again for a while because you just don't want to do it for three seconds and then hang up. So and it has can be have, have sounds and uh, be scheduled. Just like with the tiles uh, and the uh, and everything else, it, it's an XML template based system. And uh, here's the example. Uh, basically, it has all of the, the features that, you know, the text, the images, uh, sounds, whether you want the sound to loop, whether you want it to be silent, uh, what particular sound you want to use, which can be either a standard Windows sound or you can have a URI to a sound file that's uh, part of your app as one of its assets. So let's move on to talk about push notifications because this is probably one of the most interesting things uh, to iOS developers. Everything that we just learned applies to push notifications, except they're sent from a server somewhere. Uh, tiles can be updated from a push notification, even when your app's not running. And it's based on the Windows Notification Service, which is a free service Microsoft runs for your apps to use. And basically, it works like this. You have your Windows 8 device over there on the left-hand side of the tile. 
and your Windows Store app is the green square running within your device. And also in the system, as part of the system, there's a notification client platform that, that runs. And then out on the internet somewhere, there's the Windows notification service, and you may be running as a developer, maybe running a cloud service somewhere that you want to send notifications to your app. So the first thing that happens is the Windows Store app talks to the notification client within your device requesting a, a channel to communicate. Then you register with your cloud service saying, hey, I want you to be able to send uh, notifications to me. The cloud service, your cloud service, talks to the Windows notification service uh, to authenticate, and the Windows notification service talks to the notification client on your system, not directly to your app. And your cloud service talks to the Windows notification service to actually send the push notifications. The Windows notification service delivers it to the notification client platform, which then delivers it to your app. And if, if it's something like a tile update, your app may not even be running. The notification client platform will receive the tile update, and your tile will be updated without your app even being launched. Yep. Um, if you go back up real quick, so if you look at this, this is this diagram is the exact same than we use for iOS, right? Um, I think like with regards to the flow, it flows the exact same, right? Like from iOS, you have to request a channel URI local, then you send that to that server, and then your server will push down. Um, I think the differences if you if for people who want to implement them, um, the differences are the lower level. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, on our side, um, the tiles are XML, mm -hmm. um, and iOS and iOS are kind of sending JSON. Um, or you know, eventually it serializes onto something that looks like JSON. When I receive them, it's kind of what I see. And then, um, and then uh, on our side, it's a RESTful model. When you're talking to WNS, it's a RESTful model where um, we literally send in REST requests, like HTTP kind of stateless requests onto WNS. Where in iOS, you're kind of server side, you're opening a socket and connecting, and you know, doing a little bit of you know, um, kind of keeping that connection open a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. On the WNS side, we're very much RESTful. Yeah, it's a very um, easy interface to implement. Yep, um, and there's plenty of libraries out there that kind of implement both, so, um, so you can do that. So, okay. So you do have to register your app to be able to uh, deal with uh, notification, push notifications, and you will receive. You will see a, a form much like this, where you have to provide, you know, a name, the package display name for your app, and the, the publisher. You will see. Uh, you know, your package name for your app, you'll get a client secret and a package security identifier, and these will all be used as part of the API for yep. sending push notifications. Yep. So you send it to your server. You don't put this on your client, but you put them on your server, and mm -hmm. then that's what you use to push. Right. Yep. So on the server side, uh, Azure, Windows Azure offers uh, notification services. It's a free cloud service for notifications. And it uses templates, and there's the URL for checking that out. Uh, there are also third-party solutions, even open-source solutions, so that uh, you can uh, access push notifications, you know, directly that way. Yep. Yeah. Most third parties. If you're using third-party on your own, your you know, most third parties, the more popular ones are already now supporting Windows um, and Windows Phone. Um, and if you need something, you know, open-source, then Push Sharp is a good one. Where um, you can use Push Sharp to push onto any library and to any platform. So. It's a very similar API that pushes onto um, iOS, WNS, or Android. Um, so it, you know, it's kind of a, the benefit of that is that it's pretty course platform friendly. Yep. So here's a capability summary for notifications, the different uh, capabilities they have. Tiles, tiles can cycle between different uh, uh, images, different templates. They can be scheduled to happen at a certain point in the future. Uh, a new one, I think, because I hadn't heard about this in, in 8.0, is tiles expiring. Yes, so tiles, badges, and toasts expire. Um, yeah, I, they, I didn't know tiles did. That's that's new to me. Okay. They can expire. I don't know if it's eight or all eight or one. I, I blur okay. the lines nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, but, I, I thought it was eight or all, but, okay. um, but I could be I could be wrong. Yep. And tiles tiles can also be periodic, and uh, they can be updated via push. Yep. And whereas badges, they expire, they can be periodic and they can be pushed, uh, yep. and so on and so forth. So here's a Windows notifications cheat sheet. You've got the tile update manager, the tile updater, and the tile notification. That's, those are the three things you need uh, to be able to deal with updating tiles. Similarly, for the badges, there's a version of those for the badges and for toast notifications. So you, you can look those up in the documentation or on MSDN uh, and see the, all the APIs and guides for how to use them. Yep. So on the lock screen apps, up to seven different apps on a given user's lock screen uh, can, uh, can access the lock screen permissions to display information. 
one app can display more detailed status. Every 50, you get a chance to update it every 15 minutes in the background, and uh, you can update badges and tiles on the lock screen. Yep, and every cover lock screen, kind of what it takes, right. how to register and everything. So we're not going to repeat that, but um, all you know, all you need to know is that if you are, if you are registered for that, then you need to update your badge. And the badges are designed slightly different, so the design is. Uh, you definitely have to pay attention to how you design your badges, what it look like um, right. if you're using that. So, so here are some uh, URLs for more reference information on Tiles, Posts, Azure, Mobile Services, and uh, where you go to register for push notifications. Yep. Here's a good Channel 9 video introing how to use Tiles and notifications. Yep. And, and that's the next one. And that's it. So um, I don't see any open questions that you haven't answered. The only one is how is the search target. Um, there's oh, and the one about running 8.0 and 8.1. Um, so uh, Ben is too fast at answering that. Um, so why don't we take a 10 minute break, and then we'll come back for the last session, which is store. Um, and we should be up to get out of here nearly on time, or, or very much on time if we're waiting for 5 o'clock. <laughs> so all right, we'll be back in 10. <laughs> Welcome back. This is the last session in a long day, building Windows Store applications for iOS. And for the next half an hour or so, we're going to talk about submitting to the store, um, the most important part of you know, running your Windows Store application, making some money. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to go too, too deep into um, giving you all the economics and the marketing uh, of the store because I can get excited and carry for 40 minutes uh, easily just telling you about the benefits of the store. But um, I do want to give you a context of why Microsoft thinks about the store uh, and kind of where we're at with regards to the store. Um, so the first thing is for us, obviously, the Windows Store um, is a huge you know, change. which started with, eight, with Windows 8. Uh, we want all developers to start making money, and we designed the store um, for you know, several different uh, good business reasons for you. The first one is we designed it for discovery. We want to, to us at Windows, we've always had a great ecosystem. We always had a lot of you know, great apps, but we, we knew we needed a store that was designed for discovery so that people could come to a store and discover your app and install it. Windows has billions of users if you add up. XP, Vista, um, and Windows 7, um, and Windows 8. There's you know, a lot a lot of users out there, and all we need to do is make this discoverable, make your application discoverable for you to make a lot of money as those users start ramping up onto Windows 8 um, and 8.1. Um, we have, the, you know, their store will have that exact same reach than everything else Windows does, so the store is the one application that you're guaranteed that will be on every Windows install. Um, so um, we're looking at, you know, 250 countries or, now, or, or so, 230 markets or so. We have over 100 languages. We have very, very large distribution um, with regards to a store um, and something that came with Windows, so that's not something we designed for. But with regards to developer, we definitely designed to have um, a really great, a very flexible business model. Um, and what that means is you're going to hear me talk about different business models. We have uh, free apps like everybody else. Then we have kind of a paid app, something where you come, you pay for the app, and you know you buy it, and that's it. You install it, and from there on, you get free updates and everything else. We have in-app purchase, which is um, again pretty standard with regards to all the platforms. But um, we also have trials, which is a huge differentiator with regards to iOS. Um, so in our in our platform, we have trials. Um, a user can come in and have a, and try and do a trial. And that's um, something that we would love to have in iOS. Yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah, for the last I think since iOS, yeah, definitely iOS six. I kind of expected it. And I was really, really surprised when I saw iOS 7 and I did inside trials. Right, because um, Windows Store, we, you get both feature-limited trials and also time-based trials, too. Yep, yeah, so we have feature-limited and time-based. And you don't, for example, for time-based, you don't have to write any code right. at all. We just handle the operating system. You just declare on the store, and the operating system Check handles box. everything for you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely uh, great. And what that also allows us to do, since uh, we're talking about that, um, it allows Windows applications, our pricing model is different. We have, very much like Apple, we have a tiered, or a tiered pricing model where Apple begins at 99 cents, and then it goes to 199, 299, and eventually all the way to 999, I think. Um, and on our side, we started at 149. Uh, so we thought, hey, you know, if people can try your app, because everybody complains about this whole 99 cent problem that we have, right? That developers are not making what's probably the right amounts just because everybody has to compete at the 99 cent level. Race to the bottom. Right, it's race to the bottom. Um, so with us, we said, look, let, let's, let's let people try it. There's a lot of advantages to trials. One of them is if you try it, you can decide if it's worth the 249 or the you know 
299 or whatever it is Absolutely. that you think your app is worth. Um, so on that side, that's great. Um, the other thing that Trials allows us to do is Windows runs in a myriad of devices, mm -hmm. right? So we have hardware today that was probably made two years ago for Windows 7, and there's, you know, Windows 7 has 7 or 800 million users out there. Right. Um, so if those users decide to upgrade, we need to make sure that your application runs well, and for that, you can give them the ability to try it, right? right. If they have a, kind of a two-year-old GPU, they might want to try it before they run this really great game, before they pay for this really great game that you have. Right. Um, so Trials allows you to make more money, uh, we've, proved, we've seen day in and day out from both Windows Phone and Windows Research now that if you offer trials, you end up making more money. A lot of people think, well, uh, if, you, you know, if I do a trial, I'm not going to make my money. No, people will actually pay for you. We see high conversion rates. Just make sure you time it right. Don't write a game that you can finish in a day and then give them a seven-day trial. But if you time it right, then you definitely can make a lot of money. Um, and continuing on that with flexible business model, the other thing that we do is um, we allow you to monetize using third-party APIs or third-party, um, like you, we, you can write your own monetization uh, when it comes to our platform. Um, so for example, um, if you want to buy something from eBay and you want to pay them with PayPal since so they own it, great. Uh, and when you buy something from eBay, if eBay writes their app and they have their own monetization or their own um, kind of a, in a purchase with their own third-party APIs, they get 100% of that revenue, mm -hmm. right? So that's a big advantage. Like, for example, you hear often about the whole Amazon, Wall Street Journal, all these companies that continue to fight with Apple over subscription revenue and all these things. Well, in our world, first of all, all those applications are already on Windows, of course, uh, and they're getting 100% of that. Right, so Telegraph, um, you know, which is a newspaper, or Wall Street Journal, all of these digital uh, publishers, um, they can come in, use their third party, you know, use their own in a purchase, and actually get 100% of that money, or get 100% of that minus whatever they commission. Uh, we do the same for ad networks, right? So Microsoft does have Pop Center. We give you an ad control if you want to use ours, but if you want to use a third party one, great, well, we will be okay, and we'll let you make your money. Uh, so our, flex our, our business models are more flexible with regards to that. Um, another thing that we designed for was uh, around the economics, the one thing that we designed for was developers making more money. We know we're late to this party. We know we have to attract the developers. We want, the reason we're doing the iOS training is because we know there's really great iOS apps that would be awesome to have, right? So we want developers to come to our platform. And what we do there is our revenue share is 80% after you made your first $25,000. So you'll submit your app tomorrow. You will make $25,000 on the first day. And from there on, you're making 10% more. Right. If you think about applications that make, you know, ten million dollars, that's a lot of money. That's over nine hundred or around nine hundred thousand dollars extra, right? Uh, for just supporting your app and being there. Um, so it's a really great thing. This eighty percent or this twenty-five k is actually with regards to paid in a purchase, everything. So it's not like, oh, if your business model, if your monetization is in a purchase, you have to get, you know, twenty-five thousand people or, or twenty or seventeen thousand people to pay a dollar forty nine. You just you know you make twenty five thousand people however you make them to however you monetize and you will get eighty percent from there. Um, so those are two things. With regards to economics, we know we wanted to have better economics. Um, and then with regards to developers, we also learned that uh, we talked to a lot of people, um, you know, iOS developers, you know, and they were like, hey, we just want transparent terms. We want to make sure that we know your rules. We want to make sure if you're carving something out for your categories or anything like that. We want to make sure that we understand that we know where we are in the publishing process and everything else. So, um, so this slide right here is our value prop. From here down, I'm going to kind of dive down to the APIs. But um, I think there's some really great sessions um, out there. If you go to Channel 9, there's sessions for people that are talking about the business opportunity, talking about, um, you know, our kind of like our value prop. And, and I feel that we're very, very competitive with any other platform out there, not just iOS, but any other platform out there. So, Absolutely. Um, so we have that. And with that, let me show you a little bit of the store and some of the discovery that we've done. Um, so, and for that, I'm going to start right here with IE. So I'm in an Explorer right now. And, you know, with regards to discovery, we've done a few things so that your app can be discovered even from the web. Right, without going to the store. So, for example, right here, I'm in Evernote, and I'm rising, I'm running the Internet Explorer browser. And you see here, um, I went to their website, uh, and I see their application right there. Um, and you see that, you know, their website right here, it's you know talks about their product, etc. Now, the interesting thing is, if I'm right here, and I look, if you look at my uh, app, um, my navigation bar right here, I have the address, but right here, and this one icon. If I was in another website, this one icon wouldn't have this plus sign right here. Um, and what's going on here is. You, on your website, you can write a little meta tag that uh, our browser will detect, and that meta tag can tell the browser that you have an application in the store. Uh, so, for example, right here, I went to Evernote.com. I can click right here, um, and you'll see right here that says, uh, hey, switch to the Evernote Touch app because I already have it installed. If I didn't have it installed, it would actually say install our application. Uh, so you no longer have to take 50% of the real estate on your website telling people, we have an iOS, Android app, and everything else. Because nowadays, when I go to half the sites, that's what they do, right? They, they have these, um, hey, install it from here. 
Uh, so here it's very, very efficient. It's just a little meta tag that everybody can put, uh, put on their site and advertise. Um, another thing that we've done is we've actually have our store online. Uh, so for example, right here, I'm in Bing, um, and I just go in there and I search for that exact same app, Evernote Windows Store, right? And you'll see the results come up, and you'll see the very top result is the Evernote Touch app for Windows in the Windows Store. So the very first link for somebody that did a Bing search um, is actually um, a link on to install the app. And I come right here. This is our, our, our store on the web. So you see all the metadata. You see the screenshot. You see the description. Um, you're seeing everything else, that, everything that you can see, but you're still doing it online. And then I, from there, can say, oh, let me view these on the Windows Store. And this is going to launch the Windows Store app. And from here is where I will install it. And of course, right now, it's going to tell you that, hey, these applications are already installed. Um, and um, you see here also, um, Evernote has a desktop app and a, what they call their touch app, which is a Windows Store app. And you see that you can have both of them listed. So if you have a desktop app um, you know, from a previous uh, from you know a few years old, et cetera, you can actually just bring it on and still advertise in the store. It's a great way for people to still get more money. Um, with regards to the main store experience, this is kind of what we look like. We do a lot of um, you know editorials right here. So um, this is A.1, so we have the store. Uh, and then we have Pix for You, which is kind of a new uh, something we're doing for A.1, which is new. Uh, and Pix for You is kind of looking at applications I've installed before, trends. So it's kind of a big, you know, engine, smart engine that's actually picking stuff for me. Um, I mostly installed, you know, a few face, a few um, demo apps for these. So, uh, so my application is pretty empty. So I'm not sure how applicable these are. It's a really um, good way to enhance discoverability of applications. Yeah, too. exactly. Right. So uh, you know, it can You're not increase the, the relevance. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And then of course we have our editorial like popular now, um, and then we actually have new releases and everything else. Um, and we have categories as you would. So um, the categories like this is A.1. So I, I no longer know which categories we'll have. But the canonical categories that you think about with games, productivity, social, um, all those categories is there, are there with regards to your app. Um, the installation, or actually like just looking at the details of uh, for any app are very, very straightforward. So let's go here, for example. Um, you know, if I'm looking for um, you know, anything that's popular now, um, I can go back and see, um, you know, let's see what's popular now. For example, the YouTube app. Um, I can come back here and see, um, you know, I, I see the button for install, I see kind of a description, I see the features, um, I see all my screenshots, I see the ratings, um, I see some of the commentary that people have had. So everything that you would expect out of a store is there. Mm -hmm. um, so right here I can discover anything I want about, this, about the app and decide whether I want to install it or not. Yeah, um, pertaining to the store, we've actually got a question sitting in here yep. now. Uh, so it's basically asking uh, uh, for Windows 8.1, uh, like Xbox One and everything that's coming in the future, uh, are those all going to be united under one store or so, are we still going to have different stores for phone and Windows? So that's a great question. Um, today we still have two stores. Mm -hmm. um, I think long term Microsoft has always said that our intent is to converge. Um, but honestly, there's no short time frame on that. Like um, um, today it's two store. We have a Windows Phone. I guess we have three stores if you include Xbox. We have Windows Phone. Uh, we have Windows Store, and then we have kind of the Xbox Marketplace, um, and those are three, you know, today we still have three stores. Um, we're looking to converge a little bit over time, but um, there's nothing to announce with the rest of the time frame. And the other second part of that was on the Windows Store, you can both get uh, like Windows Store style apps and also desktop apps. Yep, on mm -hmm. the Windows Store, you, uh, what, what happens in Windows Store is you see desktop apps are listed, and then when it comes down to install the app, because they don't have the deployment package, right. the security, and all the extra They're work that we do, their own installers. Um, then what you do is you go in there, you look at their, um, when you click on the desktop app, it says, oh, go to, for example, Adobe. If you're installing something from Adobe, um, go to their website and install it from there. Uh, so we list it and we make it very discoverable, but then you install it outside of, of okay. the application model for us. Um, and, you know, and we no longer, like, it, at that point, you're installing a regular desktop app. Right. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. So this is our store. Um, obviously, from here we have search. Um, you can expect, you know, we have good search on discovering your apps and making sure that um, we can find all your applications very, very quickly. Um, so that's kind of that's my high level again. That's my pitch and my sales pitch on the store. Uh, from here down, let's talk about what developers need to do. Um, so the first thing is developers will need to register. Um, and we have two types of developer registration, um, individual registration and business. So we actually um, in real is $49, business $99. So there's kind of a, an advantage towards if you want to be individual um, and do it um, at that level. It's a little bit cheaper. We do a little bit less validation. Um, and for the most part, you can submit to the store. You will get the same treatment with regards to how quickly we'll certify your app and all this thing. There's just less validation. Um, and there's just only a few features that actually uh, where we do require that you be a business in order for you to have a feature. The documents library. Um, so documents library is a good one. Um, if you're doing enterprise, um, if you're using capabilities for enterprise authentication right. or something like that, we also require that you be a business. There's only a couple of these. Um, the extra cost is because it costs more to validate. Right. Um, if plus, something's messing with the documents library, you want to make sure that's a very trustworthy application. Yep, yep, exactly. And we do uh, for all, you know, when some when an app gets submitted and they're touching the document library or looking at enterprise authentication, so they go through a much a very rigorous 
you know, look at the app, see what's the way, making sure that they're not damaging anything. But uh, but that's just one of the differences. That's the only difference. It's not like one of them goes faster. It's not like one of them has right. unlimited support or anything like that. They both get the same treatment. But um, but from a developer standpoint, that's, it, you know, it does come down to what you have to pay. We also have, which you don't see listed here, um, for example, for startup, we have programs called BizSpark, uh, which, you know, if you join that program, you get the registration for free and along with other benefits. Uh, for students, we have DreamSpark. So we've always been... Um, like startups and you know students always pretty much get registration to phone and you know Windows Store and everything else for free, uh, so there's some advantages there. Uh, with regards to APIs, um, our APIs are quite different. Like I go back uh, to what we did with Push, where I said well we're similar to Apple, um, but in some cases our APIs are a little bit or much simpler with regards to um, to how you will test it from a developer standpoint. Uh, so for example, for me in Apple, if I want to do in a purchase um, um, and I want to offer you know my stuff, I have to go in there. I'm um, going to, um, what is it, iTunes Connect, and mm -hmm. enter every single one of my product ideas. If I have staging and production environment, I have to enter them twice. There's a lot of work that I go through in order for me to test my app because I have three different test environments, and you know, if I ever want to reuse a string or change something, it's hard. Um, on our world, if you're the developer and you want to simulate the licensing and product options, um, we have these um, current app simulator, which is just a little mug of the store APIs, and then with that, you load an XML file. And in that XML file, the you know, schema is documented, and there's plenty of samples that you can download. And with that schema, you can just go in there and say, look, I'm going to have enough purchase for this. I'm going to you know, test the scenario where this is already activated, but this is not. Um, so you can go in there and tweak it as much as you want and test every possible thing, every permutation that, that you would need for in a purchase. Um, this includes trial conversion. This includes um, in a purchase in your app, buying a feature, any, any of those things. Uh, you can actually go in there and test. Um, I mentioned this earlier with regards to our APIs. Um, time-based trials require no code at all. Um, obviously, if you're going to offer a time-based trial, I think what you should do is you know, go ahead and write a little bit of that work so that you can ask for conversion so that you don't just wait for the software to expire, right? Um, but if you wrote your app already and you just want to go back now and say, hey, I'm going to offer a time-based trial, you can go back onto the portal, the developer portal where you uh, submit your app and just select you know, a free trial period. Uh, what we're seeing, if you want my recommendation, is two days is a really good free trial for a lot of apps. Uh, for a lot of games, that's kind of when people buy. They play it for a little bit, and then they'll buy within the first few days. Um, I definitely, you know, it, it's up to you if you want to do 30 or, or, or other time frame. But that's kind of what we're looking at. With regards to the API, um, this is kind of what you would have to do if you wanted to convert a trial, just to see how um, straightforward it is. You can come back here and to convert a trial, you go, um, you register, you get the license information, you register for the license change event, and then we have a little API that says if license information is trial. Uh, request app purchase async. Um, and so of course, an async, you'll use an await, um, and then you'll just go ahead and request the app purchase. And this is going to show the UI with all the metadata for your app. Right? So for simulation, um, you're just going to get this little UI that has you know, a return, you know, whether it succeeded or failed. You're not going to see all the metadata. Um, but you know, when you go into the real API, you'll see all the metadata for your app, your price, um, localized, your description, localized, everything that you would expect out of it. Um, and it's just a few lines of code to kind of convert trials. So this is one where, again, if you have a trial, not writing the code to convert sooner, not prompting the user, feels like a like a lost opportunity. And of course, that's just for the feature limited trials. Right. Yeah, for well, for conversion, or you can no with time based trials, you can still convert, right? So right. you can okay, detect, cool. hey, am I in trial mode? Right. You can detect when it's being launched. You can detect my trial mode, and then just prompt the user and say, hey. By now, okay. um, so it doesn't have to be a feature differentiator. But for feature differentiator, you definitely you, have yeah. to use a similar um, check-in also to turn things on and off. Yep, okay. exactly. So um, um, here's a little bit of the code that we will use for in our purchase. So um, you can see here for in our purchase, what we do is we um, we just go in there, uh, look at the current license information, then we check for a specific product license by you know this one. I'm looking for product one, and then I check, oh, has these been you know is this license is this product license active? Uh, and has this, is this product active? And the reason we check for two things is because we don't want you to do a purchase on something when the user hasn't bought the app. So if you're having a purchase and, the, and your app is actually has a price, or you're in a trial period and somebody buys the English or the Spanish dictionary, it's kind of confusing that they haven't bought your app, but they bought the dictionary, and then this thing right. is going to expire. Uh, so you have to check for both. Um, and then all you have to do is, again, you call, um, request product purchase async, where you give us a product, um, and then we'll go ahead and detect it and do all the work for you. And then you're just detecting whenever your license, uh, you know, whenever your license changed, and you handle that where you enable the feature or you do the right thing. Um, with regards to, you know, like in a purchase, um, Windows 8.0 does not have consumables. They have durables. Um, if you're not, like, if you know the difference, consumables versus durables is um, consumables, like, for example, um, I'm playing Candy Crush, and I just want the, whatever, the power boost to do something right there. And that's, a, hey, I'm going to buy it now. I'm going to use it immediately, and it's going to go away. Um, a durable for us would be something where, for example, um, I want to buy this, you know, power, this boost for a week. Like, I'm, I'm using some video editing software. 
um, and I want to buy this kind of power boost where I can do the pro version of the editor uh, for a week mm -hmm. uh, because I'm in a major project or anything like that. So, um, so durables kind of have a time span. Consumables are like, hey, buy it, and then whatever you do in the back end, you do it in the back end, and it's a one-time thing for us. And with Windows 8.0, we did not include consumables. This was a kind of a painful late cut that we, we just couldn't squeeze it in, but this is already an 8.1. Um, and if you're coding for Windows 8 right now, the answer to consumer was pretty simple. Um, take durables, which normally have a time span, uh, and then just pick the shortest time span, like, like the time span, for example, for a day, um, and now sell that feature, and you can create five or six of these if the users are going to be buying several of these in, you know, within a one-day period, and then just sell them that, sell them that much. Uh, and then they'll expire in the next day, so you'll be able to sell them again. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a Candy Crush, or my, you know, my kids were Candy Crush addicts, and usually they buy code once or twice a day. Uh, for a few days until they got through, uh, through a lot of the levels. So I think if you just do that with durables, that, that's something that can hold you over until you get to 8.1 where we have uh, full consumables. Uh, and consumables is more interesting because um, it requires that you validate that you have fulfilled that consumable. Right. right? So for example, um, the way it's a little bit of a kind of a two part uh, when it comes to purchasing and you see the API right here. Um, I'm just gonna go in and say, hey, request product purchase async. Um, and then I get a status that said, yeah, that succeeded, or it hasn't been fulfilled yet, uh, meaning that, that was open already, or maybe the user canceled, and then we just return you a not purchase, right? Um, and you see kind of the first part, which is, um, hey, here's where you buy it. Um, and then if that went when, if that goes well, then um, when you buy it, what you have to do is fulfill it, right? So if you're, again, if it's a power boost in your app, it's a one-time thing, or if it's a, you know, something that you're selling them and it's gonna stay for a while, um, you just gotta update your service side code and do whatever it is to fulfill it, and then you call out to us and say, um, hey, we're reporting this consumable has been filled, right? And that way we don't, because otherwise you end up buying the same thing twice. And I always do the same thing. Um, I tend to do it where um, I code something and I'm debugging and then I you know, stop debugger in the middle, and then when I go back, I always say, no, you have unfulfilled purchases here. Um, so it does the same thing. It's a very similar flow to, do, to what you would get out of iOS. Um, we, you know, we're probably a little bit nicer on a, in its async await, but the APIs are, are very, very, very similar. Um, and you also do get the simulator. Yeah, we have a simulator for right. you to configure it um, as, you, um, as you go and for you to tweak every permutation, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also have receipts, so very similar with receipts. Again, receipts uses the same functionality that, um, something similar functionality to what you get out of iOS. Uh, when you make your purchase, you can actually get a receipt and then send that receipt to your server side and validate the receipt um, or do whatever you want. Um, so from here, um, with the simulator, we actually have support for receipts, so you can load a receipt uh, and actually test it and send it to your server and get everything else that you would want. Um, so we got a get app receipt async. This is the API that you, you should be looking if you want to do receipts. Um, and then from there, you can do a get product receipt, receipt ID, which gives you that product ID, and then you validate it and you go from there. Um, so very, very straightforward. These APIs are not, are not that different from, uh, from what you see in other platforms. Um, I just want to do a shout here to one of the SDK samples that has pretty much everything that you will need with regards to store. Um, so here, this is the store sample as we have it. Um, this is the 8.1 sample, and it has every possible thing, so you can go back here and say, um, hey, I'm using trial mode, and it gives you a trial period with expiration date, um, it gives you a trial mode, it gives you the purchase, um, you can buy the app here, so this is conversion, and you can see our UI, this is the one thing where we don't show you the real UI, um, we give you kind of a trial mode, um, and here you can just return SOK, um, SOK is the standard succeeded, um, S is for OS, so like succeeded, and underscore okay, this is the old days of calm. If, you, if you're old <laughs> enough like me, you will have nightmares about these um, eight results, right? Uh, SOK is the one that you want. Um, you can say, you can return back invalid arguments or if fail our memory, if you're gonna test for different conditions, but um, pretty much SOK is success, um, and the other ones are failure, and they all come back as an exception anyway um, on, on that side, so you won't, you won't be able to do a lot with the differences. And again, um, and, that's the, the current app simulator that's bringing up that dialog for yep. you. Yeah. yeah, so that's the simulator. On the real production, you will get a nice system dialog with your metadata and everything else. Um, so, um, and then this, again, this demo has in-app purchase. Um, it has expiring products, consumables now for 8.1. It uh, kind of has an advanced consumable uh, where you can see, like, for example, enumerate the unfulfilled consumables. Um, again, used for debugging where you can go in there and clear all your unfulfilled stuff. Um, and so but you can also do that. You should write code that does that for real right. research where you're going back and doing the right thing. Uh, because there is, with, with consumables, there is that time where, um, you know, it's not an asset transaction. You can, um, you have to go back and do um, kind of a two-phase commit um, type of type, um, transaction, right? Um, you can see la uh, large catalogs. You can see uh, app listing where I can show my URI for my app listing. Um, and then you can validate receipts or get a receipt for, for my application. So every possible thing that you need with regards to the store APIs is in the sample. Um, I'm not gonna walk you through all of them because that's just redundant, um, but every single one will be available for you there. Um, 
Uh, still related to store, I want to kind of do a call out to a few things that are interesting uh, with regards to building your app. Um, we have this uh, services.windowstore.com website um, that is ready for developers. So you can go find about services. The reason I enumerated this one is because uh, if you go to this website, you'll see here, for example, we have um, advertisement. Right, so we have third-party advertisement like Inmovi or um, Leadbolt or you know Microsoft advertisement SDK. So as they pop up, like you know as AdMove comes in or any of those, um, they'll be listed here, and you can go in there and see different options. Right, so oh, I'm looking for advertisement, or you can also see, for example, earlier um, Sean talked about push notifications, and we have push IO, parse, you know, all the you know popular uh, push vendors are supporting our platform. So you can come back here and see if they have an offer, see what they have, um, and kind of discover um, good partners that you can use for um, for your um, for your application. Um, moving towards submission, um, here's kind of how I think of submission, and I can walk through it. Um, I think it's kind of, a, you know, of course, you have to have done all your development for your app and everything, and then there's after that, there's kind of what I see are five stage process, and I have screenshots of all of them, so users can kind of um, have, you know, become familiar. So register to a store, it's a portal, you will need, you pay your $99, and you will need uh, um, the Microsoft account that you've been using to develop, so there's nothing too excited there. It's not that different from what you get out of iTunes Connect or any other um, store out there. Um, and then we have this WAC tool. Uh, we call it the WAC, um, and it's Windows Application Certification Kit. Uh, but the results always feel like the WAC here, so it kind of it, it fits. Um, and, and this tool is very useful. Yeah, this uh, tool is very useful. Um, so was this it's basically what gets run uh, when you submit for a certification, right? Plus it, a little bit more testing. It's one of the things that gets run. So our WAC for us is um, it does as much static analysis as we can around against the tool. Um, and what this does is, it, uh, for example, like with Windows Store APIs, you can, you have to go back and use the right subset of, you know, core uh, core CLR if you're if you're coding on .NET or if you're coding on C++, you need to make sure you're using valid APIs. Right. Um, and this tool validates all of that. Um, and then this tool validates, you know, simple stuff like, for example, um, I fail because I'm doing debug, or I fail because you know, when you talk about app model, if your suspend is taking longer than five seconds and you crash, you know, you will fail certification. And right. this tool tells for all of that. Um, in this case, for example, um, I fail because I didn't have all the store logo. Um, <laughs> the application template gives you these default store logos, and we actually can test whether you have an overwritten. Right. Um, and we don't want the you know big X to show up on the store. Um, it's a big X because you should replace it. You know, right. so yeah, so you so you need to replace them. So in, <laughs> in this case, that's why I failed. Okay. Uh, so I, it's funny, I passed the bytecode generation, the performance, all that, but I failed because I didn't have the, the images. Um, so again, the very first thing that's going to happen when you submit your application to the store, uh, as soon as we get through on the queue, right, because we do have a queue, uh, we do fall behind sometimes, um, is we're going to run this. So if you submit your application to the store and you haven't run this yourself, you're just doing yourself a disservice. You're going to wait for us a day uh, or eight hours or whatever, and then all you're going to do is get these results back if you haven't even run this. Um, so on that side, we, um, you, you should run the WAC tool before you submit and be aware of, um, you know, make sure you pass so um, that will make your life much, much easier. Um, with regards to our certification requirements, uh, we're very, very transparent. Um, we have the requirements listed on the website, um, so you can go back and check the URL from here. Um, and then the one thing that we do, which is nice, um, is that um, we give you kind of our criteria or our guidance around um, common certification errors. For example, um, if you go read the certification requirements, uh, which I think Apple calls the guidelines, um, we call them requirements because they are required. Um, um, we, um, you'll see things like, for example, we'll say something like, if you're using personalized information, you need a privacy policy. Uh, and in some countries, for example, IP address is personalized information. Um, so if you don't have a privacy policy and you're using networking, uh, you fail because of that. And those are things that not everybody who reads their requirements, like you don't immediately jump into that conclusion when you read them. Right. So what we've done is we keep accumulating our lessons learned and we have them right here at these aka.ms slash storefix. We list them and we tell people, hey, you know, make sure you've read through all of them so you have a really great understanding. Um, our store, an average for the last, we launched last October, um, and we had periods where we were very, very hot, like getting huge, huge numbers of apps running around launch, et cetera. So we were, you know, we were delayed a little bit. But our store, on average, um, I think that we just published a number, and it's 2.2 um, day or 2.5 day is how long it takes to certify. That's average. That's not very right? long at all. So that's not long compared to Apple. Um, and, you know, and considering that we do all the certification and all the stuff, it's not like Android where you just go in there and publish and, right. you know, you're on your own here. Uh, for real, for the thorough job that we do, this isn't so bad. Uh, and this is the average. So you might be one of those that gets stuck in the five day, or you might be one of those lucky ones that gets stuck within, that gets through within eight hours. Right. Um, so you vary. But if you've done all this thing, if you're past what, if you've read all this stuff, then you increase your odds of getting through much quicker. So it's going to improve your app. Um, with regards to signing your app, I kind of drew the kind of how it works. Uh, from within Visual Studio, once you have your Microsoft account, from within Visual Studio, um, you will be able to um, um, just tell the Visual Studio, hey, please associate my app with my Microsoft account. And this is where the signing happens. 
Um, so if you're, if you're familiar with iOS, we have provisioning profiles, certificates, all kinds of uh, very complicated things that um, are associated with bundle IDs, et cetera. So it's a little bit tough to configure. Mm -hmm. um, and um, on Windows, we don't have any of that. You go into Visual Studio, you click Associate once, we download the certificate from there, um, and then we, um, you know, and then from there you can submit and do everything else that you need. Um, when you submit, we update some metadata within your app, within your project um, file. Um, and let's see the notes. So, um, the uh, mention the poll is on the website. Um, so we're about to finish. We're probably within 10 to 15 minutes away from finishing. Um, so please go in and fill in the poll. It's really useful information. Tell us what you like, what you didn't like, uh, and you know, give them the feedback because these are very valuable events right. that um, um, need the feedback, need to see what the interactions, how to improve. Right. It helps let us know what to do better next time. Yep. Absolutely. So, um, so this is how you sign your app. Again, it's very, very straightforward. Um, you know, for me, when if I just move machines, um, move my provisioning profiles, keeping track of the certificates, etc., it's it's a significant amount of work. Here, we keep it very, very straightforward uh, for developers to do that. Uh, once you've submitted your app, uh, so I would, you know, I didn't go through the submission process because you go to our website and that's the same than everything else. You go in there, configure uh, your markets and everything else. Once you submit your app, we give you very, very detailed reporting. Um, so we give you kind of what we call the developer analytics, and you'll see very different types of reports. For example, your adoptions, your ratings. You see um, information on who's installing your app, where they install, where they install in form. Um, so you see all this information and details on your in-app purchase. Um, and you see, for example, we have a report store trends. So you can see, hey, people are starting from, uh, you know, installing from here. Here's what's going on. Um, so you kind of see, hey, how am I doing compared to everybody else? Um, you see your, obviously, developer financial summary. Again, hit 25K and you move up to the 80%. So that's the one place that uh, you got to keep an eye on all the time. Because right. um, that's when the money starts adding up. And just um, for, you know, I, I gave a couple um, samples here um, of the reports. These are not all the reports. I couldn't screen of all of them. Um, but just to give you an idea, here's examples of, uh, examples and, of and conversions. That's really useful information for tracking the success of an ad campaign you maybe had going exactly. to promote your app, uh, all sorts of that kind of stuff. Very useful statistics, especially compared to a lot of the other stores that have. Yep. Yeah. So we, you know, we, we will continue to improve in our reporting. I don't think we are, um, I think we're proud of where we're at. Um, I think we know we have to, or we know we want to do more. Uh, but uh, yeah, compared to everybody else, this is <laughs> this is a very nice thing to have. Because you know, if you're an indie developer like me, I, I don't go in there and track. I don't right. necessarily um, have a lot of this. So this to me was very valuable information um, where I didn't have to do a lot of analytics and I got a lot of payback. Uh, so anything like an integrated crash report is coming in them soon? Yep. So uh, so we do have that already, and that's in the developer portal. I think right here when uh, there's an option here that says quality. Um, so when you submit your application to the store, um, we actually um, we keep your crash dumps there, so you can download them. They're mini crash dumps, um, but you can go in there and see your mini crash dumps, see if there's trends. Uh, and, you, and if you're one of the really big offenders, uh, we actually have teams at Microsoft that analyze all that data and run automatic tools, and we see the same crashes. So if we see the same crashes over and over, then we actually ping um, the developers. So um, um, I've had partners that I know who are like, you know, like, these are among the top 100 applications. Like we add up all the crashers, we look at the analytics, we you know, we go back and say, oh, these are the top 100 apps crashing, and then we reach out. And when we when we know who manages or when we know the people there, we reach out and say, hey, you know, you're kind of constantly doing this. Um, can you look into it and see if you can fix it? Because we want the better quality out of it. Um, any independent developer, you don't have to wait to be in the top 50. You can just you know <laughs> fix your crashes early. Uh, so the dumps are there available on the store. Um, and then we have instructions on how to use them, how to analyze them. Um, so we also give you, you know, like here you're seeing your reviews, um, and you can go in there and see. Um, you need one, you can go in and see reviews for all markets in one place, which is very useful. The crash dump and everything's reporting because uh, we're totally reliant on iOS on third-party systems for that uh, yep. to have something built in without having to include another library or something in your applications. A yep. Big plus. Yep. No, we have that out of the box, and yep. we and we spend a lot of time. Our own apps spend a lot of time in that space too. <laughs> uh, so we learn. That's how we learn how people. Uh, we have, Windows is very very data driven, right? For example, if you look at um, we talked earlier about us redesigning search. Uh, we we have so many metrics from tens of you know from millions and millions of people on how they're using search, and we were looking at it and saying, look, we noticed that they search here and then they search again, and they search again. So that's when we said, oh, we need this hero that can give them a preview of everything else because otherwise they're going to just they're kind of guessing, they're blind guessing. You know, might as well be like you know pick one in the dark. You know, like I'm feeling lucky equivalent because um, uh, we were seeing that function. So we're very data driven. We have a lot of the crash data and everything else, um, and that's it with regards to the store. Um, again, for me, go back, look at the one slide. We, I think we have a really great value prop. Uh, for iOS developers that are considering store, um, um, we're still, you know, we have 100,000 apps. We're six, uh, I guess right now, we're eight months into it. Uh, we've definitely, I think we've crossed the 100,000 apps. So, um, But not all those apps are great. There's still room for all of these really great iOS apps to actually move and make money um, as we're ramping up our users. So we're a new platform. Our users are ramping up. There's obviously, again, too many Windows users out there, but not everybody's moved to 8 and 8.1. So um, our users are ramping up. Right now is the time where you can come in and be ready. Um, 8.1, by the way, will be a free update. Um, so if you're a developer and you're wondering, oh, 
where I do, um, I'll tell you code for eight because that's the one that's available now, so you shouldn't wait. Um, if your app will take a lot longer, like three to four months, um, you can even start with 8.1. Um, what we would expect is that, that um, it'll be a free update, so users could move a little bit faster. The adoption um, rate should be quite high. You know, yep, the adoption rate should be good. Um, and then you can have an 8.0 and an 8.1 app in parallel on the store. So you can always start with 8.0, um, move it to 8.1 so you can take advantage of a few of the new features. For example, uh, consumables, that's going to be and an still leave your 8.1 version feature. up yep. for people who haven't upgraded yet. Exactly, and you can have the, the two versions side by side and everything else. So um, again, Really great value prop. As you saw from there, we make it very easy with regards to the APIs, the samples, um, and you know the simulator to um, to actually test all of our store APIs. Um, so that's it. Um, with this, we thank you very much. Thanks to Sean and Eric for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you, Andy, for having uh, and us. Thanks for the studio guys for all the work for the, yeah, for the whole Yeah, big day. thanks to MVA, so, Microsoft Virtual Academy. Yep. And I hopefully hopefully students will get something out of it. Uh, we will make sure to post all the samples and all the PowerPoints somewhere, and then put a note in MVA so where people can go download the samples and the um, and the PowerPoints. So we'll make sure those are all available. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. <laughs>